the first in a series of messages on demonology. And by way of introduction to my message, I would like to read to you a verse from the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 14. It is possible that when I first read this verse, you will not exactly understand how it applies to the topic demonology, but I'll read the verse and then I'll seek to explain how I relate it to demonology. The verse reads as follows. They have healed also the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. This is God's charge against the religious leaders and priests of his day, that they claimed to have offered healing to his people, but it was not a genuine healing. Uh, the King James Version says, they've healed the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly. And this is explained by saying, they say peace, peace, but there is no peace. In other words, they had a religious front, they had the religious language, they had the services of the temple, but they didn't have the real inner experience which God desired them to have. They didn't have that deep, settled peace which comes from true faith in God and obedience to his word. And over the years it has been borne in upon me that this is true of multitudes of professing Christians. They don't have what they profess to have. They're not specifically insincere, but they've been brought up to sing hymns about peace and joy their church or the denomination teaches them that Christians have peace and joy. Some of them are even trained to go out and witness to others that they have peace and joy. But really, their, their hurts have only been healed slightly. There's a cover-up for something that has never been dealt with deep down inside. To give you just a little illustration of this, I was in Auckland, New Zealand a couple of years back with a Baptist family and the lady in the family was a teacher in a Sunday school, a sort of young adult Sunday school class. And they had a trained nurse in the Sunday school class who was not a believer but was there because she was interested and uh, really seeking. And they were talking about what the gospel does and how it gives people peace and joy and victory. And she stood up one day and she said something like this. Well, she said, when I don't have to visit the homes of the members of your church and administer sedation and tranquilizers on a large scale, she said, I'll believe in the peace and joy that you tell me that you have. But when your people are living on tranquilizers and sedation, there can't be all that peace and joy that you're talking about. And uh, I think this is a very real, let's say, criticism. Christians have been trained to believe that they have something, they speak as if they have something, they try to look as if they have something, they even feel guilty if they don't really have it, they still have to put on the front because that's the way people act in church and if they claim to be Christians, that's how they're supposed to behave. But somehow, deep inside, there isn't that inner reality that corresponds to what they say they have. Now, I served as a medical orderly in the British forces in the Second World War, and I wasn't too much of an orderly, but I learned a few lessons which have remained with me very vividly. And one was an incident in the North African desert when a British soldier was brought into the reception station with a shrapnel wound in one shoulder, which had come when a bomb had exploded somewhere near him. And uh, he took off his shirt and his upper garments, and he was naked to the waist. And there on his shoulder was just a little sort of black puncture with a little blackness around the edge of the hole. And I, being uh, theoretically a nursing orderly, went up to the uh, doctor, the medical officer, and said, shall I get a first field dressing, sir? And he said, no, it's no good doing that. He said, bring me the probe. The probe in those days, I dare say medicines changed a bit, was a silver stick that he would stick in. So he sat the man down in the chair and he stuck the probe in and he wiggled it around gingerly for a little while and suddenly the man went up in the air. And then the doctor said, now fetch me the forceps. So I fetched him the forceps and he put in the forceps where the probe had touched something in there, pulled it out, cleaned the wound up, and I said, you can bring me the dressing. Then he said to me afterwards, you see the piece of shrapnel that caused the puncture was still in there and if you just covered that up with a dressing without removing the shrapnel it would go on suppurating and cause more complications. And uh, I always remembered that because I saw how foolish I'd been. But many, many times since then in counseling and dealing with people that incident has come back to my mind and I've thought how many times 
a minister of the gospel, puts a first field dressing on, covers it up, but hasn't removed the thing that really causes the problem. And so, as you see in your outline, I've stated there, before we put the dressing on, we've got to use the probe and the forceps. We've got to find out what it is inside there that's really causing the trouble, producing the uncleanness, the irritation, uh, whatever it may be, the pain. We've got to remove it, even though the person may find it acutely painful just the moment we touch the little thing that's the source of the problem. And I have seen that this is true in the spiritual ministry. A great deal of what is called preaching and counseling is putting on a dressing on a wound that hasn't had the object that causes the problem taken out. And that the Lord has shown me over the recent years that the real problem causing agent in spiritual needs and difficulties is an evil spirit. And we need the probe of discernment and we need the forceps of deliverance before we can cover that thing up and say it is really healed. And I must testify from experience that over the years I've seen so much of this covering a thing up that hasn't really been cleansed and brought to the light and dealt with that I'm sick of it. And I can well understand God's charge against the religious leaders of his day. They've healed the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, peace, peace, putting on the dressing, but there isn't any peace. And I would say to you this evening that in most Christian congregations you find very little real peace. You find very few people that have a deep, settled inner tranquility. You find very little real, spontaneous, overflowing joy. You find a lot of people trying to look good, trying to look happy. You find not a few preachers and song leaders that try to make people feel happy. And I don't know how it may be with you, but nothing makes me feel more unhappy than somebody trying to make me feel happy when I'm not happy. And I call that just covering the wound up and healing the hurt slightly. And I am convinced that God has come to a period in his dealings with his people when he is not going to tolerate that kind of thing any longer. The real root cause of most deep-seated and long-standing spiritual and personal problems is found in evil spirits, demons. In a later study, I'm going to try to give a little account of the nature and activity of demons or evil spirits, let me just say for the present that I'm using the two phrases interchangeably, demon or evil spirit. I also notice the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians 9, 26, speaking about his own ministry. He says, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. You see, a wild or inexperienced boxer will lash out with his fists, but all he hits is air. He expends a lot of energy. He may even get the impression he's achieving a lot, but he really does his opponent no harm at all. And again, so much of Christian ministry and activity is really beating the air. It's, lo it's lashing out with words and sermons and prayers but if you don't know the real nature and whereabouts and activity of your enemy, it's a happy coincidence when you land a blow on him. And again, the real source of deep-seated, long-standing personal problems in most cases is demons or evil spirits. And until we come to detect them and realize and acknowledge their presence, know how they operate, and know the means to deal with them, we are mainly operating like someone that is beating the air. Now I'm going to take a little time to speak from personal experience. The Lord saved me very graciously and wonderfully in the year 1941 in an army barrack room of the British Army in the middle of the night. Less than two weeks later, he baptized me in the Holy Spirit in the same army barrack room, and right at that time, although I didn't have the religious language to use, to express it, he called me to his service. I knew from then onwards that my life belonged to God, that he had a plan for me, and that he would work it out.
and he immediately began to show me certain parts of his plan for my future in one or other of various different ways which I don't want to go into. In 1946, I was released from the British Army in what was then Palestine and immediately became what is called a full-time minister, a missionary to the Jewish people in Israel. Later on, I became a pastor. Later on, I became a missionary to Africa. But from 1946 until the present day, I have been in what is called full-time Christian ministry. I've been associated with full gospel or Pentecostal groups from about five different countries, Sweden, Denmark, Britain, Canada, and the United States. And I've preached in four or five continents. So I am not without experience. And right from the day that I knew about salvation, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, divine healing, I testified and preached of these things. I preached the full gospel, if you want to use that phrase. I knew about the new birth. I knew about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I knew about healing the sick. I lay for one year and end in a military hospital later in the war and only got out when I found that divine healing worked and that I could trust God for the healing of my body as I trusted him for the salvation of my soul. I also believe that the signs in the world indicated that the second coming of Christ was near at hand and I testified and preached to that effect also. And I really believe that I was preaching the full gospel. I was preaching all that I knew to preach and I saw results. I saw people saved regularly. I saw many people healed. I saw many receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I completed with my wife five years of missionary service in East Africa where people would have rated us as successful missionaries. We had the approval of our mission. We had the approval of the British government, the education department with whom we were associated. I still have letters of testimonial from them today. But when we came back to Europe at the end of 1961, and we were in my wife's native country, which is Denmark, for a little while I was not actively preaching, and the Lord began to deal with me. Now, I'm not going to seek to explain to you tonight exactly how he de dealt with me or exactly how God speaks. I know there are different ways that God speaks to different people. But let me say that the Lord very clearly spoke to me but not with an audible voice. And in essence, what he said was this, and I'm summarizing. Now, you have preached for so many years. You've been a missionary in two countries. You've been a pastor. You're the principal of a college. You're the member of a denomination. You have a pension scheme. He went down the whole thing in a very practical way. And then he came out with this question. Are you satisfied or do you want to go further? And that question really upset me. And you know, my first reaction, I'm ashamed to say it, was, well, is there anything further? I've preached the full gospel. What more is there to preach? Now, I knew there were many, many things in the Bible that I did not understand, but I did not feel that they were urgent, practical truths that a preacher needed to make known every day. But then if the Lord said, do you want to go further? It obviously seemed to the Lord that there was further to go. Now, I'm, I'm somewhat ashamed, really, of my reactions in some ways. Well, I have learned by experience not to speak hastily to God. Never say to God anything you don't mean because he'll hold you to it. So I said in so many words, Lord, give me a little time and I'll come back with my answer. And about three days later, I got back in touch with the Lord. It was on the top of a cliff in a lonely place. And I said, uh, I'm ready with my answer. And I said, no, Lord, I'm not satisfied. If there is anything further, God forgive me for saying that, but I said, if there is anything further, I want to go further. And you know, when I said I'm not satisfied, for the first time I realized how dissatisfied I really was. And with many Christians, particularly preachers, there has to come a moment of truth when you face the fact that the results you achieve are not what you would wish to achieve. Many, many preachers come to this place. And then the devil will say, well, that's what everybody does. This is all there is to it. There is nothing more. There's nothing more to know. You just have to go on this way. True, it was different in the days of the apostles, but those days are past. Now, I didn't believe that, theoretically. But sometimes I acted as if the days of the apostles were past. Anyhow, I made a sincere commitment to God without having any idea of what I was committing myself to. But I said, Lord, I'm willing to go further. And from then on, the course of my life began to change under the hand of God. And it ended up totally different from what I had been anticipating. Within a year, the Lord brought me to the United States without my planning it. 
or having any intentions in that direction. I became a permanent resident of the United States, and just recently I took United States citizenship. Now, uh, that was not in my plan, but it was in God's plan. And I began to realize a few months after I made this commitment that the Lord was putting me through what I call a postgraduate course of spiritual training. And I must say it was thorough. He spared no time. He spared no expense. He would take me halfway across the continent back again just to learn one lesson. There were various things in the New Testament that he opened up to me that I had never understood or been able to apply before. And one of them was this business of dealing with evil spirits. Now, as a Pentecostal preacher, I'd always believed in evil spirits. They're in the Bible. Every now and then I'd been backed up into a corner in an unpleasant situation where I'd had to recognize that what was in front of me was somebody with an evil spirit. And like most people, I used to imagine that if I shouted loud enough, something might happen. And every now and then, something did happen. But it was a very isolated, unusual, and unwelcome experience, and I got away from it as quick as I could. Furthermore, because of my association with Pentecostal people, I had made an assumption, which most but not all Pentecostal believers make, that once you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, there's no possibility of having an evil spirit in you, and you cannot possibly need deliverance from an evil spirit. I've never heard anybody preach a sermon on that or prove it out of Scripture, but it was an assumption that was generally made, and I found myself making the same assumption. As a result of this, looking back on my past ministry, I can realize that people came to me whose needs I was absolutely unable to meet because I refused to recognize them. I can think of two particular cases. One was a young man who got saved in a street meeting when I was preaching, had a tremendous conversion, baptized in the Holy Spirit, became a very eager, dedicated worker for the Lord. I mean, he put most other people to shame with his zeal and his dedication. But he had one problem. A very embarrassing one. It was lust in a specific form. And he never could get permanent victory over this. And he would come to my wife and me and say, pray with me. And I remember one occasion we prayed from about 10 o'clock at night till about 2 a.m. And he would say, it's leaving me. It's leaving me. Don't stop praying. I can feel it. It's in my fingers. It's going. Now, if I heard anybody say that today, I'd know immediately what to do. But in those days, this didn't make sense to me. And so though we prayed by the hour, we never got that young man delivered. And I met him years later, he still had the same problem. A dedicated, sincere Christian worker, but there was one area in his life where he never got permanent victory. And it affected, of course, a great deal of the rest of his testimony. Then there was another man who came, a Jew from Germany. And I particularly love the Jewish people, I'm particularly delighted when a Jew finds Christ. This man found Christ and made a bold, open confession, which is not easy for a Jew. Now, I got to know a little bit of background. Out of his entire family in Germany, only he and an elder brother survived. All the rest of the family, father, mother, uncles, cousins, aunts, every other relative, perished in Hitler's gas chambers. Secondly, he was the second child and his mother had wanted a girl. And when he turned up a boy, she just wouldn't accept the fact that he was a boy until he was about 15 years old. She dressed him and treated him as if he was a girl. Now, if I met anybody with those two facts in their background today, I would immediately know even what demons to look for. But at that time, no. Now, he was saved. He was baptized in the Holy Spirit. I heard him speak in tongues, and I know German. It was not German. Beautiful, anointed other tongue. But at other times he would come to me and say, can't you get this devil out of me? And he would tell me things that this thing made him do. He would even, to punish himself, he would put his fingers in the door and slam the door on his fingers. And though it's not pleasant to speak about it, he was driven to drinking his own urine as a form of self-punishment. Now, if I met anybody that said that to me today, I would know immediately the nature of their problem. He said, drive this devil out of me. I said, you can't have a devil in you. You're baptized in the Holy Spirit. I heard you speak in tongues. And I, can, I could add many to that list. But I realized because of my particular doctrinal preconception at that point, I was not able to see, and therefore I was not able to minister to the needs of these people. Well, it was when this period of what I call post-graduate spiritual training that one of the main themes God dealt with was evil spirits 
and how to deal with them. And he brought me face to face with a fact absolutely in a way that could not be challenged by anybody that's willing to accept simple, plain facts. That multitudes of people baptized in the Holy Spirit still need deliverance from evil spirits. Now, I'm going to tell you just briefly one or two of the main instances that brought me face to face with this. And I'm only going to give a few instances out of many, but some that always remain vividly in my memory. In 1963-64, I was pastoring an independent Pentecostal church in a certain city in the United States. And one day, a Baptist pastor phoned me. It was a Saturday morning. Now, I, I, my idea as a Baptist pastor at, those time, at that time was somewhat different from what they are now. This man had been baptized in the Holy Spirit, and for that reason he wasn't pastoring a Baptist church. But he was a Baptist pastor, and he said, I have a lady who needs deliverance from evil spirits. Well, that was a rather unusual statement for me to hear from the lips of a Baptist pastor in the first place. Then he said she's been baptized in the Holy Spirit. Well, that was still more surprising. And then he said, the Lord has shown me that you and your wife are to be the instruments of deliverance, and it's to happen today. Well, I've never had anybody say that over, to me, over the phone to me before, and I don't let people dictate to me with their revelations. So I sent a quick wire up to the Lord while I was still on the phone. Lord, is this you? Is this all right? Am I to go along with this? And it seemed to me the Lord said, yes, this is right. Well, I said, all right, bring the lady around. So my wife and I prepared for this. In the meanwhile, a Presbyterian married couple came along who also had received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, just visiting. I said, sit down, stay and see what happens. Well, the Baptist pastor came in with a lady. She was, I would say, about 35 years old. I learned later that she was a mother of three children and perfectly ordinary-looking American middle-class housewife, you would say. This Baptist pastor got down to business very quickly. He sat the lady down in a chair, said, now she's been delivered from the demon of nicotine, but there are others there. And I sat there, uh, detached and observing and deciding not to go along with it and yet not to reject it. And then he did something that, now I want to say emphatically at this point, I'm not recommending everything that was done as being a pattern of what should be done. By no means, I'm just telling you the way it was. So he sat this lady down in the chair and started to stir up the devil in her. That's exactly what he did. He commanded Satan to manifest himself. And after a while, there was a definite reaction from the lady. I was sitting there watching her, and her countenance changed. It was as though another personality was beginning to appear. And a thing I've never forgotten, a kind of yellow sulfurous glare appeared in the center of each eyeball. And I knew objectively that there was something there that wasn't just a good middle-class Baptist housewife. But uh, this preacher, like many, many people, not just preachers, uh, had the idea, which I must say is incorrect, that demons will get impressed if you shout at them. It isn't true. All you're doing is wasting a lot of strength and energy. It could be better used in other ways. And he was shouting at this, whatever it was, in this woman. And uh, as I say, he got the thing to show its presence, but got no further. So I thought to myself, well, if he can do it, I can do it. And I must thank God that I had a thorough, basic knowledge of Scripture. I'm glad that I had it before I went into this. And everything that I did and everything that, I ha that happened, I checked mentally with reference to Scripture. So I knew, theoretically, that if I spoke to this thing in the name of Jesus, it would have to obey me. I knew that. Luke 10, 17, there it is. Even the demons are subject unto us through thy name. <clears throat> so I got in front of the lady. And I said to her something like this. I said, now, you evil spirit that's in this woman, I'm talking to you and not to the woman. What is your name? In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I command you to answer me. And the answer came immediately. Just one syllable, like a serpent's hiss. Hate. And everything in the woman's features and attitude registered pure, undiluted hatred. I had never seen such total hatred in anybody's eyes in all my life. Well, there I was, I'd got the name, and I really didn't know what to do next. Now, I have to say, in what follows, I was motivated by one thought. Whatever the devil wants, I want something different. If he would say one thing, I would say the opposite. Now, I want to tell you that this was in the presence of about four or five reliable witnesses, all of whom would be willing to testify today to what happened. Well, I thought, what do I do now? So I said, now, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you demon of hate, or I think they said, you spirit of hate, come out of her. 
and this insolent voice, which was not the least bit like the woman's voice, said this. This is my house. I've lived here 35 years, and I'm not coming out. And again, I said to myself, that's right, Matthew 12, Jesus said the unclean spirit called the person in whom he had resided his house. Well, I said, you are coming out. And after that, it became a kind of psychological warfare. I had to beat this thing down stage by stage, and each stage took quite a while. And what I'm describing, and I'm going to describe it briefly, actually took five hours to transpire. So I said, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you are coming out. And it said, I'm not coming out. And I said, you are coming out. And I gradually realized the more I quoted scripture and used the name of Jesus, the more ascendancy I gained over this thing. So after a while, it began to bargain with me. And it said, well, if I come out, I'll come back. When I immediately, whatever it said, I was going to say the opposite. I said, no, you'll come out and you'll stay out. And we argued that one for a while. And then it came down one notch lower. And it said, well, even if I come out, my brothers are here and they'll kill her. Well, I didn't know anything about his brothers, but I was going to argue everyone. So I said, no, you come out first and your brothers will come out after you. And I picked up the message, there's something more than one in here. Well, we argued that one, and then it said, well, even if we come out of the woman, we've got her daughter, and we'll kill her. Well, I didn't know the woman had a daughter at the time, but I said, no, you come out of the woman first, and you'll come out of her daughter afterwards. Well, after this argument, it changed its tactics, and without any warning, the woman's arms rose up, crossed over her throat, and she began to throttle herself with her own arms. And now this was not play, her face was going purple, and her eyes were starting to protrude out of her head. So the Presbyterian man was taller and heavier than I am, and I rose up, and with our united strength, we just succeeded in pulling that woman's hands away from her throat. Her strength was totally supernatural. After this, I went at this thing again, and at this, all this time, in me, there was a tremendous inner, tremendous inner pressure, like an inflated balloon, sort of pushing against this spirit in this woman. But at a certain moment, as something happened, there was a kind of hissing noise out of the woman's mouth, her head dropped forward limply, her body relaxed, and this pressure in me relaxed, and I knew it had gone out. But after a little while, the woman became tense again, and I realized that there were what the demon called its brothers there. So we went through this procedure for, as I say, about five hours. And it was very tiring, so when one of us got tired, another one would step in front and more or less use the same methods. And I think in the course of the day, practically every adult present took a turn in dealing with these evil spirits. Um, the first one that named itself was hate. The next one, if I remember rightly, was fear. Then there was pride, and jealousy, and self-pity. Now that was a revelation to me. Self-pity is a demon. Oh, how many things I began to understand in my own experience and other people's immediately when I grasped that fact. By this time, the woman was getting very exhausted and we had spent about four hours. When we got to self-pity, I made the next one name itself. It said infidelity. And at the time, I didn't understand that, so I put it in my pending file. But I know well now that there are demons that drive women to sexual immorality. I wasn't quite sure how to interpret that word. And let me say that a demon like infidelity does not necessarily come in because a woman has been unfaithful to her husband. It comes in to make her unfaithful to her husband. Or a husband to his wife. That a demon like infidelity does not necessarily come in because a woman has been unfaithful to her husband. It comes in to make her unfaithful to her husband. Or a husband to his wife. We still hadn't finished and I made the next spirit name itself, and it said, death. And immediately I thought, could that be scriptural? And there came to my mind, Revelation 6, the horse whose rider was called death. And I realized that death is not just a condition, it's a personality. Now, I don't recommend talking to demons in a conversational way or consulting them, but it is scriptural to ask them questions and compel them to answer. And as I say, I'm not saying that everything I did was a pattern of what should be done. 
But I said to this spirit of death, when did you enter into this woman? And it said about three and a half years ago when she nearly died on the operating table. And later I checked with the woman, this was true. She'd had major surgery and almost died on the operating table. And I've learned since then that if a person has a major illness or a major operation, the spirit of death very frequently enters at that time. And a person who receives the spirit of death may well die without adequate physical grounds to cause death. And I have confirmed this since then with medical doctors who've been in this realm of experience. Well, we went against this spirit of death and ultimately it came out. As it came out, her face became like a death mask. There was not one shred of color anywhere in it. It was waxen, cold, and when the spirit came out, she was stretched on her back on the floor. And anybody walking into the room would have said instantly there was a dead woman on the floor. And I remember then how they said about the boy out of whom Jesus drove the epileptic spirit. They said he's dead, but Jesus said he is not dead and raised him up. The woman lay exhausted for about 10 minutes and then began to praise the Lord and speak in tongues. She had been speaking in tongues before. And I had stopped her because God showed me that while she was speaking in tongues, the evil spirits couldn't come out. They couldn't pass that barrier. This isn't orthodox Pentecostal doctrine, but it just happens to be true. Uh, so that was it. Five hours. We felt the battle was won. Now, if this were to happen today, I would know immediately that such a woman would need follow-up and further instruction to, as to how to protect herself because Satan would certainly not leave her alone. However, we didn't know this. About halfway through the following week, she phoned my wife and me and said, I think some of them are trying to come back. Would you come out and see me? So we went out to her home and began to talk with her. And the youngest child, a girl of six, was there. A thin, unhappy, shy little child who never would look you in the eyes. No matter how you looked at her, she would not look you in the eyes. And she was graded at school, retarded. So after a little while, I said to this mother, I said, I know the devil is, doesn't always tell the truth. But when he said that they'd got your daughter, I think he must have been telling the truth. She said, would you pray for my daughter? I said, certainly we will. So she made an appointment. And exactly one week later, the following Saturday, they came with this little girl of six. Approximately the same people were present, the Presbyterian brother and his wife. I don't think the Baptist minister was there the second time. And for about three or three and a half hours, we went through the same procedure with the little girl of six that we'd gone through with the mother. The evil spirits took over. They took charge of her countenance. They took charge of her gestures. And they spoke with their voice out of the little girl's lips. And I turned to the mother and said, is that your daughter's voice you're listening to? She said, it isn't even like my daughter's voice. And several of the same spirits that had been in the mother were in the daughter. Hate was one. I don't remember all of them, but I remember vividly the last one again was death. And when this spirit of death came out, the little child, like the mother, was stretched out on the floor, looking like a corpse. Now, I have not been able to follow up fully on that, but about two years later, that child was doing all right at school and was no longer graded retarded. There's this positive evidence of a change that took place. Well, this experience really, once and for all, opened my eyes. I saw the reality of evil spirits. I saw that they were exactly as they were portrayed in the New Testament, that they acted the same way, and that the New Testament way of dealing with them was the only really effective way. Now, I was preaching then to my congregation who were good Pentecostals, real good Pentecostals. And I began to look at my congregation in a new light. I saw things and forces at work in them that I'd never understood. So I thought they need deliverance too. And I began to kind of preach in a roundabout way about deliverance. Well, I'll tell you, it's no good preaching in a roundabout way. Never give hints as a preacher because the wrong people always take them. You, you give a hint about being too noisy and the one that's noisy doesn't listen, but the little shy, mousy woman that never would open her mouth is squelched forever, you see? If you've got anything to say to an individual, say it to the individual, not to the group. That's just by the way. Well. When I began to talk about deliverance for Pentecostal people, they sat back with an indulgent sort of smile on their face and thought our pastor's got to be in his bonnet, but he's helped us and he'll get over it. And who knows what would have happened. But one Sunday morning in the worship service, I had chosen as my text Isaiah 59, 19, when the enemy shall come in like a flood, 
the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. Now, I was not aware of it, but a tape was being made of this message, and it's preserved, and I have it today, so I can, it, everything I say can be verified from the tape. And I didn't hear the tape till about six months later, and I was interested to hear myself because I realized about, after about 15 minutes of preaching, the Holy Spirit began to take control of me in an unusual way, and I began to say things that I hadn't planned to say, and furthermore, my voice changed. I mean, I, I listened to myself with interest, and I became unusually bold in my preaching. My theme was that no matter what the devil does, God has always got the last word, and God began to bring things to my mind. I said, Egypt had their magicians, God had his Moses. Baal had his prophets, God had his Elijah. And then the thought was brought to me that when God wanted to show Abraham what his seed would be like, he took him out in the dark night and showed him the stars of heaven and said, so shall thy seed be. And I said to these people, now we are the seed of Abraham by faith in Jesus Christ, and we're like the stars. When all the other lights are shining, you don't see the stars. But when every other light has gone out, then the stars shine brighter than they've ever shone before. And this is how it's going to be at the close of this age. When every other light has gone out, the seed of Abraham through faith in Jesus Christ are going to shine like the stars. Well, it's interesting to know the messages the devil doesn't like. And I'll tell you, that one is at the top of his list. And I just got to this climax, and the most unexpected thing happened. Sitting on the front pew on my left was a lady who came every Sunday morning specifically to play the piano. Now, she was the daughter of a Pentecostal pastor. She was married to a Pentecostal Bible student. Her brother-in-law was a minister. She had grown up in Pentecost, known salvation, the baptism of the Holy Spirit from her earliest years. She was a test case. And as I reached this point in my message, she let out a prolonged blood-curdling shriek. And this is recorded on the tape, so there's no need to exaggerate about it. Threw her arms up in the air and slumped to the floor in a very unladylike attitude. And here I was, I just preached, no matter what the devil does, God has got the last word. So I either had to prove it or stop preaching. That was where I was. So I intended to prove it. I'll tell you, I didn't feel like backing down for one moment. But I thought I needed a little help. So I looked across the congregation. I saw my wife. I knew I could count on her. And I thought, well, maybe we need one or two more. And I looked at my good Pentecostal church members. And honestly, there was not one of them that could say boo to a demon. But the Presbyterian couple who'd been with us in the two previous battles were there, and I knew they knew what it was all about. So I said, will brother, sister, so-and-so come out, help us? And the four of us gathered around this woman, still writhing and moaning on the floor. And this Presbyterian lady, I always remember her, when it came to demons, she was like a terrier after rat. She didn't wait for anything. She started to jump up and down, and she said, now you spirit that's in this woman, what is your name? And out of this woman's voice, there came a uh, throat, there came a harsh, gruff, masculine sounding voice, which said, my name is, but wouldn't say anymore. Well, I always need somebody to get me going. So I thought if the Presbyterian lady can do it, I can do it. So I stood in front of this spirit and I said, now in the name of Jesus Christ, I'm speaking to you and not to the woman. What is your name? I said, my name is, but wouldn't say anymore. So I said, you have to answer me. You're subject unto me. And after a little of this psychological warfare, it suddenly said, my name is lies. And it said it so loud that everybody in the church went up and down, came down with a bump on the, so you could have heard it outside the church. And I said to myself, that's scriptural. First Kings chapter 22, a lying spirit in the mouth of the prophets of Ahab. I said, you lying spirit in the name of Jesus, come out of this woman. And then began 10 minutes of the most intensive struggle I think I can ever recall in my life. Spiritual, mental, physical. It was total warfare. This thing defied us. It refused to come, but I knew it had to. And after about 10 minutes, it came out of this woman with a loud, prolonged, sustained roar like an express train going past. And as it came out, the woman's tongue was protruding out of her mouth, bluish in color and twisting like a snake. And when the spirit had gone, the roar subsided and the woman fell to the ground like an emptied sack. And I knew the spirit had gone, but I also knew there were more. God was so good to give me a few private runs before I got launched in public. Otherwise, I'd have made a fool of myself and said, praise the Lord, our sister is delivered. She was delivered of that. But I knew instantly from what I felt inside me, there was a lot more. However, I thought that was enough for the morning worship service. So I said to, to the church treasurer, who happened to be on hand, I said, now, if you'll take our sister into the office, I'll continue with my sermon. So the church treasurer and the Presbyterian brother marched the lady off into the office. And I went back to the pulpit. Well, I tell you, I was preaching at round eyes and open mouths. 
and I never had to argue with that congregation again about demons. There just wasn't any argument left. Well, my wife went in with the lady, and after a little while, only a few moments, I heard dull thuds coming out of the office, and my wife put her head around the corner of the door and said, you better come in here quickly. And I knew my wife wasn't given to panic, so I realized something was going on there that needed my presence. So I said to the people, well, I think I'll close my sermon, and you can either stay in the church and pray or go home, whatever you feel like. So I got down off the platform to go into the office, and the mother of this woman that had made this strange display, a very godly, saintly woman, walked up to me, and she said, Mr. Prince, was that our daughter? And you know I didn't know how to answer her. I thought, it must have been. There was only one person sitting on that seat. But the whole countenance and behavior of the woman had changed so completely, I didn't dare to say yes. I said, I think it must have been. There was no one else sitting there. She said, may I come with you into the office? I said, by all means. So she and her husband, the girl's father, came in. Then the husband of the girl was there. He came in. Well, when we got in the office, it was, a, it was not like it should have been in a pastor's office. The girl was being held, one on each arm, by the church treasurer and the Presbyterian brother. And every time she got a hand free, she was just tearing her clothes off. And if she couldn't tear her clothes off, she was tearing other people's clothes off. And when I saw this scene, I thought to myself, this is where Pentecostal preachers get into trouble. So I said to the family, husband, father, and mother, I said, now, if you'd like to take this young lady to a psychiatrist, that's perfectly all right by me. But I will do nothing more unless you all assure me that you want me to handle this case. So they all said instantly, we'd like you to handle it. Well, I said, in that case, I think everybody except my wife and the members of the family and myself should leave the office. So they did. Well, then the mother of the girl began to tell me that she'd been seeking to make an appointment for some time to get counseling for the girl and her husband because their marriage had begun to take a very strange turn. And I don't want to go into the details, but a, the woman was a nurse and she was able to express these things very correctly. A strange type of perversion was developing between this woman and her husband, which was totally unlike what you'd imagine a Pentecostal couple would get involved in. And then it transpired I was, then I began to think, well, I'll pray again, and I couldn't. And then it transpired that this young woman was infatuated with her brother-in-law, her husband's brother, and that they were exchanging letters, which could have a perfectly good meaning or could have a somewhat different meaning, and that she had one of these letters addressed to her husband's brother in her purse at the time. Well, I said immediately, now this is sin. And if you will not renounce it as sin, I will not pray for you, because I cannot pray for you if you intend to keep up this relationship. And I said, if you will renounce it, you'll give me that letter in your purse, and I'll tear it up in front of you. Well, it took 10 minutes to convince that woman that she had to do this. She handed me the letter, and I tore it up and dropped it in the waste paper basket. Then I thought, now really, if she's a woman, it would be better if my wife were to pray with her. But somehow God showed me very clearly, this is your job. I put my hand on the woman, and as soon as I touched her, she slumped to the floor in a sitting position. And then again, in a way that I cannot explain, the Lord showed me that there was only one position of her body in which this woman could receive deliverance, and that was with her body pressed forward and her head between her knees. So I put my hand on the small of her back and pressed her body forwards. Something like, well, I would say almost like being in the delivery room of a maternity ward. And... Uh, now, this will sound extraordinary to some people, but I began to command the evil spirits to come out, and they came out, one after another, naming themselves. And some of them had very unclean sexual names. And this is the thing. As they came out of her body, each one registered against the palm of my hand. I could, it's like, I don't know if you've ever seen people dropping airline tickets in, and there's a little beep as each airline ticket goes in, and they count them at the gate, and there's a record. Well, it was just like that. It was like a sort of electronic record in my hand each time a, Spirit went past. Now, I had no theories about this, but it was clear and definite. Now, this happened around about noon, and around about two o'clock in the afternoon, so far as I was able to judge, the last spirit went out. And when it did, the woman was totally exhausted. She was absolutely like a rag. She just slumped limply onto the floor and lay there for about 10 minutes, then put her arms up in the air and began to praise the Lord for deliverance. So far as I know, that woman was delivered as far as I'm able to understand. But I tell you one typical and sad thing. She never returned to that congregation. She was too ashamed to come back. And to me, this seems to be such an indictment of the church. We're so respectable that when people really get into trouble, they can't come to us. And I'm convinced this is true again and again of the Christian church in the United States. It's like a middle-class club. 
That's about what it is. And the people that really often need help the most just wouldn't dream of coming to that kind of a place to get help. Well, after that, I never had to convince my congregation that spirit-baptized Christians could have evil spirits. And from then on, my wife and I were launched into a new phase of ministry. We didn't choose it. It just was like an explosion. It was like an avalanche. People came from everywhere. And most of them did not come to the church. They came to our home. How they knew we were there, it's hard to say. But for week after week, we never went to bed before about two or three in the morning. We had people in our home counseling and praying with them. Now, as a result of this, my own physical strength began to break down, and I got a very serious lesson that if I didn't watch my own strength and spiritual condition, I wouldn't be in a position to deliver anybody. I'd need deliverance myself. And also, I began to see that this was really not a practical way to handle the situation. I soon discovered that the basis for getting a person delivered is proper instruction out of the Word of God, and that to give a person the instruction they needed would take probably about an hour. To pray with them would take, say, another 30 minutes. In other words, each individual took an hour and a half. So if you took 30 people a week, that was 45 working hours, which by modern standards is a working week. And furthermore, it was extremely uh, wearing physically for the people doing it. So I didn't quite know what to do, but the Lord gradually showed me that this isn't necessary. As a matter of fact, I really cannot recall exactly how I got into it, but I found myself preaching on deliverance, calling people forward and instructing them how to receive deliverance and then seeing them delivered without all this individual counseling and praying. I remember vividly one of the first situations in which this really happened was the International Convention of the Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship in Chicago in 1965 in the Conrad Hilton Hotel. And I was doing the afternoon Bible teaching each afternoon for five days and uh, one day I taught on deliverance. There were about 600 people in the Bible class. And at the end, I made one appeal for those who felt they might need deliverance. And immediately, 200 people put up their hands at a minimum. I called them forward and I found 200 people standing in front of me needing deliverance. And I thought, what do I do now? And it really was at that point that I saw that if I gave them the correct instructions and prayed a general prayer, it, they could get their own deliverance. And many did. I can still meet people over the United States who say, I got delivered in that service in the Conrad Hilton Hotel in 1965. But I'll have to admit it was a chaotic scene. There were a couple of epileptics that fell to the floor and were frothing. And there were women screaming and some women just rushed out in panic and went up to their hotel rooms and decided they wouldn't come down again as long as I was preaching. So I have to agree with my critics, of whom there have been some, that it wasn't the standard type of service. And really, I suppose the Conrad Hilton Hotel isn't really the place for that sort of thing. We had another instance of deliverance in those meetings. The last afternoon when I didn't preach on deliverance, we got landed with a young woman. And again, this was a five-hour case. And I did not count, but a lady who was present counted and wrote down the names of 72 different spirits that named themselves and came out of this one girl. Now, we know this girl today. She's a friend of ours. She's living for God. This is not just a temporary flash of emotionalism. She's a trained nurse. She's not the type of person who's ignorant or couldn't express herself or could be misled as to what was happening. And uh, some of these spirits that came out of her were fantastic. For instance, there was one that was the spirit of fetishes that understood Swahili, which I spoke from East Africa. The girl had never been near East Africa, didn't understand a word of Swahili. This spirit knew everything about East Africa that was needed to know. See, it could name politicians and answer questions and so on. So in many ways, I got objective proof of the validity of this thing. And uh, then I began to think, well, is it right to do it in public? It embarrasses some people. Some people don't feel it's appropriate to a church service and so on. But I began to study the ministry of Jesus, and it was made very clear to me that Jesus regularly did this in the synagogue. He taught, and then he cast out demons in all the synagogues of Galilee, and they were not quiet. They screamed, they threw people on the ground, they frothed at the mouth, they identified him as the Son of God, and so on. It wasn't done in that decorous seemly way that some people like to associate with a synagogue or a church. There was plenty of action. But I said to myself, and I still say that today, if it was good enough for Jesus, 
It's good enough for me. As far as I'm concerned, I have no ambition to improve on the methods of the Lord. If I can attain to that, that will be my ambition satisfied in that respect. And uh, I can only praise God that in the years between then and now, without exaggeration, I have seen thousands of people delivered from evil spirits, and I have written testimonies from those who must number well over a hundred, all sorts of persons, physicians, lawyers, teachers, attorneys, not ignorant, emotional, unstable people who don't know what they're talking about, who cared enough without my ever pressing them to, to write down and express what deliverance meant and to express their gratitude to God and also to me for receiving deliverance. And I will say this, of all the torments that people endure today, there is no torment, in my opinion, that equals the mental and spiritual torments that demons inflict on people. And if you want to have some idea of what it's like, go to a mental institution. Uh, I actually hate to think inside me what it's like to be inside the doors of one of those places. I've gone to those places, ministered to people, but it's very, very hard to minister when a person's under psychiatric or medical care. You cannot cross swords with the psychiatrist. We had a woman in the meeting here the night we had the potluck supper and the baptismal service, the last time I saw her, she was in a mental institution in the state of North Carolina. And her husband took me to see her and said that she was apparently a hopeless case. And I do not remember what I said to her, but I told her the root of her problem. And she came here that Saturday night about four weeks ago and said, I want to thank you for telling me the truth. You're the one who helped me. That's why I'm out, because you told me the truth about myself. And when I faced the truth, I got out, and she's been out for two or three years now. So these are facts about this. Now, I would like to go back to Scripture just in closing this message, and I want again to line this up with the book of Joel, which, as I've said in other studies, I believe is, a, is an outline of this latter-day visitation of the Holy Spirit. I've said in previous studies the theme of Joel is desolation, restoration, and judgment. And the desolation is the desolation of the entire inheritance of God's people. And uh, one day when I was meditating on this ministry and what it had brought me into, God asked me this question. He said, you've preached on the desolation of the inheritance of my people many times. He said, did you ever stop to think what caused that desolation? And I said, no, Lord, but I've got it right now. It was an invading army of insects. And the Lord said to me, my people have been systematically invaded by the forces of the enemy, and these are demons. It's not an accident. It's part of Satan's strategy. And one of the great end products of the present move of the Holy Spirit in the church is to drive out Satan's fifth column from inside the church. And the church will never be able to function as God designed it to function while it has a fifth column inside it. And what is true of the church collectively is true of believers individually. You cannot be the kind of Christian that God could make you when you have something inside you taking away your peace, fighting against what is true and good, disturbing and tearing down from within. You may have outward victory. You may be able to lead a decent Christian life. You may be able to suppress this thing. But remember one thing, God's solution is not suppression. It's deliverance. Lots and lots of Christians are suppressing something that shouldn't be there. They make a good job of suppressing it, but it isn't God's solution. Now look at the picture here in Joel 1.4. That which the palmer worm hath left hath the locust eaten, and that which the locust hath left hath the canker worm eaten, and that which the canker worm hath left hath the caterpillar eaten. That's the invading army. And the result of the invasion is summed up at the end of verse 12. Joy is withered away from the sons of men. And that's what demons do. A Christian cannot have deep, settled, abiding inner peace and joy while the enemy is there, like an insect nibbling away at the fruit of the Spirit. Restoration is described in Joel 2.25. I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. 
This is the promise of restoration. It comes in direct association with the promise of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at the close of this age. And notice the summation of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the climax of what is achieved by the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. In Joel 2.32, it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. God has shown me that part of my ministry is not to pray for everybody individually, but to instruct people how to meet God's conditions so that they can call on the name of the Lord and receive deliverance direct from God for themselves. And this is in direct line with Scripture. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. Now let me just state in closing four results in my own personal life and experience which I have traced from being brought into this ministry. First of all, I have proved afresh the accuracy and reliability of the Scriptures. Demons are just the way they're described. They behave the same way and they need to be treated the same way and it works. It's not uh, a medieval superstition. It's not ignorance. The Lord didn't put himself down on the level of people of his day because he didn't know better and they didn't know better. This is exactly the way it is and it's exactly the same today as it was in the New Testament. It's a fact. Secondly, God showed me many times through helping others my own need of personal watchfulness and holiness in an altogether new way. So many times I realized how people yielding to moods like anger, bitterness, resentment, self-pity had opened the way for evil spirits. God showed me how I had to cover my own life. And I'll tell you, I may not be the kind of Christian I ought to be, but I am much closer to the Lord today than I was when I first moved into this ministry. I've covered up many, many gaps in my armor. Thirdly, I have understood in a new way the significance of the cross. In the spiritual world, denominations, month and nothing. Labels are of no importance. All that matters in the spiritual realm is what Christ did on the cross. His shed blood, his death, his resurrection, and what that means for the believer. And fourthly, I have to praise God and give him the glory that I have been able to help literally thousands of people whom I could not have helped until God showed me these truths which I have been sharing with you. In this study in this series, I related how the Lord had led me personally into a ministry of dealing with evil spirits or demons and many of the lessons that I'd learned personally from this ministry. At the close of that study, I pointed out four results which I could trace in my own life from becoming involved in this ministry. First of all, I proved afresh the accuracy and reliability of the Scriptures. Secondly, I gained a new understanding of my own personal need of watchfulness and holiness. Thirdly, I gained a new understanding of the cross and of what Christ accomplished there. And fourthly, I have been able to help thousands of people whom previously I could not have helped. In this study, I want to take up the theme, How Jesus Dealt with Demons. Let me say, first of all, that I use the words demons or evil spirits interchangeably. In a later study, I propose to take some time to describe the nature of demons and how the various phrases are used, but I am, for the time being, just using them interchangeably. By way of introduction to this present study, I would like to read from Mark's Gospel, chapter 1, commencing at verse 21 and reading through verse 39. I'll read in the King James Version, but in the last verse I want to give you also Philip's translation. This first chapter of Mark really gives the opening of Jesus' public preaching ministry. And they went into Capernaum, and straightway on the Sabbath day he entered into the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his doctrine, or his teaching, for he taught them as one that had authority, and not as the scribes. And there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace, and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had torn him and cried with a loud voice, he came out of him. And they were all amazed, insomuch that they questioned among themselves, saying, what thing is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority commandeth he even the unclean spirits, and they do obey him. And immediately his fame spread abroad throughout all the region round about Galilee. 
And forthwith, when they were come out of the synagogue, they entered into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. But Simon's wife's mother lay sick of a fever, and anon they tell him of her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. And immediately the fever left her, and she ministered unto them. And at even when the sun did set, they brought unto him all that were diseased and them that were possessed with devils. And all the city was gathered together at the door. And he healed many that were sick of divers diseases and cast out many devils, and suffered not the devils to speak, because they knew him. And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place, and there prayed. And Simon and they that were with him followed after him. And when they had found him, they said unto him, All men seek for thee. And he said unto them, Let us go into the next towns, that I may preach there also. For therefore came I forth. And he preached in their synagogues throughout all Galilee, and cast out devils. Let me say, first of all, that the translation devils is unfortunate and should never have been used. The word should be demons. The word devil is used as a single title of Satan himself and is never correctly used of evil spirits. The correct phrases to use are evil spirits or demons. Now I'd like to read out the translation of Phillips of Mark 1.39, which you'll find there on your outline. This gripped me when I read it one day because it brought out certain points that I feel are so important. Philip's version of that verse, 39, is as follows. So he continued preaching in their synagogues and expelling evil spirits throughout the whole of Galilee. First of all, I like the word continued, which is a translation of the Greek continuous past tense and is correct in its significance. In other words, this was a normal part of the ministry of Jesus. It was not something that happened occasionally. It was not something exceptional. It was his normal practice throughout his public ministry. Secondly, we notice that his expelling evil spirits, expelling is the word which Philip use, uses, and it's an excellent one, was directly associated with his preaching ministry. It was not separated in a corner, but it was part of the public ministry. Together with his preaching, he also regularly expelled or cast out evil spirits, and he regularly did this in the public place of worship, the synagogue. And he did it throughout the whole of Galilee. If you would take time to read that sentence two or three times, it would give you a very different picture of the ministry of Jesus from that which most Christians had. Everywhere he went, he went into every public place of worship, he preached and he regularly cast out evil spirits. Now I would like to point out some things that are of particular significance in considering the ministry of Jesus in relation to evil spirits. Let us notice, first of all, what is said there in Mark 1, 27 and 28. After this first incident with the man with the unclean spirit in the synagogue, it says, They were all amazed, insomuch that they questioned among themselves, saying, What thing is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority commandeth he even the unclean spirits, and they do obey him. And immediately his, frame, his fame spread abroad throughout all the region round about Galilee. I have said there in the outline, and I might just as well read what I've said because I think it's as good as I can do it. The way that Jesus dealt with demons was the most original and striking feature of his whole ministry. He also performed miracles of healing, provision, control over the forces of nature, raising the dead, and so on. And we can all think of, of miracles of Jesus that came under these various headings. Miracles of healing, miracles of provision, such as the feeding of the 5,000, the 4,000, Control over the forces of nature, as for instance, when he quieted the storm, when he walked on the waters, and raising the dead. But all these miracles that I have listed had occurred previously in the ministry of Old Testament believers, such as Moses, Joshua, Elijah, Elisha. Moses and Joshua controlled the elements in various different ways at different times. Elijah and Elisha both raised the dead, both healed the sick, and all these men with the possible exception of Joshua, performed the miracles of provision. So though this was very evident in the ministry of Jesus and outstanding and many times dramatic, it was not the most outstanding or the most dramatic feature of his ministry. The thing that he did, which had never been done before in the scriptural record, was the way he treated demons. 
He is speaking to them and commanding them and causing them to obey him and leave people was what gripped the imagination of the people of his day instantly and caused his reputation to spread more rapidly than anything else that he did. Now, the people of the Old Testament were familiar with the existence of evil spirits. They're referred to in those scriptures that I've given there. We do not need to turn there. Leviticus 17, 7, Deuteronomy 32, 17, Psalm 106, verses 36 and 37. In each case, the King James Version uses the word devils, but the correct word should be demons. Furthermore, the people of Jesus' day recognized the reality of demons and practiced some form of exorcism. Let me give you two examples of that. In Matthew 12, 27, Jesus answers the charge made by the Pharisees that it was through being in league with Beelzebub, the prince of the demons, that he was able to cast out demons. And he said in Matthew 12, 27, If I by Beelzebub cast out demons, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore shall they be your judges. So he made it clear that there were amongst the Jewish people those that attempted exorcism or the casting out of demons. And again, this is stated even more clearly in Acts chapter 19, where we read about unbelieving Jews, that is, Jews who were not believers in Jesus, who attempted exorcism in the name of Jesus with consequences that were disastrous for themselves. We'll only read verses 13 and 14 of Acts chapter 19. Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus, whom Paul preached. And there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew, and chief of the priests, which did so. So those passages prove that the people of Jesus' day recognized the reality of evil spirits or demons and practiced certain forms of exorcism, exorcism being a polite word for casting out evil spirits. I say polite because it's used in the liturgy of the Roman Catholic and the Anglican or Episcopal Church, and it sounds to some people more religious and respectable, but actually it's just another way of saying that he drove out or cast out or expelled evil spirits. But the way in which Jesus did it was entirely new. They had never seen anything like that before, and they reacted with astonishment. What thing is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority commandeth he even the unclean spirits, and they do obey him. And as we already read in Mark 1.28, immediately his, his fame spread abroad throughout all the region round about Galilee. This was the thing that immediately set people talking. And it's comical to think that 19 centuries later, when people see the same thing, they say the same thing. What new doctrine is this? And it immediately sets people's tongues talking. Their human nature hasn't changed the least bit. Now, Jesus had one very illuminating thing to say about this in Matthew 12, 28. Without going into the context of this, he said to the people of his day who were challenging this ministry, but if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. And just two verses higher up, verse 26, he had said, If Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How shall then his kingdom stand? Notice that Jesus said clearly, Satan has a kingdom. Furthermore, he's the ruler of an undivided kingdom. Everything in his kingdom is subject to the will of Satan. But he said, If I come amongst you, manifesting my authority and causing these evil spirits to come out of people, then know that the kingdom of God is come unto you. In other words, in this particular ministry, more than in any other, there is the clear, open clash between the two spiritual kingdoms, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. Now, you see, in the Old Testament, essentially, these kingdoms were there, but to some measure submerged below the surface. It was the ministry of Jesus, and particularly this ministry of casting out evil spirits, that brought the reality of each of these two kingdoms right out into the open. People saw that Satan was real, that he had demons under his control. They saw that the power of God was real and that the power of God was greater than the power of Satan. So this was one of the absolutely new impacts produced by the ministry of Jesus. It was the bringing out of these two kingdoms and the clash between them right into the open where everybody could see it and also putting Satan to an open, manifest defeat. Now, let's continue to observe the other points in the ministry of Jesus. I'm going to follow the outline that you have. 
point number two, turn back for a moment to Mark chapter 1, which is the starting point for much of what I want to say. Verses 24 and 25, there in that incident in the synagogue, it says, there was a man with an unclean spirit and he cried out. The voice came out of the man, but it was not the man who was speaking. This is very clear. And what was said was this, let us alone. The one that was speaking was speaking not only on behalf of himself, but on behalf of a group. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? Immediately they saw in Jesus their potential destroyer. I know thee. Notice how it switches from singular to plural and back again, which is a familiar feature of this type of utterance. I know thee, who thou art, the Holy One of God. You see, the evil spirit knew Jesus immediately. No one else in that synagogue had yet realized who he was, but the evil spirit immediately identified him. Here is a different kind of perception, a different kind of knowledge. We're not on the natural plane. We're on a spiritual plane, a supernatural plane, and we have a direct clash between Jesus and not the man in whom the spirit was, but the spirit that was in the man. I have sometimes said that in an ordinary church service today, what they'd have done was put the man out of the synagogue for disturbing the service. But what Jesus did was put the demon out of the man and leave the man in the synagogue. But notice that there was a conversation, direct conversation, exchange, question and answer between Jesus and the evil spirits. They spoke to him and he spoke to them. Uh, again, in Mark chapter 3, we find another example of this. Uh, it says, Mark 3, verses 11 and 12, unclean spirits, when they saw him, fell down before him. You notice, of course, there was the people that fell down to the outward eye, but the scripture says the spirits fell down. Of course, they couldn't fall down without the people falling down, but it was not really the people falling down. It was the spirits falling down in the presence of the power and authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it says, they cried out saying, thou art the son of God. Notice they always knew instantly who he was. And he straightly charged them that they should not make him known. He would not accept the testimony of Satan's agents to his identity. See, he would not accept that testimony though they gave it. And then the dramatic incident in Mark chapter five, the conversation between Jesus and the man who's usually called the Gadarene demoniac, the demoniac from Gadara. And we'll read there verses 6 through 13. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him, and cried with a loud voice, and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. For he, Jesus, said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. Notice again, Jesus did not speak to the man, he spoke to the spirit in the man, and the spirit in the man answered Jesus, not the man, because the man was not afraid of being tormented by Jesus, but it was the demon that was afraid of being tormented. And verse 9, he asked him, what is thy name? Jesus asked the spirit, what is thy name? And he answered, my name is Legion, for we are many. Notice again the, the, the transition from singular to plural and back again, which is very, very typical. Now, a legion in the Roman army consisted of approximately 6,000 men. We don't necessarily have to maintain that there were 6,000 evil spirits in the one man, though personally, it, to me, it is possible to believe that. But at least the rest of the story shows us there were enough evil spirits to drive 2,000 pigs immediately down into the lake. And I never read this story without marveling at how much of satanic power a human being is able to cope with and somehow remain standing upright. To me, it's a miracle. And I have seen cases that are not unlike this and dealt with them. It's verse 10. He, the evil spirit, besought him, Jesus, much that he would not send them away out of the country. Fantastic, but that was where they felt at home. That's where they wanted to be. And besought him much indicates that there was more than one word said. In other words, there was a conversation are lasting at least a little time. Now there was nigh under the mountains a great herd of swine feeding, and all the demons besought him, saying, Send us into the swine, that we may enter into them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave, and the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. They were about two thousand, and were choked in the sea. 
We see here that Jesus dealt with these evil spirits as persons. He spoke to them as persons. They answered him as persons. There was a conversation between them. And eventually he gave them leave to do what they besought him to do, which was to enter into the swine. People often ask, why do you think that he allowed them to go into the swine? Was it because he was opposed to pig keeping, which of course was not permitted to Orthodox Jews? Uh, personally, I don't believe Jesus was so much uh, interested in defending the Orthodox observance of the law of Moses. My personal opinion, and it is only an opinion, is that Jesus allowed those evil spirits to go into the swine because then they went out without destroying the man. Had they gone out totally unwillingly, I question whether that man could have survived what he would have had to go through physically. So it was for the sake of the man that Jesus gave them a way out that they were willing to accept. Uh, however, having said this, I just want to emphasize that I do not believe there's any pattern in Scripture for holding lengthy conversations with evil spirits. And it's a dangerous practice. I would warn anybody against it because it eventually will lead to more or less consulting them, and that, in a certain sense, degenerates into witchcraft, or the same as seeking to a medium. So we have to be very, very much on our guard that we do not overstep the limits of prudence and wisdom, and that everything we do, we don't do for the sake of a morbid fascination with this form of supernatural experience, but for the sake of helping those that need help. All right, we'll move on to the third point in our outline, Mark 1.26, you'll notice that we go back to Mark 1 most of the time. This is again the incident of the man in the synagogue Capernaum. When the unclean spirit had torn him and cried with a loud voice, he came out of him. Notice there was a very powerful physical reaction. The unclean spirit tore the man. Uh, having seen this happen many, many times, to me it pictures a person's body being shaken and uh, you can almost with the inward eye, see the tentacles being released from within the man. I've often said to the spirits, come out with all your roots. And sometimes you almost have to loose the roots out where they're holding on to the inner being of that person. And uh, it is a very agonizing and powerful struggle. And there was also a loud cry. He cried with a loud voice. Some people say, well, how could it be if Jesus was Lord of all that he tolerated this? And uh, I just have to point out, this is the way it was. There was an open clash. You see, demons deliberately defy God. They're never going to make peace with God. They know they're beyond the uh, realm of God's reconciliation. They know they're going to hell, but they'll fight until they get there. They will never submit. And there's one thing they will never acknowledge, that Jesus Christ is Lord. They'll call him the Son of God. They'll call him the Holy One of God, but they will never call him Lord because Satan will not permit them to call anybody Lord but Satan. Notice other places where there were strong physical reactions. We've already marked, read Mark 3.11. Unclean spirits fell down before him. Uh, this is not, of course, a comical subject, but sometimes extremely comical things happen. I was preaching in a church in Houston at the end of a Bible study that had nothing to do with demons. And I don't know what I said. I said something about the sufferings of Christ. I don't know. But a woman came up to me and I looked at her and I knew there was something strange about her. And she was trying to point out something to me and she was stubbing at me with her finger in the air and saying, but the sufferings of Christ, she said about three times. And I said, sister, you have a religious demon. And she slid to the floor in a sitting position at my feet. And I was talking to an unconverted man, a rather high social position. So I thought, better ignore this incident and just carry on as if it didn't happen. <laughs> so I went on talking. And the woman went outside to the book table. And uh, two friends of mine, whom I will not name because it's on a tape, but they were selling my books outside. And somebody said, the spirit of grief. And when this word was said, this woman that had slid to my feet inside let out a most blood-curdling shriek and slipped to the floor. And uh, they spent the next two and a half hours dealing with this woman in the vestibule of the church. So much so that at one point a policeman came in, said, is there anything wrong? And they said, no, it's quite all right. They said, well, I wish there was something I could do. They said, no, this is not where you can help. So he went out again apologetically. But when I think about the unclean spirits falling down before him, see, you could read that in a nice Elizabethan King James Version and it wouldn't mean anything to you, but 
when you really picture it happening vividly, you'll understand it's a little bit unusual. It slightly upsets the average run of the normal service, whether it be a synagogue or a church. In Mark chapter 9 and uh, verse 20, we find a further description of physical manifestations. This is the, what is normally called the epileptic boy whose father brought him to Jesus. And it says, they brought him, the boy, unto him, Jesus. And when he, the spirit, saw him, Jesus, straightway the spirit tear him, tore him. And he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming. In other words, he was writhing on the ground and froth was coming out of his mouth. And then it says in verse 26 and 27 of the same boy, when he was delivered, the spirit cried or shrieked and rent him or tore him sore and came out of him. And he was as one dead, insomuch that many said he is dead. This also I have seen happen several times where a person after deliverance looks exactly like a dead body. And a person walking in without knowing what had happened would certainly have said just what these people said, he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up and he arose. Now, we might turn on out of the ministry of Jesus into the ministry of the church in Acts chapter 8 for a moment, just to notice that these manifestations continued on in the ministry of the church. It says about the preaching of Philip in Samaria, verses 6 and 7 of Acts chapter 8, the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them. So there were many unclean spirits, and they came out shrieking, roaring, groaning, but making a very loud noise. Uh, brother Don Basham and I were in deliverance service once, not so very long ago, and there was another dear brother there, a Pentecostal brother, whom I very much love, but who wasn't familiar with this type of thing, and he rather disapproved of what went on when we were ministering deliverance. So later on, he said to us, now, where in the New Testament do you ever see a service like that? My good brother Don Basham said very quietly, well, Acts chapter 8, verse 7 is a pretty vivid description. And you know, afterwards, I didn't say it, but I wanted to say to this good brother, who was what I would call an Orthodox Pentecostal, where in the New Testament do you ever see anything remotely approaching the Sunday evening gospel service, which we all take for granted? And I'll challenge anybody to look through the New Testament and find anything even like it, because you can't do it. It isn't there. Much of what we consider normal and orthodox really has nothing in the New Testament to support it. And much that's supported by the New Testament appears to us abnormal and extraordinary because we're so far removed from New Testament patterns and New Testament standards. The fact is that when Jesus ministered deliverance to people with evil spirits, there were frequently violent, noisy, and I would say disturbing manifestations. And Jesus did not stop them. He didn't stop because of them. He didn't seek to maintain religious decorum and order. He was concerned with helping the people that needed help. I have been through a good deal of this in personal experience. <clears throat> there have been places where people were more concerned to keep the carpet clean than to get the evil spirits out of people. This is the kind of religious decorum which becomes an idol. Now we'll go on to point four. And we'll go back again to Mark chapter 1 just for our initial text. Mark 1, 25, 26. Jesus rebuked him, the evil spirit, saying, Hold thy peace. In the Greek, it's very strong. Be muzzled and come out of him. And interestingly enough, Jesus used exactly the same word to the wind and the waves on the sea. He said, be muzzled. Very, very strong word. If you were to use slightly slangy language, you say, shut up. It's very forceful. Be muzzled. Come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had taught him and cried with a loud voice, he came out of him. Notice Jesus only told the spirit to come out of the man. He didn't tell the spirit where to go. Many, many times, I can't think how many times, people have said to me, well, why don't you send them to the pit? Or why don't you send them to hell? And I've heard of some people, incredible though it may seem, who send the evil spirits up to Jesus to be purified in the fire of his love. As far as I'm concerned, that is just plain nonsense. But it sounds nice to some religious people. The truth of the matter is Jesus never consigned spirits to hell, to the pit, to the abyss, or any such place. He left them free to roam around 
And in the case of the Gadarene demoniac, he indicated that they were perfectly at liberty to enter into the bodies of the swine. Let's look at a few other examples. Um, Luke 8, we've already read the account in Mark, but let's look in Luke. It gives us a slightly clearer picture in this point. Luke 8, verses 31 through 33. And they besought him, this is the evil spirits in the Gadarene demoniac, that he would not command them to go out into the deep. Now the word in Greek is abyss. It's the same word that in Revelation 20 is translated the bottomless pit, which sounds so romantic, but it's actually the word abyss. They knew there was an abyss. They didn't want to go there, and Jesus didn't make them go there. There was an abyss. They didn't want to go there, and Jesus didn't make them go there. And there was an herd of many swine feeding on the mountain, and they besought him that he would allow them to enter into them, and he allowed them. And they went out of the man and entered into the swine. We know the rest of the story. Notice that he did not command them to go to the pit. Revelation 20, I think we understand the reason why. Revelation chapter 20, verses 2 and 3, speaks about a time when there comes down an angel from heaven having the key of the abyss, called in the King James Version, the bottomless pit, it says in verse 2, he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the abyss and shut him up. There was a time when Satan was to be confined to the abyss and he was to stay there a thousand years. That wasn't entirely the end of Satan. He had one more brief escapade before God finally dealt with him forever. Verse 10 is the end of Satan. It says, The devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Notice the word tormented. This is what the demons were afraid of when Jesus came. Art thou come hither to torment us before the time? You'll find that question is asked there in Matthew 8, 29. Let's turn to that scripture for a moment. Matthew 8, 29. This is part of the conversation between Jesus and the Gadarene or the two men from Gergesa. And uh, it's the spirits that are speaking, not the man. In verse 29, Behold, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? Art thou come hither to torment us before the time? They knew, and Jesus knew, there was a time in God's program when they would be cast in and would be tormented. But they knew that the time hadn't come, and Jesus didn't argue. You see, he was in submission to his Father's will and his Father's program. And it is not possible, I believe, for you and me to do better than Jesus did. As far as I'm concerned, he was perfect. His ministry can be multiplied in quantity, but it cannot be improved in quality. And if Jesus didn't cast them into the pit, I'm not even going to try. Mind you, there was a situation where I got angry with a particular stubborn demon that wouldn't come out of a woman, and I said, if you don't come out, I'm going to send you to hell. I don't think I premeditated or planned that, and I stuck to it. And I really cannot say that I know exactly what happened, but when that demon went out, the last thing it said was, oh, it's so dark, it's so dark, it's so dark, in a very gloomy, mournful voice. So I have a kind of idea that that time... I prevail, but that is certainly the exception. It is not the normal practice. We will go on to the fifth point, uh, and turning back again to Mark chapter 1, just for a starting point, we see that this first incident occurred when Jesus was teaching in the synagogue. And I've already read, but I'll read once again, Philip's version of Mark 1.39, so he continued preaching in their synagogues and expelling evil spirits, throughout the whole of Galilee. And I'll read there what I've put against the outline, point five. Jesus com combined the casting out of demons with his normal ministry of preaching and teaching in the public place of worship. This was nothing like the atmosphere of a psychiatrist's consulting room or couch. I would think at least 20 people have said to me at different times, Brother Prince, it's all right to cast out demons, but don't do it in public. And I'll tell you, there's a good deal of pressure along that particular line. Especially when this ministry first developed, very influential people who could open or close certain doors of ministry approached me along this line. And I said to myself, I'll think it over before I make a decision. And if I'm doing the wrong thing, I want to be teachable and I want to adjust. 
But this led me specifically to examine the ministry of Jesus, and the more I examined it, the more I saw that Jesus regularly did it in public. It was not like a psychiatrist taking people into a concealed or closed room, lying them down on a couch and listening to all their problems hour by hour. It was not that type of atmosphere. It was not that type of procedure. On another occasion in a certain place where I regularly ministered, I started a particular night, Friday night, for a deliverance service. And we saw many, many people delivered. But after a while it dried up. And I didn't have any liberty from God to go on with that. And when I sought the Lord about it, as I understood it, the Lord showed me that he did not want it put off in a corner as something that had to be done under cover. That it was part of the total ministry of the gospel and it was nothing to be ashamed of and that it should be done just as openly as healing or the baptism in the Holy Spirit or any other aspect of the full gospel ministry. And as far as I'm concerned, that is so clearly established in Scripture that I do not intend to depart from it. And if I have to choose between offending God or offending man, in the last resort, I'd rather offend man than have God on my side because I've discovered God is faithful. Let us look also at what Jesus said in Luke 13, 32. This was fairly near the close of his earthly ministry. And the Pharisees came to him and warned him, and they were hypocritical about their warning, get away because Herod's planning to kill you. And Jesus refused to yield to this motivation of fear, and he said unto them, Go ye and tell that fox, Herod, Behold, I cast out demons, and I do cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I shall be perfected. I have to go on doing what God sent me to do. What did God send me to do? Cast out demons, heal the sick, and I'm going to do it till my ministry ends. He began that way, he continued that way, and he ended that way. I was talking to the editor of a well-known Christian journal, which I will not mention by name, because he asked me to do an article on this subject about three years ago. And I had several meetings with him because he wanted to be sure that what I said was acceptable. And I was talking to him about the ministry of Jesus in this respect. And he's a very respected figure in the fundamentalist world. And I said, I suppose, actually, if you look at the account in the Gospels, Jesus must have spent at least a quarter of his time casting evil spirits out of people. And he said, that's an underestimate. And really, it is. Probably he did this more than any other single aspect of his ministry. Where did they all come from? Well, that's not exactly our business. But I'll tell you one thing, there are just as many in the world today as there were in the day of Jesus. They haven't diminished. And just as many people need deliverance today as needed it in the time of Jesus. All right, we're going to point six. Uh, turning to Luke 4, 40 and 41. Luke 4, verses 40 and 41. Now when the sun was setting, why was it when the sun was setting? Because it was the Sabbath. And until the sun set, they weren't allowed to carry people around. When the sun was setting, all they that had sick with divers diseases brought them unto him, and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And demons also came out of many, crying out and saying, Thou art Christ, the Son of God. Notice that he laid his hands on every one of them individually, and evil spirits came out of many of them. Many people will tell you that you should never lay hands on someone who has an evil spirit. I don't want to be in any way offend anybody, but that is simply a Pentecostal tradition. It's one of the things that have been passed down amongst Pentecostal people without ever being analyzed in the light of Scripture. And here we have a clear pattern, Jesus. He laid his hands on every one of them, and unclean spirits came out of many of them. Now this is a parallel passage to Matthew 8, 16, where it says he cast out the spirits with his word. Some people say, well, then he didn't lay his hands on them. But Luke 4 says he laid his hands on them as well as casting out the spirits with his word. Uh, we look also in Matthew 8, 14 and 15. Matthew 8, 14 and 15. When Jesus was coming to Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother laid and sick of a fever, and he touched her hand, and the fever left her. Notice, he touched her hand first, and then the fever left her. Now you look in the parallel passage describing the same incident in Luke 4, verses 38 and 39. It says, 
he arose out of the synagogue and entered into Simon's house, and Simon's wife's mother was taken with a great fever, they besought him for, and he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. Now I've heard many preachers say, you see, because it was an evil spirit, he rebuked it, but he didn't touch her. But if you look at Matthew's Gospel, you'll see that first he put his hand on her, then the fever left her. So, again, this is a careless reading of Scripture. And we could look also in Luke 13 for another clear example of this. Luke 13, verses 11 through 13. Behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bowed together and could in no wise lift up herself. Notice that she had a physical condition which we would call curvature of the spine. She could not straighten her spine out and the scripture says specifically it was due to an evil spirit of infirmity. And when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said unto her, Woman, thou art loosed from thine infirmity. And he laid his hands on her and immediately she was made straight. Notice that he ministered deliverance to her physically by laying hands on her and the scripture says she had an evil spirit. So this theory that you must never lay hands on people who have evil spirits is not supported by scripture. It is, in fact, a tradition. However, I want to emphasize that laying hands on generally is a thing that should only be done with great caution. 1 Timothy 5, 22 uh, we just look at those words for a moment. The Apostle Paul said, Lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be partaker of other men's sins. Now, this is primarily in reference to ordaining elders. But the principle applies for every purpose of laying on of hands. It is extremely dangerous to do it unless you do it with caution and you know what you're doing because you can become partaker of something evil that's in another person. I experienced that once when I was newly saved and baptized in the Holy Spirit, there was a, an American soldier in Cairo and I was in a prayer group with him and he was sobbing all the time. Every time he prayed, he sobbed. I felt so sorry for that man, I went over and laid my hands on him and you know what happened to me? Every time I prayed, I sobbed for about two weeks. And then I shook this thing off and got rid of it. But I realized later that uh, something that was in him had transferred itself to me because I'd laid hands on him rashly without knowing what I was doing. So I want to urge you, never lay hands rashly on anybody, and never let anybody lay hands rashly on you. That's the other side of the story. Many times people, not many times, but several times, people have said to me, Brother Prince, I would like to lay hands on you. And I say, well, I'm sorry, but I don't feel that that's the Lord's leading. Because it's a two-way business. These uh, emotional scenes in Pentecostal churches where people are seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and about half a dozen people lay hands on them until the person disappears below a sea of hands, in my opinion, is 101% unscriptural and very foolish. We'll go on to my, the seventh point, and this is very important. Uh, again, notice in Mark chapter 1 that the man was in the synagogue, the man who needed deliverance. He was under the ministry of Jesus. He was submitting to teaching when deliverance came to him. And I do not find that Jesus ever ran after anybody and sought to deliver them unless they would submit themselves to his ministry. The other clear example is in Mark 5, 6, a very clear example of this, this gathering demoniac who was naked, couldn't be bound with chains. When he saw Jesus, he did one thing about the only thing he could do. It says, when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him. He fell at his feet. He submitted himself to the authority of Jesus. The demons in him fought, but his will was to submit to Jesus. And normally speaking, there is no scriptural precedent and it is totally in vain to seek to minister deliverance to people who will not submit themselves to the ministry of the word and the authority of Jesus Christ. Now, there may be occasional exceptions, but on the whole, uh, the pattern is that the person needing deliverance must submit to the ministry of the word and to the authority of the person who is ministering deliverance to them. I have discovered, for instance, in my own experience, if people do not have confidence in me, I absolutely cannot help them. I may desire to help them, but if they have any kind of attitude of reserve or suspicion, or in many cases resentment, I'm unable to minister help to them. It's a comical thing how often when a person comes into a meeting needing deliverance, the demon in them will turn them in absolutely unreasonable resentment against the preacher. And I, <laughs> this has happened so many times. I tell people when I'm preaching, I say, now, there could be many reasons for you to resent me, and some of them might be very strong reasons. 
But if you feel an unreasoning resentment for me that's not based on anything I've said or done, then bear in mind that's the demon in you and he doesn't want you to come to me for help. And that's his way of keeping you from me. But those people have to resist that thing and come and submit themselves to my ministry or whoever it may be who's ministering deliverance. It is not scriptural to run after people trying to deliver them before they're willing to submit to the ministry that will bring deliverance to them. The eighth point. In the case of a child, let's look at this scripture for a moment. This is dramatic. Mark chapter 9, verses 22 and 23. The father of the epileptic boy has come to Jesus. Verse 21, Jesus said, How long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said of a child. That's significant because I've discovered that most serious cases of demon problems arise in childhood and sometimes it's necessary to find out when they started in order to bring healing and deliverance. But we don't go into the details here. The father said, Oft times it, the demon, hath cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Notice, if thou canst do anything. And notice the immediate answer of Jesus. If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. What was he asked to believe for? His own deliverance? No, the deliverance of his son. And here's a scriptural principle that we don't have time to establish in this study. Parents are obligated to have faith for their children. I can take you right through scripture and show you this from beginning to end of scripture. God said to Noah, thee have I found righteous before me. Come thou and all thy house. And right on through scripture. It's the privilege and it's the responsibility of parents not merely to educate their children, not merely to feed them and clothe them, not merely to train them in spiritual things, but the supreme responsibility is to exercise faith for them. And as far as I'm able to find in Scripture, Jesus never ministered to a child unless at least one parent exercised faith on behalf of that child. I've learnt this by my mistakes, because many times somebody will drag an unruly, rebellious kid forward and say, Brother Prince, this boy has a demon, pray for him. And I'd start to pray, and the results are negligible. And I don't do that now. I always say two things. Where's the parent? The parent isn't here. Is there anybody that accepts the responsibility of a parent for this child? Not just for five minutes in the deliverance service, but for life. And secondly, I've always found, and never yet have I found an exception, problem child, problem parent. People that come to me now, they get warned beforehand. But that's what I'm going to say. I have never yet found it wrong. Jesus knew what he was doing. If, for instance, a child has problems, let's say resentment, rebellion, hatred, the parents are not there, they're not involved, they're not concerned, even if you could get that child delivered, if it goes back to that atmosphere, the demons will be in it again within a week. See, there's a problem of relationships. God has made parents responsible for their children, and he does not go against his own principles. Look at the other case in Mark 7 there, 25 through 30. For a certain woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek or a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by nation. And she besought him that he would cast forth the devil out of her daughter. But Jesus said unto her, Let the children first be filled, for it is not meet to take the children's bread and cast it unto the dogs. In other words, lady, you're just a dog. You don't have any claims. And oh, what an answer. She said, answered and said unto him, Yea, Lord, yet the dogs under the table eat of the children's crumbs. Oh, what an answer. Oh, how I respect that woman. It's true, Lord, I'm just a dog, but I don't need a loaf. All I need is a crumb. A crumb will get the demon out of my daughter. And he said unto her, For this saying, go thy way. The devil is gone out of thy daughter. And when she was come to her house, she found the devil gone out, and her daughter laid upon the bed. See, one parent can exercise faith, but without the faith of one parent, you will not find anywhere in the Gospels Jesus ministered to a child. It isn't scriptural. It doesn't work. God knows what he's doing. The ninth part, point in your outline, Matthew 8, 16, Mark 1, 39. We don't really need to look at these scriptures, all of them, but notice Matthew 8, 16 for a moment. When the even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with demons. Why when the even was come? Because it was the Sabbath, and they were religious Orthodox Jews. They were not allowed to go any distance, nor carry any burdens on the Sabbath. So they waited till the sun set, the Sabbath was finished, they came to him. Mark 1.39, it says he preached in all their synagogues. The majority of the people to whom Jesus ministered were what we would call Orthodox religious Jews. And as Orthodox Jews, by the law of Moses, they were forbidden ever to practice idolatry, 
or to practice any form of magic or sorcery or witchcraft. Now, I have heard preachers say, oh, sure, you get evil spirits amongst the heathen where they practice witchcraft and where they worship idols. But, of course, in a civilized country, and it always happens to be a civilized country where the preacher is, whether it's America or Denmark or England, it's a funny thing. The people in England can easily believe they're demons in, in America. They have no problem about that. Believe me, they wouldn't, they, that wouldn't surprise them. But demons in England, that's another matter. And the people in Denmark can believe in demons in England, but not in Denmark, see? Because in Denmark, they're so civilized. But I want to point out to you that these people were forbidden on pain of death ever to practice idolatry or witchcraft. Furthermore, they were not criminals. They were not lunatics. They could walk the streets of Galilee. They could till their farms. They could fish the seas. They could keep their stores. They could maintain a more or less normal existence. And yet G Jesus cast demons out of them by the thousands. See what a false picture we have, that if a person needs deliverance from evil spirits, he must be either a criminal or a lunatic or way off or an idol worshipper, or a person that's practiced the worship of Satan, or something like that. This is not true. Admittedly, those people will invariably need deliverance. But there are millions and millions and millions of apparently normal, decent, respectable people who need deliverance from evil spirits, just as there were in the days of Jesus, so there are today. Estimating how many people need deliverance is a dangerous thing. But I would say within the professing Christian church, at least as many people need deliverance from evil spirits as need healing from sickness. And that's about 80%. If you go to the average congregation and check how many people are whole from the crown of their head to the sole of their feet, if you find 20%, it's an unusually healthy congregation. And in my personal judgment, at least as many people in the same congregation need deliverance from evil spirits as need physical healing from sickness, if anything, more. That's my personal estimate based on experience. But I had something that rather bolstered my opinion and my estimates, because I've been going around saying for some months, in my opinion, about 80% of people <coughs> have legs of unequal length. And the other day, a brother sent me a cutting from the United Press which says in Britain, the doctors estimate 77% of people have legs of unequal length. So I'm only 3% out in my estimate. And I don't believe I'm any more out in my estimate of how many people need deliverance from evil spirits. You see, the thing is, this whole business has been shrouded in darkness, fear, and superstition. So that if you even start to talk about demons, people back off and say, oh, don't want to listen to that. And if there ever was a lady that was delivered from a demon, all the rest of the people, oh, you see that woman? Brother Prince cast three demons out of her. Stand clear because she might be dangerous. It might be catching. Now, this is totally foolish attitude about this whole thing. Now, let's go on to the next point, which is point 10. And again, we look at the incident of the Gadarene demoniac in Mark 5, verses 18 through 20. Uh, incidentally, uh, it's, we could read verse 17. It says about the people in that area, they began to pray him to depart out of their coasts. Have you ever noticed that? He'd made one poor maniac completely whole, and they said, please go off, don't want you here. Why did they do that? Were they afraid because they'd lost 2,000 swan? I don't believe it. Some people say, well, they lost all their pigs. I don't believe that was it. You know what? It was just too remote from their normal way of living. They couldn't stand being brought face to face with this reality. They said, no matter whether it's true or false, we just don't want to look into it. Please, do it somewhere else. And it says in verse 18, when he was coming to the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. However, Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, Go home to thy friends, and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee, and hath had compassion on thee. And he departed, and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him, and all men did marvel. Notice that there was nothing to be hushed up about the fact that this man had been delivered from these demons. Jesus said, Go and tell everybody. Make sure all your friends get to know. Now, when he healed the leper, he sometimes said, don't go and tell anybody. Again, what I'm fighting is this attitude that demons are something to be ashamed of. I have seen scores and scores of people physically manifested, delivered from demons that would be afraid to go and tell their religious friends they ever had an evil spirit, even after deliverance. Now, I also tell you it's very dangerous. I actually know of cases of people who were delivered, set free, and then were ashamed to say that they needed deliverance. And you know what happened? They were back where they started. 
serve them right. Because if you say, I didn't need deliverance, then God says, all right, I'll put you back where you were before. If you didn't need it, you haven't got it. And God is perfectly entitled to do that. The truth of the matter is that we need to bring this thing right out into the open. Tell it the way it is, show it out of scripture, and dissipate the superstition, the fear, the ignorance, the social stigma that are associated with it. And God is busy doing it. And I'll tell you people, most of you are in the upper age bracket. If our generation won't do it, the next generation will. That's one thing I'll tell you, because the young people of the world are sick of religious respectability. Their motto is, tell it the way it is. And that's a challenge to a preacher. Praise the Lord. Let's look in Luke 8, 1 through 3. Luke 8, 1 through 3. And it came to pass afterward that he, Jesus, went throughout every city and village, preaching and showing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God, and the twelve were with him. And certain women which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom went seven demons, Joanna the wife of Chusa, Herod, Stuart, Susanna, and many others, which ministered unto him of their substance. Have you ever asked yourself who supported Jesus? People assume somehow that money came. But you know where it came from? Partly from the people, the women that had been delivered of evil spirits. And they were not ashamed of it. You can look in, in, at your leisure. We will not turn there. Mark 16, 9, the first witness of his resurrection was Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons. That was her testimony. That was the way she was known throughout the church. Finally, let me point this out, and the scriptures are given. I don't know whether we have time to look at them. Jesus never sent anybody out to preach the gospel without commissioning them to cast out demons. Matthew 10, 1, he called unto them the twelve, gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out, heal all manner of sickness, all manner of disease. Verse 8, he said, as ye go, preach. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. That's your business. Luke 10, 17, he sent 70 out later on with the same message. They returned and their first comment was, Lord, even the demons have to obey us through your name. Mark 3, 14 and 15, he called unto him twelve that they should be with him and that they should cast out evil spirits. The first thing on the list for them to learn. Mark 6, verses 12 and 13, he sent out the twelve, and it says they anointed many sick with oil and cast out many devils. And in Mark 16, 15 through 18, he gave them their final commission. Go ye into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. These signs shall follow them that believe. Sign number one, in my name they shall cast out demons. It is not scriptural, according to the New Testament pattern, to go out and preach the gospel unless you're willing to face demons and in the name of Jesus to drive them out. Study in this series, we dealt with the ministry of Jesus and how Jesus handled evil spirits or demons. In this study, we're going to deal with the nature and the activity of demons in general. But before we do this, it's important to clear up some questions of terminology. In this, as in various other respects, the influence of the King James Version on English-speaking people has been tremendous, and many people are influenced by it without realizing exactly how far it affects their thinking. So I'm going to take a little while to explain some of the basic Greek words that are used in the New Testament and to clear up some misconceptions that arise out of translations that we're familiar with. First of all, let's consider the word devil. This is a transliteration, really, of the Greek word diabolos, which is there in your outline. And the literal meaning of the word diabolos is slanderer. And used in the singular, it is normally a title of Satan himself and should not be used of any other person but Satan. The other word that we're going to deal with mainly in this study is the word demon, which does not occur in the King James Version. I'll show you in a moment why. The English word demon is derived directly from a Greek word daimon, or an alternative form of the same word, which is daimonion. You might imagine that daimonion is a diminutive of demon, but that is not correct. Actually, it's a neuter adjective, and the two words really mean essentially the same thing 
And as I say, the English word is demon. Now a demon is a spirit regarded by the heathen as divine or semi-divine. And heathen religion normally cultivates or seeks to propitiate these demons. All heathen religions really center around the cultivation of demons. Now this word is wrongly translated in the King James Version, devil, or more commonly, devils, in the plural. It should not be translated devil. That word should be reserved for diabolos, the title of Satan. This word demon, daimon, daimonion, is used in New Testament Greek interchangeably with two other expressions which are evil spirit or unclean spirit. So we have really three expressions which apparently in the New Testament are used interchangeably. Demon, translated in the King James Version devil, evil spirit, or unclean spirit. Just to show you that these phrases are interchangeable, look with me at the scriptures given there in your outline. Uh, we are looking in various cases at parallel accounts of the same incident. In Matthew 15, 22, we are told about this Canaanitish woman who came to Jesus because her daughter needed deliverance from an evil spirit. And she is recorded as saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with a devil, but more correctly, a demon. Now in Mark 7:25, the writer of Mark's gospel says about the same woman in the same incident, for a certain woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell at his feet. So where Matthew says demon, Mark says unclean spirit, and they're referring to the same thing. Then in Mark chapter 5 and verse 2, the well-known incident which is usually described called the incident of the Gadarene demoniac. It says that when Jesus was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. Now this incident is also recorded in Luke chapter 8 and in verse 27 of Luke chapter 8, Luke says, And when he went forth to land, there met him out of the city a certain man which had devils long time, devils being more literally demons. So where Mark says an unclean spirit, Luke says demons. These are used interchangeably. Another passage that illustrates the same truth is found in the book of Revelation in the 16th chapter. The 16th chapter of Revelation, verses 13 and 14. John says, I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet for they are the spirit of devils working miracles. Devils, but more correctly, demons. So in verse 13 he calls them unclean spirits and in verse 14 he calls them demons. I think therefore it is quite correct to say that these three expressions are used interchangeably in New Testament Greek unclean spirit, evil spirit, and demon. Now let's consider the Greek phrases used to describe the activity of these demons or unclean spirits in relationship to human beings. Now here is where the greatest misunderstanding arises out of the King James Version. There are actually three alternative phrases used in New Testament Greek to describe the fact that a person is in some way troubled or tormented by an evil spirit or a demon. The first phrase, which is very common, is to have an unclean spirit or an evil spirit. We'll look at the various passages given in your outline where this is found. We'll glance at them quickly, not pausing to dwell on any of them. Matthew 11, verse 18, Jesus says, John that's John the Baptist, came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, he hath a devil, he hath a demon. So John the Baptist was accused of having a demon by the people of his day. 
And then in Mark 7:25, we've already just looked at that, but we can look at it again for a moment. This is about the Syrophoenician woman. Mark 7, 25. A certain woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit. And then in Mark 9, 17... The man said to Jesus, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. That's a particular type of unclean or evil spirit, a dumb spirit. One that refuses to allow a person to speak. But the boy is said to have a dumb spirit. Then we turn to Luke's Gospel, the fourth chapter, and verse 33. It says, in the synagogue there was a man which had a spirit of an unclean devil, an unclean demon. There again we see in that verse that an unclean spirit and a demon are used interchangeably or together. This man is said to have had a spirit of an unclean demon. And in Luke chapter 8 and verse 27, a passage we've looked at already, there was a man who had devils or demons a long time. And in Luke 13, verse 11, we read, Behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bound together and could in no wise lift up herself. This woman had a spirit of infirmity, physical weakness, which prevented her from straightening her spine, what we would call, I suppose, spinal curvature. But in the New Testament, it's attributed to a spirit of infirmity which this woman had. Then in John's Gospel, there are quite a number of passages where this phrase, to have a demon or an unclean spirit, is used. John chapter 7, verse 20. The people answered and said unto him, that's Jesus, thou hast a devil, thou hast a demon. They accused him of having a demon. And in John chapter 8, the phrase occurs several times. Verse 48, the Jews said to Jesus, Say we not well that thou art a Samaritan and hast a demon? Jesus answered, I have not a demon. And in verse 52 of the same chapter, Then said the Jews unto him, Now we know that thou hast a demon. And in John chapter 10, verses 20 and 21, Many of them said, He hath a demon and is mad. Notice, being mad is more or less equated with having a demon. Others said, these are not the words of him that hath a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? So we see that this phrase, to have a demon, is very commonly used in the New Testament. The second phrase, which is closely parallel, is to be in an unclean or an evil spirit. Now this hardly makes sense in English. And in the King James Version, the preposition in is translated with. But actually the literal Greek is in. Let's look at two passages in Mark's Gospel where this occurs. Mark chapter 1 and verse 23. There was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, but the Greek says in an unclean spirit. And he cried out saying, let us alone, and so on. And in Mark 5, 2, it says, when he came out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. But the Greek says in an unclean spirit. Uh, I would say that the closest modern English would be to be under the influence of an unclean spirit. In other words, this man was not always under the influence of this spirit, but at times this spirit manifested itself through him, and then that is expressed in New Testament Greek by saying he was in an unclean spirit. In the Old Testament, it's said of the false prophets that they prophesied in Baal. In other words, they prophesied in the spirit of Baal and not in the spirit of God. The third phrase, which is also extremely common and is the important one because it's been so completely mistranslated in the King James Version, is a verb in Greek, daimonizomai, which could very well be rendered in English to be demonized. It's as close a rendering as you could possibly get. And in the English, it has precisely the same connotation as it does in Greek. It means in some way or another to be under the influence or attack of a demon. It doesn't say more than that, just to be demonized. 
Unfortunately, for the sake of English-speaking Christians around the world and through the ages, the King James Version has translated this phrase to be demonized by the English phrase to be possessed with devils. And this has given rise to more understanding than any other single phrase I imagine in the King James Version because the word possess is completely misleading and has nothing in the Greek to support it. Immediately you use the word possess, you bring to the minds of English-speaking people the suggestion of total ownership. If I possess my Bible, every page in the Bible belongs to me, not some of them. And so whenever you speak about having an evil spirit, a person reacts in an angry way and says, you mean I'm possessed by the devil? And they've got that from the King James. The King James, the, the Greek doesn't say that. The Greek says a person is demonized in some way or another, which is not further specified by that one word, under the influence or the control or the attack of a demon. Now, there's no suggestion that the demon possesses the person in the sense of having totally taken him over. Let's look at some of the passages in the New Testament where this verb, to be demonized, is used. Starting in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 24. It says, His fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with divers diseases and torments, and those which were possessed with devils, those which were being demonized and those which were lunatic, and those that had the palsy, the paralysis, and he healed them. Various different categories of people who were brought to Jesus, those who were sick, those who were tormented, those who were paralyzed, those who were lunatic, and those who were being demonized, attacked, or affected in some way by demons. In Matthew chapter 8, the word occurs three times. Verse 16 says, When the even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils, many that were being demonized. Verse 28, when he was come to the country of the Gergesenes, there met him two possessed with devils. But the Greek says, two who were being demonized. And verse 33 of the same chapter, they that fled, they that kept them fled and went their ways into the city and told everything and what was befallen to the possessed of the devils, to the people who had been demonized. In uh, Matthew 9, 32, it says, as they went out, behold, they brought to him a dumb man possessed with a devil, a devil, a dumb man who was being demonized. And the evidence that he was being demonized was his dumbness. The only way in which the demon affected him was by making him dumb. The moment the demon went out, the man was no longer dumb. It would be completely incorrect to suggest that this man was possessed in the sense of totally taken over. One area of his personality only was affected, and that was the speech centers. And then in Matthew 12, 22, we have a similar case. There was brought unto him one possessed with the devil, one who was being demonized, blind and dumb. And he healed him, insomuch that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. In this instance, the demon is responsible for the blindness and the dumbness. That's all, the only areas of the man that he controlled were those that affected his sight and his speech. And when that demon went out, the man could see and speak. To use the word possessed there is completely incorrect. And then in Matthew 15, 22, we've looked at this twice already. This is the daughter of the Syrophoenician woman. And she said, my daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. The same word is used in Greek, though the King James uses the word vexed instead of possessed there. But the, the Greek word is demonized. Then in Mark chapter 1, verse 32, it says that even when the sun did set, they brought unto him all that were diseased, and them that were possessed with devils, them that were being demonized. And Mark 5, 15, 16, and 18, in the account of the Gadarene demoniac, we have the phrase used three times. I don't believe it's really necessary to read them out because it's just a repetition of what we've seen before. And then in Luke 8.36, which also refers to the Gadarene demoniac, we have the same phrase. They also which saw it told them by what means he that was possessed of the devils was healed. He that had been demonized was healed. And incidentally, the Greek word used for healing there is the Greek word for salvation. He was saved. This is part of salvation, is deliverance from evil spirits. So here we see these facts then 
First of all, that there are probably three different expressions used to describe these persons or entities, demons, unclean spirits, evil spirits. And sometimes they're specified more precisely, for instance, a spirit of infirmity or a dumb spirit. The second phrase that's used is an unclean spirit, and the third phrase that's used is an evil spirit. And the language that's used in connection with these is to have an unclean spirit or to be in an unclean spirit, that is, under the influence of an unclean spirit, or to be demonized, to be in some way affected by a demon. Now, having cleared up, I trust, though I'm not absolutely sure, some of the misunderstandings created by the King James Version, let's go on to consider the nature and activity of demons. What I have to say now, I believe to be true. Part of it is directly supported by Scripture. Part of it comes by inference. And I want you to be very clear that if you do not agree with my inferences, that's all right. But I have given a good deal of time and thought to this and studied the Scriptures fairly carefully. And I am fairly well convinced that what I say is correct. Demons are spirits without bodies. You could say, if you want to, disembodied spirits, but that would carry the implication that they once had bodies. Now, I believe they did once have bodies, but that is an assumption or an inference which would have to be dealt with separately. We need to distinguish between angels and demons. As far as I understand it, they're completely distinct, and I would like to give you three points in which we can distinguish them. First of all, angels have wings, and they fly. Look in Daniel 9, verse 21. Daniel had a visitation from an angel, the angel Gabriel. And he's incidentally also called a man. And it says there in Daniel 9, 21, Yea, whilst I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. Uh, the Bible pictures most of the heavenly beings as having wings. Angels, cherubim, and seraphim are all pictured as having wings and being able to fly. And there are various references in Scripture to their flying. Now, turn to Matthew chapter 12, and you'll see that evil spirits apparently do not fly. And I believe this is correct. Matthew 12:43. Jesus says, when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest. There's no suggestion whatever that he has any other means of transportation but walking. Secondly, they have different places of habitation. Angels are at home. They normally inhabit the heavenlies. There's many scriptures to this effect. We look at just three. Ephesians chapter 6. And verse 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spirits of wickedness in the heavenlies, where I understand this to refer to Satan's angelic kingdom in the heavenlies. And all the persons there referred to are angelic. In um, Jude, the sixth verse, and in case anybody has difficulty in locating Jude, it's just the last one before Revelation. Jude 6, the writer says, The angels which kept not their first estate or their first area of rule, but left their own habitation, God hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness. These angels that left the heavenly and descended to earth, and I believe scriptures elsewhere make it plain that they came in order to cohabit with human women, are the exception. And because of this act, which was so contrary to God's ordained plan of being, they were confined in a special place, different from all others. But it's, you notice that they left their own habitation, their own appointed dwelling place, which was in the heavenlies. And then in Revelation 12, verses 7 and 8, a passage that describes events still future, as I believe. 
It says, there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, that's the devil, and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. Up till that point, their place is in heaven. What happens after that is entirely contrary to the normal plan of God. It's a very brief span of time which uh, Revelation speaks about when the devil is cast out of the heavenlies and is compelled to take up residence on earth. But this is not the normal. This is the abnormal. Demons, on the other hand, as I understand it, are earthbound. They have no ability to get outside the realm of earth. Thirdly, angels have bodies of their own and do not normally desire to occupy another body. In fact, for an angel, as I understand it, to be inside a human body would be a kind of prison. On the other hand, demons, if they have one conspicuous characteristic, it is this, that they have an intense craving to enter in and dwell in a body, preferably that of a human being, but in the last resort, rather that of a pig than to be without a body to dwell in. By way of confirmation for this, let's look for a moment in Matthew chapter 12, verses 43 through 45. Jesus is speaking, and he says, When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest, and findeth none. Then he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out. By the phrase, my house, he means the body of the person that he was living in. So we see that he cannot find rest outside of a body. He wanders around until he's able to enter into a body. If possible, he'll go back to the body that he left. If not, he must look for another body. And he regards the body that he dwells in as his house, his dwelling place. The first time I ever had a real dramatic confrontation with a woman in the matter of deliverance, the first evil spirit that I commanded to come out, which was the spirit of hatred, it answered me in a very rebellious and surly voice and said, I'm not coming out. This is my house. I've lived here 35 years and I'm not coming out. So that Jesus is not using figurative speech at all when he says that the evil spirit says, I will return into my house. In Mark chapter 5, the incident of the Gadarene demoniac, we see also this intense desire on the part of the evil spirits not to be left without a body. They are pleading with Jesus, and it says in Mark 5 verse 10, He, the man in whom the evil spirits were, besought him, Jesus, much, that he would not send them away out of the country. This is a remarkable revelation, really. Now there was there nigh unto the mountains a great herd of swine feeding, and all the demons besought Jesus, saying, Send us into the swine that we may enter into them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave. They could not bear the thought of being without some sort of a body to dwell in. As I say, preferably they would choose the body of a human being. But rather than be without a body, they would choose a pig or a dog or a monkey or a lion. I believe there are many animals which from time to time are occupied by evil spirits. <clears throat> the reason why they desire to be in a body is that they all have characteristic lusts or evil desires or evil propensities which can only be gratified while they are in a body. For instance, an alcohol demon has to have a body through which to consume alcohol. A blaspheming demon must have a tongue through which to blaspheme. A demon of lust must have the emotions and the organs of a body through which to lust. They cannot fulfill their cravings and desires unless they have a body through which to do it. And as Jesus indicated, they're like people without a home, restless, unable to settle down without... Uh, any kind of peace until they find a body to enter into. This brings us face to face with the fact that every one of us is surrounded by unseen hordes of evil spirits who would dearly like to be inside each one of us. We cannot change that situation. 
The only thing we can do is make very sure they don't get in. But this is part of the total Christian conflict that we're involved in and the main situation cannot be changed. Jesus, as I've pointed out in my previous study, but I'll say it again, did not cast evil spirits into the pit or into hell. He just caused them to leave the body that they were occupying with the implication that they would be free to enter the next body that they could get into. And as it was then, so it is now. The next important thing about demons is that they have all the marks of personality. They are persons. And in most cases, you will not deal effectively with evil spirits until you realize that you're dealing with persons. My particular problem that tormented me for years was the problem of depression. And I tried every means I could think of to deal with it as a thing, a psychological attitude, a mental condition, whatever you like to call it. And I got nowhere. One day, reading the scripture and looking at Isaiah 61, 3, I met this phrase, the spirit of heaviness. And at that moment, by a flash of revelation, I saw that my problem was not a mental attitude, not a psychological condition, not a fixation or whatever language you like to use. It was a person that was deliberately tormenting me. And when I realized I was dealing with a person, I was about 80% of the way to victory immediately. Up to that time, in dealing with this enemy, I was, as Paul says, like one beating the air. I was like a boxer blindfolded, trying to strike an enemy who could see me and always could avoid my blows, because I did not know what I was dealing with. And you'll find all through the ministry of Jesus, he invariably treated demons as persons. He spoke to them, and he spoke about them in the category of persons. Let's look at this for a moment and substantiate it out of Scripture. There are various recognized marks or attributes of personality. As far as I know, demons possess every one. The first one is will. And we have already seen in Matthew 12, verses 43 and following, that a demon has a strong will unclean spirit that had gone out of the man said, I will go back into my house from whence I came out. He made a definite decision and carried it out. And likewise, in Mark chapter 5, verses 11 through 13, we find that the evil spirits in the Gadarene demoniac had a very intense desire not to go out of that particular area of the country and to be allowed to go into the swine. So they exercised a very strong will. The pressure of their will was brought to bear upon Jesus. And this is true. They have willpower. Secondly, they have emotion, and very strong emotion too. This is very vividly illustrated in James chapter 2 and verse 19. James chapter 2 verse 19. James is speaking about the fact that it's useless to have faith without works. And he applies this by illustration to evil spirits. He says, Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The demons also believe and tremble. And trembling is the manifestation of very intense emotion. And this I have seen and experienced many, many times, that demons still tremble. When they're brought out into the open and confronted with the name and the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, you will frequently see people start to tremble violently. It's not the person that's trembling. It's the evil spirit in the person that's trembling. And it always does me good to see them tremble at the name of Jesus. We had a meeting in this very room about two weeks ago on a Thursday morning. And the Spirit of God moved into this room, and one after another, the people in various parts of the room started to tremble and shake violently. No one was preaching at them, and I could hardly move around the room quick enough to get to the people. You see, the demons had been stirred up by the message which I had preached was on the power of the blood of Jesus, and they could no longer remain dormant. I've heard my brother in the Lord, Don Basham, say that it's somewhat like going off to birds with dogs. When the bird dog gets 
to a certain degree of proximity, the birds get scared and rise up and fly out and reveal their presence. And that's the time you get a chance to shoot them. And this is really true. I've been in various meetings where the demons have started to fly up, as it were, almost in a covey and just manifest themselves wholesale because they get so scared, see? They're scared by the word of God and the authority of the name of Jesus and the fact that their identity is being laid bare. As a matter of fact, it's happened on several occasions that when I've started to cast a spirit out of one person and named the spirit, every other person who had that spirit in the room started to be delivered at the same time. I was uh, in some meetings in Greensburg in Pennsylvania and a woman said, I believe I have a spirit of criticism. And I said, you spirit of criticism come out of this woman. About four people started to cough all around. So that shows you what the problem with the church is. <laughs> so here we have this second evidence of personality. They have emotion. Thirdly, they have knowledge. They know a lot. In fact, they know a lot more than some Christians. In Mark chapter 1, you find this illustrated in the incident of the um, man in the synagogue in Capernaum. Mark 1, 23 and 24, there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, in an unclean spirit, and he cried out saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art the Holy One of God. That man had probably never seen Jesus before. Not one of his disciples had yet recognized his identity. Not one of the human beings of his own generation knew who he was, but the evil spirit in that man knew immediately he was the Holy One of God. The same is also illustrated in Acts 19, which is a real lively incident I'd like to read to you. Acts 19 uh, and I think we start at verse 13, yes. Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preached. As I pointed out in my previous study, the Jewish people practiced exorcism in the time of Jesus. They recognized evil spirits and tried to deal with them in various different ways, as many of the heathen do, the Muslims do today, for instance. So having found out that Paul got remarkable results by using the name of Jesus, these unconverted Jews decided they'd use the name of Jesus too. And so they spoke to this man who had an evil spirit, and they say, we adjure you by Jesus, whom Paul preaches. And it says, verse 14, there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew, and chief of the priests, which did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are ye? And they must have had, I suppose, the shock of their lives. <laughs> Furthermore, the language isn't, isn't uh, accurately represented in the King James Version because two different words for no are used. Jesus I acknowledge, and Paul I know about. I've heard about this man Paul. He's creating a lot of problems for us. That's what he was saying in effect. Jesus I acknowledge. I know who he is, the Holy One of God. Paul I know about. We've heard enough about him. He's creating trouble for us in this whole area of Ephesus. But you see that they, they knew a lot. And there are other instances. For instance, we don't need to look there, but in the 16th chapter of Acts, the damsel with the spirit of divination knew that Paul and Silas were the preachers of the gospel, the servants of the Most High God, long before the people of Philippi realized who they were. Then again, demons have self-awareness. They're aware of themselves. Just take one example here in Mark 5, verse 9. Again, this is the incident of the Gadarene demoniac. Jesus asked him, what is thy name? He spoke to the spirit and said, What is thy name? And he, the spirit, answered saying, My name is Legion, which is a group of about 6,000 soldiers, for we are many. So not only did he know himself, but he knew of the other spirits that were present there, and they knew their approximate number and so on, which is what I would call evidence of self-awareness. Then again, demons have a conscience which is another mark of personality. This is stated in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. We'll read verse 1 to get the context. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Now the Spirit, that is the Holy Spirit, speaketh expressly that in the latter times, towards the close of this age, some believers shall depart from the faith, the Christian faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. 
The second verse says, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Now the Greek is absolutely definitive. Those phrases do not apply to the people who depart from the faith, but to the demons that deceive them. It's the demons that speak lies in hypocrisy. It's the demons that have their consciences seared with a hot iron. So a demon has a conscience, but it has been so seared that it is useless to appeal to it. It will never respond to the dictates of its conscience. Finally, as has already been indicated, demons have the ability to speak. Uh, we do not need to turn to the references given there in your outline, but it refers to the incident of the man in the synagogue who spoke out and challenged Jesus to the Gadarene demoniac, where Jesus carried on some kind of a conversation with the spirits in that man, and to the case in Ephesus in Acts 19, where the spirit spoke out of the man and said, Jesus I acknowledge and Paul I know about, but who are ye? So to sum it up, we would say this, that the scripture indicates that evil spirits have the following attributes of personality. Will, emotion, knowledge, self-awareness, conscience, and the ability to speak. And that, without a question, compels us to classify them as persons. They are persons without bodies. Now let's look in Matthew 12 just for a moment and observe one fact there. Matthew chapter 12 verses 24 through 28. Jesus has just delivered a man of an evil spirit the man had been blind and dumb. After deliverance, he was able both to speak and to see. And verse 23, all the people were amazed and said, Is not this the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doth not cast out demons, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the demons. And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself, how shall then his kingdom stand? And if I, by Beelzebub, cast out demons, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. Both the Pharisees and Jesus give to Satan the title Beelzebub in special relationship to demons. Now Beelzebub means literally Lord of Flies. There is a modern novel with that title. I imagine many people who read it don't realize that it's a translation of the word Beelzebub. And this is particularly Satan's title as the ruler over demons, because the demons are compared by analogy to the insect world, which is a very a vivid and accurate analogy in many ways, because there are myriads, uncountable myriads of demons, and they harass, they defile, they even bring death, and yet often we're not aware of their presence or activity, or even when we're aware that something is wrong, we're not aware of what produces it. For instance, to take the example of malaria, it's produced by the female of the species Anopheles, the mosquito, and for many, many generations, Africans suffered from malaria, attributing it to all sorts of things like bad water and so on, quite unaware of the real cause. And as a matter of fact, you can have an Anopheles mosquito in your room, and it can bite you, sting you, and create the uh, infection of malaria. You'd never be aware that anything had happened. And this is uh, typical of the activity of demons. They act, in a certain sense, under cover. Often we don't realize that they're there, and even when we see something wrong, we don't know the real cause of it. And so, in Bible language, Satan is lord of the flies, he's lord of the insect world, as the ruler over the demons. He rules over two kingdoms. In the heavenlies, he rules over fallen angels. And on earth, he rules over evil spirits. But this is particularly his title as the ruler over the evil spirits. Now let's consider some of the main activities of demons. And I've suggested that you can sum them up conveniently by taking certain fairly common verbs in the English language and considering these verbs. I have listed a number of verbs there. The first one is to entice. 
This is one of the activities of evil spirits. They entice human beings to do wrong. They make evil appear attractive. They set a bait for human souls. This is referred to in James chapter 1, verse 14, speaking about the mechanism of temptation. James 1, 14, Every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Notice there are two factors in temptation. There's something in the man that's perverted. A perverted evil desire, which is called lust. But there's something from without that plays upon this thing within. Because enticing is always used of an agent who operates to ensnare a creature. So the evil spirit from without presents to the lust within something to entice that person into sin. This is one of the common activities of demons. It's enticement. And I suppose few of us have not experienced this in a kind of verbal form in our minds. At least, I'll be honest with you, many, many times I've heard phrases in my mind, go on, why shouldn't you do it? There's no harm in it. Uh, whatever it might be. And uh, I've also been aware many, many times that my eyes are almost being compelled to turn in a certain direction, and I know even in advance that if I turn my eyes in that direction, I'll see something that will appeal to the unclean and defiling elements inside me. This is the process of temptation. If there were no lust in me, the demon would have nothing to play upon. But the lust wouldn't be stirred up if it weren't for the demon playing upon it. So there's the combination of the, the lust inside me, or you, and the agent outside that puts this in front, like putting the little morsel of cheese in the mouse trap to get the mouse in there. And we have to realize that we are dealing with an agent that's intelligent, that studies us, that knows our weakness, that knows what kind of cheese we like best, that knows the very best way to get us into the trap. And the kind of enticement that Satan might use for me might not work for you. And I will tell you that I never really go to preach a message that's going to do the devil any damage without having my mind assailed before I preach on all sorts of irrelevances or impurities or distractions, some kind to get me off to hinder my ability to present the truth. And I know from experience that the devil knows just exactly the best ways to reach Brother Prince. They might not work with you, but he's used them so often with me that he knows pretty well how to get me. But praise the Lord, I've also learned pretty well how not to let him get me. That's the other side to it. I don't say I'm 100% victorious, but he finds it much harder than he did 15 years ago, believe me. A second main activity of evil spirits is to deceive. In 1 Timothy 4, 1, we've already seen this, but it's good to look at it again. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, Now the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, speaketh expressly that in the latter times, the close of the age, some believers shall depart from the Christian faith. These are not unbelievers, these are believers. Giving heed to seducing or deceiving spirits, and to the doctrines of demons. How do these demons seduce people from their loyalty to Jesus Christ and to the truth of the gospel? By erroneous doctrines which they put before these people. I dealt with a young man once, years back, who was gloriously saved through street meetings that we held in London. And he was a, he was a model convert. I remember he got saved on Sunday night, got the baptism of the Spirit on Tuesday night, and was prophesying by, th prophesying by Thursday night. And in those days, it didn't happen that fast. Today, we're quite familiar with this type of thing. And yet, after a while, that young man went off. And he began to tell me that there was a voice speaking to him and insinuating certain teachings into his mind. And these teachings were precisely the teachings of Christian science. And yet I questioned him, and he said he'd never read Christian science and never had any contact with it. So there was this Christian science demon perched on his shoulder, 
insinuating these doctrines into his mind. And this tactic of the enemy worked. He got off. He never really became an, an effective, stable, victorious Christian. And I could hardly believe it because I was so ignorant in those days of the operations of demons. I could hardly believe that this Christian science demon could come straight to him, not through a book or through a sermon, and just begin to insinuate these deceptive doctrines into his mind. Of course, normally they'll operate through a book or through a sermon of false teaching or something like that. Another obvious result of demon activity is enslavement. Let's look in Romans 8, 15. Paul is speaking to Christians, baptized in the Holy Spirit, and he says, Ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. The spirit of bondage, bondage means enslavement. He's warning them, don't let the devil get you back into slavery. And the suggestion is very clear that the form of slavery they would be enticed back into would be that of religious slavery, subservience to the law when they'd been delivered from the law. And as a matter of fact, practically the whole of Galatians deals with this very issue of not being enslaved by religious legalism after you've once been set free by the gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit. And as a matter of fact, Paul deals with that as a much more severe and dangerous situation than he does with sexual sin like fornication or adultery. It's quite remarkable that the epistle to the Galatians is the only one that Paul doesn't begin by thanking God for the people he's writing to. He's got so upset by what they're doing that he launches straight into his subject. I marvel that he are so soon turned away from the grace of God. Here is an example of religious demons bringing people back into slavery, which is legalism. And in the fifth chapter of Galatians, you remember, he says, Be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage, of slavery. Demons enslave. The next activity which I find so common with demons is to torment. Perhaps this is the most distinctive of all their activities. Second Timothy chapter 1, Paul says, God hath not given us the spirit of fear. There is a spirit, a demon of fear. And in 1 John 4, 18, John points out the mark of this demon of fear. He says, fear hath torment. Now, there are many kinds of fear which are good. The fear of the Lord is clean and enduring forever, but there's a demonic fear which is tormenting. And I would say probably one out of five Christians has undergone some kind of torment from the spirit of fear. Then another obvious activity of demons is that they drive or compel. If you want to take an adjective, the adjective would be compulsive. Compulsive eating, compulsive drinking, compulsive talking. Anything that's compulsive, unnaturally and unreasonably compulsive, in my opinion, is demonic. Uh, let's look in Luke for a moment for a picture there. Luke chapter 8, verse 29. Speaking about this Gadarene demoniac again, and the spirit in him, it says, oftentimes it had caught him. And he was kept bound with chains and in fetters, and he brake the bands and was driven of the devil, the demon, into the wilderness. Anything that drives you, pushes you, compels you, is demonic, in my opinion, if it's unnatural, intense, and persistent, and it's very often religious. I know of a brother in the Lord that had a demon that impelled him to testify. That would sound strange, but he just had no rest. He could not stop testifying. And in actual fact, it came to the point where he had a physical pain in his chest. And ultimately, it was identified as a demon and cast out of him. You could say, well, that's very good to be testifying all the time. Not if it's compulsive. If there's no rest in it, it's not of God. And there are oh so many forms of compulsion that people are subjected to. Mental compulsion, compulsion of appetite, compulsion of speech. I know, and I say it with regret, but I realize that before I was converted, I had a demon that compelled me to blaspheme. I could not help it. 
I didn't want to, it just continually came out of me. Then another common mark of demon activity is defilement. Titus 1, 15. Titus chapter 1 and verse 15. Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. There are many people who have a mind and a conscience that's defiled by demon activity. I received a letter this week from a woman in another part of this country, a sincere Christian woman trying to lead a good life, trying to be a mother to her children and a wife to her husband, but she said, I have no control over my thoughts. The most awful, obscene, unclean images and suggestions continually present themselves to my mind. Now, she did not desire them. She hated them. But she could not get free from them. And I would say that I receive letters or calls for help like that frequently. Let's pause for a moment and then sum up these different verbs that present the activity of evil spirits. They entice... They deceive, they enslave, they torment, they drive or compel, and they defile. Summing this up, you can say this, that demons fight against peace in every aspect. And I have suggested in your outline certain of the obvious ways in which they fight against peace. First of all, they prevent inner personal harmony. The more I preach, the more important I see this concept of harmony. It's really part of the meaning of the word for peace. And I found comparatively few people have real inner harmony. They are not at peace with themselves. And if you're not at peace with yourself, you don't have much peace because you've got yourself with you all the time. There is not that real inner adjustment. They can never totally relax. Any person that can totally relax, in my opinion, doesn't have much of a problem with evil spirits. But there aren't many people in America today that know how to relax. Secondly, they take away peace of mind. They invade our thoughts. They bombard us with all sorts of suggestions, doubts, fears, lies, insinuations, accusation, condemnation. Thirdly, they attack our physical well-being. You see, the total word peace includes physical well-being. And Satan is a murderer. If he can, he'll kill us physically. Fourthly, they attack our harmonious relationships with other people, especially those who are closest to us. This is one of their main areas of activity, is inside homes and families and marriages. Jesus said, if two of you shall harmonize together on anything that, touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them. If we can get to that place of harmony with one other person, our prayers are irresistible. But my experience is comparatively few people do harmonize with the persons they live closest to. And one of the main reasons for this lack of harmony is the activity of evil spirits inside homes, marriages, families, and so on. It's no accident that my wife has learned to be very careful with me when I'm on my way to preach. In fact, I should say my whole family has. Because it's just at that moment that one wrong word or one word misunderstood can just break that harmony which is necessary for the proper presentation of the Word of God. You see, if I don't have peace, I cannot transmit peace to others. I can preach about peace, theorize about peace, but I cannot transmit what I don't have. And many, many times when you listen to a preacher, you aren't really listening to his words. You're in touch with a spirit. He may have sound doctrine, it may sound very good, but if it doesn't come out of the inner experience, it's not going to achieve anything. At least, if it achieves anything, it'll not be the right thing. And then, there's also, they fight against our adjustment to our circumstances and situations. A person that has evil spirits finds it hard to produce the maximum of his ability in his job, wherever it may be. They'll distract you. 
You start to do one thing and end up by doing three other things and forget what you were starting to do. You don't realize that. But that's the activity of evil spirits. God just very recently showed me that I had been tormented for years by a demon of distraction. It's an extraordinary thing. If I start to get a message ready, I have to get up and do about three other things and go around and sit down in my chair again. And I, it's taken me something like 30 years to nail that one and see that it's not normal, it's not natural, it's not a habit pattern, it's an enemy. All right, let's close this. The great distinctive mark of demons, in my opinion, is restlessness. Show me a restless person, and I'll show you a person that needs deliverance. And I see a lot of them every day. Show me a person that's completely at rest. I cannot believe they need much deliverance. All right, there are two main points from which demons operate. We'll deal with it very, very simply. I don't have a lot of complicated theology. They may operate from outside the body or from inside the body. I don't care about a lot of distinctions between oppression and obsession and all these other things. If people want to go in for them, they're welcome. But I've learned the basic question, is it from outside or is it from inside? And if it's inside, there's one solution, get it out. Whatever label you like to give the activity, the answer is get rid of it. And that's what I close by saying. If demons are operating from outside, then we merely have to resist them, keep them out, drive them away. But if they're operating from within, the only permanent solution is to cast them out, to expel them, to get rid of them. And in my personal experience, I've discovered that if the problem is persistent, recurrent, and does not yield to ordinary forms of Christian discipline, you can be sure 99% the problem is inside and the solution is to get it out. Devil is the translation of a Greek word, diabolos, which is found in the English words diabolic, diabolical, in Spanish, diabolo, and so on, and means literally the slanderer or the accuser, and is a title of Satan himself. It's a title of one person, and it is not normally used in the plural. But what we are dealing with is not Satan directly. What we are dealing with is what are correctly called demons or evil spirits. The word demon comes from a Greek word daimonion which has a very long history in the Greek language and it means some kind of a spirit being whom the ancients regarded as half divine and half human and who was normally worshipped or propitiated in certain ways. In fact the majority of pagan religions all through human history have centered around the recognition of demons and attempts to propitiate them or enlist their help or prevent their wrath. More or less, that's how you can sum it up. Now, the other phrase that's used interchangeably in the New Testament is the phrase evil spirit or unclean spirit. And when I say interchangeably, in the synoptic gospels where one writer will use the word demon, telling the same story about the same incident, Another synoptic writer will use the word evil spirit or unclean spirit, so that these are interchangeable. And we are not talking about Satan himself, the prince of the kingdom of darkness. We are not even talking about angels. We are talking about spirit beings. As I understand it, they are not angels. Now, this is not essential for your deliverance to know this, but I observe certain distinctions. Angels have their habitat, in the heavenlies. Evil spirits are earthbound. Angels apparently have wings and fly. Evil spirits apparently do not have wings and walk. Jesus said the unclean spirit walketh through dry places seeking rest. Angels have bodies of their own and would not feel at home nor have any reason to desire to be inside a human body. Demons or evil spirits are spirits without bodies that intensely crave to be inside bodies. Primarily they would choose to be inside a human body, but rather than be without a body to inhabit, we find in the Gospels that they would prefer to go into the bodies of pigs. Uh, without a body they cannot express their nature. If, for instance, a demon of blasphemy must have a tongue to blaspheme through, a demon of doubt must have a mind to doubt through, a demon of lust 
must have a body and physical members to lust through. A demon of alcohol must have the appropriate physical organs to crave and to consume alcohol through. They are tied up to the need of a body to express themselves. Now where demons came from is a matter about which I have opinions after many years, but it isn't important. Jesus dealt with demons by the thousands, but he never stopped to explain in his public teaching where they came from. And the important thing for you is not to know where they come from, it's to know how to get rid of them. And that the Bible tells you clearly. Now, in regard to these, there are certain phrases used in the New Testament, and I'll enumerate them briefly. The three main phrases used for a person who is in some way under the influence or power or control of a demon or an evil spirit, these are the following phrases. First of all, to have an unclean spirit or a demon. Secondly, to be in an unclean spirit or a demon, when I think modern English would speak about being under the influence of. Thirdly, there is a Greek verb, to be demonized. The Greek verb, if you are familiar with Greek, is daimonizomai, and it means I am demonized. It's directly formed from the noun for demon. Demon in Greek, daimonion, to be demonized, daimonizomai. See, it's just a verb formed out of a noun. Now, in the King James Version, the verb that I have spoken of, daimonizomai, is normally translated to be possessed with devils. Now, this translation is a disaster. It has misled more people than it will ever be possible to calculate. Because there is nothing in the original Greek, and I challenge any Greek scholar to say to the contrary, there is nothing in the original Greek to justify the use of the word possess. And this is what has misled millions of people. You see, the word possess in the English language suggests total ownership. If I possess my Bible, then it is entirely mine. And every page in the Bible belongs to me. There's no shared ownership. No one has a claim over 15 pages in my Bible. I possess it. It is my Bible. Now, people say, can a Christian be demon-possessed? And the answer is, obviously no. A Christian, essentially, is one who belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. If he belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ, the devil cannot own him. That is absolutely clear. But it doesn't mean that a Christian cannot have areas in his life which are still under the control of evil spirits. He may belong by the choice of his will and the surrender of his will in salvation or the new birth to the Lord Jesus Christ. But though he has given himself generally to the Lord Jesus, it may well be that there are areas within him where the Holy Spirit and the nature of Christ are not in effective control. And you say, Brother Prince, how do you know that? Well, I've been a Christian over 30 years, and I know it from my own personal experience. I was baptized in the Holy Spirit about 30 years ago, having found the Lord pre about two weeks previously in an army barrack room. I had a marvelous conversion, a total transformation. But many, many years later, there were still areas in my life where the Lord Jesus was not in effective control. How many of you would say that's pretty normal? Thank you. All right, I just want you to see I'm not talking to people from another world. And I'm not talking about abnormal people. Let me put it to you this way. Now, I'm not jesting and I'm not making a, a fun of you at all. I want you to be serious. I'm serious. Let me ask you each one this question. How many of you would say, by raising your hand, Brother Prince, I believe I have the Holy Spirit? Praise the Lord. All right. Now, I'm not making fun of you. If you put your hand up, I will not laugh at you. How many of you would say, by the same token, Brother Prince, I'm totally controlled by the Holy Spirit? Praise God. Thank you. Well, there was one person that raised his hand. I praise God for that. I don't question it. Every Christian should be in that condition. But we all know that most Christians aren't as yet.
Lots of people think that the Holy Spirit will only start to work in you and bless you when you're perfect. But isn't that silly? Because when you're perfect, <laughs> you won't need it. The idea that you've got to be perfect before the Holy Spirit will move in and do things for you is like sending young people to a university and the professors come to them and say, now when you young people graduate, we'll start to teach you. <laughs> See, when do you need teaching? Before you graduate. Uh, when we get to heaven, we'll have graduated. Then I don't know that we'll need all that teaching. But we need the Holy Spirit to help us now in our weaknesses. You know what Romans 8, 26 says? The Spirit helpeth our infirmities. The places where we're weak, the places where we're having problems, is just where we need the Holy Spirit. And likewise, evil spirits, though they cannot own a Christian, can move in or be in residence and occupy certain areas of their personality. To illustrate it from personal experience, I was a full gospel preacher for a good many years, but I had various internal problems. I'll mention only one. It's a common one. It was depression. I was subject to fits of depression. They would come down over me and sh overshadow me and press me in like a great, dark, moist cloud settling down over me, shutting me in. And I would have a, a feeling of helplessness and hopelessness. It would be, others came, but you can't. And I would be aware that I would carry this pressure around with me where I went, and particularly in my own home. And it was very, very embarrassing to me to think that I was subjecting my wife and children to the pressure that I was under. Now, I tried every means I knew of to get rid of this depression. I fasted, I prayed, I, I, I can't think of anything that I didn't do. And the embarrassing thing was, the more I fasted, the worse it got. In fact, one of our daughters said to me one day, Daddy, I wish you'd stop fasting because you're worse when you fast. Well, that's embarrassing for a preacher. And, but it was quite true, because what fasting did was bring the thing out into the open. It didn't get it out, but it forced it into the open. Another thing I noticed was, when I really wanted to serve Christ to the utmost, that was when the pressure was worst. But when I was content to kind of go along with the stream and not make too much efforts against the kingdom of Satan, the pressure let up. And I could not find the solution to this until one day, reading in Isaiah chapter 61, verse 3, I read this phrase, the garment of praise in place of the spirit of heaviness. And when I read that phrase, the spirit of heaviness, I suddenly saw, that's your problem. It's not a mental attitude, it's not a psychological attitude, it's a person, a spirit that knows you. And immediately I saw a whole host of truths. I saw that the same spirit had troubled my father most of the time that I knew him, that it was a kind of family ghost that followed us down from generation to generation. I could trace its activity. And I realized that it understood me, it knew my thoughts, and it definitely planned its strategy against me. And that it was, had one supreme aim, to prevent me serving Christ effectively. I will tell you this with regard to demons. Their headquarters are in Satan's kingdom, and they have two main orders in relation to you. Number one, to keep you from Christ. If they fail in that, their second order is to stop you serving Christ effectively. If they can't stop you from being a Christian, then they'll stop you from being an effective Christian. Now, you will find out that this makes an, a sense and explains a whole lot of things in your experience. For instance, why can you stay awake till midnight watching the TV, but fall asleep before 10 o'clock if you read your Bible? Because the demon of slumber, which is referred to both in Old Testament and in you, doesn't mind you watching the late night show with Johnny Carson, but does mind you getting to know the Word of God, see? Or you take the little, the case we had of the neighbors with a pestilential little girl of about three. And we used to watch. Friday night when they went out grocery shopping, she'd dress up and walk out all smiling and sweet. Sunday morning when they wanted to go to the full gospel Sunday school and church, 
she'd lie on the floor and kick her legs in the air and scream because the spirit in that little girl didn't mind the grocery store but hated the full gospel church, you see. And if you will work out a lot of things that happen in your life, I sometimes tell people in meetings like this, now if you find an absolutely abnormal resentment for Brother Prince rising in you right now, be on your guard. I mean, there are many good reasons why you could resent me, but I've, I've done nothing to you. And it suddenly rises up in you. Remember, it's the devil trying to stop you from coming to me for help. See? You, you, behind these things, if they are demonic, there's always an intelligence that plots and plans and works out how to frustrate you, defeat you, keep you miserable, make you sick, and if possible, kill you. That's their objective. Don't forget what Jesus said about the devil. The thief cometh not but for to steal, to kill, to destroy. That's why he's there. If you tolerate him, that's what he's doing. Don't forget. You tolerate Satan in any area of your life, whatever. He's there to steal, to take away the things that are rightfully yours, your peace of mind, your innocence, your health, your right relationships with your family and neighbors, your prosperity, your success, all these good things that are yours in Christ, the devil will seek to steal from you. Secondly, he's there to kill you physically. And many Christians every year die murdered, murdered by cancer and tumors and all sorts of things. They don't live out their natural and normal appointed lifespan. They're murdered by the devil. And then the third thing he does to the unsaved, not to the believer, is to torment them eternally after death. That's his program. Jesus warned us. He said, be very clear why the devil comes, what his aims are. They're stated for you. Steal, kill, destroy. So if you make friends with him, you know the kind of person you've made friends with. Now, the next question is, what are the typical marks of demon activity in a person? We all know that we have a nature, at least I trust we all know, that is prone to sin. We're born rebels. I hope you know that. Ephesians 2, 2, we are all by nature the children of wrath because we are the children of disobedience. Adam never begat any children till he was a rebel. And every child that ever was begotten of, Re of Adam and Adam's descendants was a rebel by birth. This is not my purpose to teach this this afternoon. It's another message. So we are born with a rebellious nature. You ladies never had to teach any of your children to be naughty, did you? No, all right. But you had a problem teaching them to be good in most cases. So we have a rebellious nature. We tend to desire to do the wrong thing. Now, the remedy for the rebellious nature is not deliverance. The remedy for the rebellious nature is the cross. Our old man, that old rebellious Adamic nature, is crucified with Christ. So if you're just dealing with the Adamic nature, don't come to Brother Prince and ask him to cast the old Adam out because it isn't scriptural. Can't be done. The only remedy for the old Adam is the cross. They that are Christ's, have crucified the flesh with its affections and lusts. Now this is the basic solution beyond all solutions, it's the cross. But in addition to the old Adamic nature, multitudes of people have the compounded problem of what I call the vultures that fasten on the carcass. The carcass, the old man, the vultures, the evil spirits that fasten their claws and their beaks into that rotting old carcass and feed upon it. And if that's your situation, in addition to the cross, you may need the ministry of deliverance. The remedy for evil spirits is not to crucify them. You cannot crucify an evil spirit. It is to cast them out. On the other hand, you cannot cast out the old man you have to crucify him. See, the remedies correspond to the needs, and you cannot mix up the remedy for the opposite need. Multitudes of people have been struggling manfully to crucify demons. just doesn't work. The Bible says, reckon the old man dead. That's scriptural, but it doesn't say reckon demons dead because they aren't dead and they'll never die. Now, Naturally, the question arises, Brother Prince, if I have this recurrent, persistent, 
disturbing, frustrating problem. How do I know whether it's just the old man or whether it's an evil spirit exploiting the old man? Well, on the blackboard, I have written up there in the middle, activities of demons. And I have learned by experience that these are the main ways in which demons operate and manifest their presence. The things they habitually do. We'll glance at them. Number one, they entice. This is temptation. The Bible says every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. There's something within each one of us called lust, perverted desire, but there's an agent that plays upon the lust. It's like the mouse, there's something in the mouse that likes cheese. But to get the mouse into the trap, there's got to be someone that places the cheese just where it will cause the mouse to be caught. Now the enticer, the agent, is the demon and he plays upon lust perverted desires within you and me one of the basic activities of demons is enticement personally i don't believe that satan comes down from the heavenlies every time you and i need to be tempted i believe he's got a very well-trained multitudinous army doing the job for him against us all the time He says, there's a young man just going into the ministry and he could be a danger. Demons get on his tail and get him interested in some smart divorcee who's got about three children and a rotten past and get him sidetracked because otherwise he's going to do us damage. See, that's the piece of cheese that's baiting the mouse trap. And those evil spirits are playing upon something called sexual lust inside a young man. Just an example. The next activity is to enslave. Let's look at this particularly in reference to sex. Now, first of all, in regard to sex, I want to say sex is not evil. Contrary to the opinion of most Christians, it's good. Because God created man sexual, and after he'd created everything, he saw that everything he had created was very good, including sex. The church has got a totally wrong, negative attitude towards sex. However, sex is also very powerful in most persons, and therefore the devil is smart enough to know that if he can get control in the sex area, he's got a very important measure of control in that person. Now, the next thing I want to say about sex is, it is no sin to be tempted. Jesus was tempted in all points, like as we are, yet without sin. So you can be tempted without sinning. Further, if you are tempted and sin sexually with a, with a wrong act, that does not necessarily mean you need deliverance from a sex demon. You All you need to do is repent Confess to Jesus, receive forgiveness and cleansing, and there you are back again. You're all right. But if this thing becomes enslaving, if no matter how many times you repent and confess and get forgiven and cleansed, you're back again doing it, then it's a demon. Now, I believe every form of sex perversion is demonic in its origin. The third thing demons do is torment. They are the tormentors. In Matthew 18, there's a parable told about a servant who was forgiven six million dollars and refused to forgive a fellow servant ten dollars. I'm putting it in modern values. And when the master heard about this unforgiving servant, he said, thou wicked servant. He was very wrong. And he commanded him to be delivered to the tormentors till he should pay the uttermost farthing. The last verse of that parable says, So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye do not from your hearts forgive every man his brother, their brother his trespass. What so likewise? To deliver you to the tormentors. Who are the tormentors? The demons. 
God awakened me to this fact because I've had multitudes of Christians, uncounted multitudes, coming to me in torment. And I said to myself, God, how could that be? They're your children. How did they get in the hands of the tormentors? God said, I put them there because they refuse to forgive another believer. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you. There are various areas of torment. There's spiritual torment. The demon of fear is probably the chief tormentor. The Apostle John says, fear hath torment. Now there's a natural fear which is perfectly normal. There's the fear of the Lord which is reverence and respect and awe for God which is clean and endureth forever. But there's another kind of fear which is demonic. It's abnormal, it's unnatural, it's excessive, and it's tormenting. There's a tormentor. And there's another tormentor, and it's condemnation. Condemned all the time. The Bible says there is no condemnation for them who are in Christ Jesus. Another tormentor is doubt. And then there's physical torment. Cancer, arthritis, and so on. Number four, the fourth main activity is to drive or compel. The Gadarene demoniac was driven out of habitation of men into the area of the tombs. And anything that is compulsive suggests the activity of a demon. Compulsive eating, compulsive talking, compulsive sleeping. There are many areas. Now, all these things are normal. It's normal to talk, normal to eat, normal to sleep. But when it becomes driving, compulsive, nagging, you can suspect a demon. Number five, defiling. Demons are unclean. All evil spirits are unclean. And many people have their mind and their conscience defiled by demons. Their minds are filled with thoughts and suggestions that they resent and hate, but they come crowding in almost endlessly. They're defiled in their minds by evil suggestions. And then number six, harass. They just get at you. They disturb you. They trouble you. Just the moment you're going to do something for God, they begin to get on you. My family learned years ago, when I was about to preach, stop talking to him. Because he's got everything he needs to keep calm before that message. Now, as a matter of fact, since I've had deliverance from three particular spirits which came different phases, depression, anger, and embarrassment, I can be perfectly relaxed before I preach. But that's an achievement. And it didn't come in one day. And it isn't true of all preachers, believe me. The normal preacher is a bundle of nerves before he gets into the pulpit. He's harassed. Now, we want to deal with what I call the city within. I have said that though a Christian belongs to the Lord, there may be areas within him where the Lord is not in control. And the Bible compares the inner nature of man to a city. Proverbs 16:32. He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that ruleth his spirit better than he that taketh a city. So ruling your own spirit is better than taking a city in war. And the other one, Proverbs 25, 28, he that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. No defense. He can't keep anything out. Any demon that the devil sends against him can come in and settle in that city because it has no protection. Now, many drug addicts are like that. Persistent dope addiction makes a person inwardly like a city broken down and without walls. Everything will come in, one after another. And you'll find most persistent drug addicts not merely need deliverance from the drug, say heroin, they need deliverance from deception, hatred, resentment, rebellion, sex perversion, and all sorts of other things because they've lost the ability to keep anything out of that inner city within them. Now, there are other people besides drug addicts that have become like a city that is broken down and without walls. But my purpose in speaking is to bring out this illustration of the city that's within each one of us. 
And the city I always use to illustrate this is one in which I lived, Chicago. Now, the mayor of Chicago is Richard J. Daly. And many people feel he's doing a good job as mayor. But though Richard J. J. Daly is duly elected mayor, everybody who knows Chicago knows there are quite a lot of areas in Chicago where Richard J. Daly is not in control. There are some areas in Chicago where even the police have to go two at a time in daylight. There are other areas of Chicago, and they include certain areas of the political life of the city which are run by the mafia, although Daly is the duly elected mayor. Now, this is like a Christian. You've elected Jesus Christ. He's mayor. He's in the mayor's chamber, but you've still got the mafia running around somewhere in science. And as a matter of fact, the mafia actually is a very vivid picture of demon activity because demons regularly operate in gangs. They do not operate singly. So much so that I've learned if I meet one member of a gang to look for the others almost instantly. For instance, let's take a few. You have the case of, uh, well, let's say, depression, fear, loneliness, self-pity, despair. You know the next one? Suicide, that's right. And when you find that group, you just, it's only a question of time if suicide hasn't come in. It may be that he hasn't had time. Each one opens the way for the next. Or you can take anger, violence, and the next one, murder. Now, bear this in mind. Demons do not come in necessarily because you've committed the thing. They come in to make you commit the thing. For instance, the demon of suicide obviously doesn't come in because you've committed suicide but it comes in to make you commit suicide. The demon of murder does not come in to, to, because you've committed murder, it comes in to make you commit murder. Lots of people have said to me in horror when I've called the demon of murder out of them, Brother Prince, I've never committed murder. I say no. But that demon came in with the intention of making you commit murder somewhere further along the line. And as long as you had him in, you were always in a dangerous position. Because in a sudden moment of anger, who knows what you would have done? How many people you read about in the newspaper commit murder, and when they're charged with it, they say, I don't know what made me do it. No, they don't. But the devil does. He had that demon waiting there maybe 15 years till he got to that man to a place where he was drunk and somebody insulted him or ran off with his wife, and then the demon of murder went into top gear and said, now is my opportunity. Other people have the demon of adultery who have not committed adultery, but it's there pushing them into it. Let's take briefly the main areas in the city. Now I could illustrate this from Chicago. You have the loop with the businesses. A little further west you have the banks. You go a little south, south from the center of Chicago, you have the depots, the warehouses. Go further south you have a residential area which is basically Negro. Go back to the loop and go west and you have an area which is primarily Polish. Go back to the loop and go north and you have an area which is primarily Jewish and then another area which is primarily Swedish and then you get out to the suburbs with their different characteristic levels of social success and prestige and so on. So every area of the city has its own distinctive characteristic occupations and inhabitants. Now this is like the city within you. It's divided up into areas, each with its own characteristic inhabitants. And I'm going briefly through this list. And I'm not going to dwell on any. I would say the first main area is emotions, attitudes, and relationships. And for every negative attitude, emotion, and relationship, there exists the corresponding demon. Resentment, hatred, rebellion, fear, depression, loneliness, self-pity, envy, jealousy, pride, and a whole host of others. There's a demon for each one. Now, the fact that you feel envy every now and then doesn't mean you have the demon of envy, as I've said. But when it becomes compulsive, when it is persistent, when it is beginning to occupy a sort of major part of your life, then it's a demon. The commonest, I would say, is fear. 
I say about one in five persons need deliverance from the spirit of fear alone. As I said already, they go in gangs. Find one and you can pick out the other. They go in succession. For instance, the problem of multitudes of young people in America today is this. Resentment, always against their parents, hatred, rebellion. And when rebellion enters, first of all it's directed towards the parents, then the church, then the school, then the government, then, then God. They go in succession. For instance, the problem of multitudes of young people in America today is this. Resentment, always against their parents, hatred, rebellion. And when rebellion enters, first of all it's directed towards the parents, then the church, then the school, then the government, then, then God. It's more or less that wing. This is, explains what's happened to multitudes of young people. Now, I would like to say that in most cases it's the fault of the parents. But it's the problem of the children. And I would like to say to anybody who has problems as a result of their parents' wrong treatment, remember it isn't your parent that suffers so much as you. I was talking to a girl a couple of days ago whose father had molested her sexually and so on. And I was trying to urge her to forgive her father, and she was finding it a hard job. And I said, well, remember, he's ruined the first years of your life. If you go on hating him, he's going to ruin the rest of your life. Do you want him to do that? I remember talking to a woman once who said to me, well, her husband had run off after 15 years of marriage with another woman and left her with the kids. And I said, are you going to forgive your husband? She said, why? He's ruined 15 years of my life. I said, do you want him to ruin the rest? Because as long as you go on hating and resenting him, he's ruining your life. He's not suffering one quarter as much as you are. Remember, in resentment, it's not the one who's resented that suffers. It's the one who resents. You know, when a man has ulcers, you know the question that they ask. It's not what the man's eating, it's what's eating the man. And resentment just eats people up from inside. Now don't get eaten away inside. Then there's the realm of the mind, the thoughts. There are certain specific characteristic demons. Doubt, unbelief, indecision, procrastination, putting things off, compromise. These are mental, very, very real, very powerful. Many people have had unbelief injected into them by the seminary, by the church. They've been just fed on unbelief. Compromise is a remarkably powerful demon. A Lutheran minister came to me once. He had the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but he said, I need deliverance. And he had a problem with homosexuality. Another minister and I prayed with him. He was delivered, but he said, I'm not fully free. And I commanded the next spirit to name itself, and it said compromise. And I was astonished. I said, have you had a problem with compromise? He said, all my life, since I was a boy, I've never been able to make a clear-cut commitment on anything. And when we commanded that spirit to come out of him, it was so powerful, it threw that man around like a rubber ball. And I realized what a hold. There's a lady here. And I'm not going to any way to indicate who she is. She wouldn't mind if I did, actually. She remembers she had the demon of forgetfulness. And when I was casting that out, it spoke out of her and said, I'm not coming out, I'm locked in her brain. These are the mental demons, and there are others, but I'm just giving you a sample. Then there's the demons that specifically relate to the tongue. Blasphemy. Any blasphemer has a demon. That's one sufficient evidence. Lying. <coughs> unclean talk. And you know another one? Gossip. Ah, uh, the gossip demon has ruined more churches maybe than the sex demons put together. If you are like a carrion bird feeding on the bad traits in other people, you have a gossip demon. Some so-called prayer meetings are just outings for gossip demons. And I'm sure they lick their lips with expectation when the prayer day rolls round every week. <laughs> oh, sister, did you hear about Mrs. So-and-so? She really needs prayer. Yak, yak, yak. How much prayer does she get? 
And how much good does it do her? Then there's the area of sex. As I've already said, sex is good, not evil, but it's powerful. And if the devil can move in and grab that area, then he's got a major measure of control over your personality. Something that will drive you, force you, enslave you. Now, my personal conviction is every form of sex perversion is demonic. That, again, is sufficient evidence. Any form of homosexuality, and there are many different forms, in my opinion, is the manifestation of a demon. And I have seen homosexuals of all shades delivered when it has been dealt with as a demon. There was a man in Chicago, and again, I could mention his name, he wouldn't mind. He'd been a homosexual for many years. And when I preached on this, ultimately he received deliverance. But he said to our daughter later, he said, I never got deliverance until I was willing to face the fact that it was a demon and I had to deal with it that way. Another demon in the sex area, which is tremendously common, and I know this doesn't sound good for a preacher, but I'm going to tell you nevertheless, is masturbation. Now, I know that doctors and psychologists say it's harmless and it's a safe outlet and so on. Well, it's demonic. Now, again, a person may have a fall, a slip, repent, confess, be forgiven and cleansed, that's it. But when it becomes enslaving, it's demonic. I've dealt with many married persons, both men and women, that were still enslaved by the demon of masturbation years after marriage. I was dealing with one last week. Married man with a child. He said, have you ever had a problem with masturbation? He said, yes, and I still have. Frequently, when you're dealing with people who need deliverance, you'll find, if you watch them, that their fingers become stiff and distorted. And often they'll complain of a tingling in their fingers. And in, never have I found this to be anything but masturbation. I've dealt with hundreds of cases. As soon as I see those symptoms, I know that's what I'm dealing with. And in many cases, that evil power has to be driven out specifically out of the fingers. I remember another instance of, of power in fingers. I had a deliverance service some years back and a collective deliverance prayer. And uh, I didn't know the results. In many cases, the people came forward, I prayed, and then the service closed. But a woman, a few days later, said, You know, I am a mother with two or three children, and I love my children, but she said I have the most intensive compulsion to spank them for unreasonable things. And she said, When I came forward in the deliverance service, I felt that evil power leaving my hands. And she said, Now I have no urge to spank my children. See, the Bible says we're to yield our members as instruments of righteousness under God. But sometimes the devil has got there first, and he's using our members as instruments of sin, and then we have to drive out his power. Then we have the area of addictions. Addictions are appetites which have gone out of all proportion and become enslaving. All appetites basically are healthy. It's healthy to eat, it's healthy to drink, and so on. But when an appetite becomes abnormal, perverted, and enslaving, then it's an addiction. And all addictions are demonic. I discovered this by experience, and I believe firmly it's true. I dealt some years back with a young man who was the son of a doctor, medical doctor, well-educated young man. His addiction was to cough mixture. And he used to drink five bottles of cough mixture every day. I understand that the ingredient that was addictive was benzoterpene hydrate. I don't know what it is. When I was in the morning worship service preaching on the power of the blood of Jesus, that young man was driven by that demon out of the service to the drugstore to buy a bottle of cough mixture. So intensive was the compulsion to drink cough mixture. And when I prayed with him that evening, this demon spoke out of his throat with a deep bass voice and said, I'm addiction. You can't have him. I have his soul. And I will not let go. And it was a real battle to get that demon out. Another case of addiction that was remarkable, I dealt with a young woman of about 18. 
Pentecostal girl saved and baptized in the Holy Spirit who had an addiction to nail varnish. She loved the smell of nail varnish. And she said to me, when I go into the cosmetics department of a major store, I cannot act like a normal person. I have this compulsion to go and buy nail varnish. I either have to buy nail varnish or get out of that department. And when this spirit came out of her, it tore her and it came out screaming. It was not just a figment of the imagination. The commonest addiction in the United States, some of you heard me say this many times, food addiction, gluttony. That's just as much an addiction as alcohol. There was a Presbyterian minister in the camp last August. Some of you will remember him. He had a tremendous battle for deliverance. I was really longing to get over to him. I couldn't, but there were some sisters ministering to him. When he was delivered, I said, what was that man delivered of? And one of these sisters said, gluttony. And she said, he told her this. He was in his late 50s or early 60s. And he said, this has absolutely warped my life. It's even poisoned my relationship with my wife. He said, it's caused me to be deceptive. I'll go downtown in the middle of the day, buy two dollars worth of candy, eat it all in the car on the way home, and then lie to my wife about where I've been. <laughs> See, it's just like an alcoholic, but it's the other thing. I'll tell you. Now, I'll tell you what happens. Addictions are not the trunk, they're branches. An addiction is a branch that grows on a trunk, and the trunk is a frustration. So in dealing with addiction, if you don't deal with a basic frustration, you've not done a complete job. Let's say a lady is frustrated. Her husband is running around with another woman and spending a lot more money than he earns. All right, if that lady is an Episcopalian, she'll go to the martini, and she'll become an alcoholic. But if she's Assemblies of God or Church of God, she'll go to the cookie jar and the pastry tray. But she'll become a foodaholic, that's all. But there isn't any basic difference, just the same. And there are more foodaholics than there are alcoholics in the church. I'm not talking about the world at large. See, it isn't respectable to be an alcoholic, but it's perfectly respectable in most religious circles to be a foodaholic. Then there are the other addictions. Nicotine, very common. And it cannot be the will of God for a person to smoke and destroy the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is the human body. Have you seen people die of lung cancer? I have. It could not be God's will that you greatly increase the probability of your dying that terrible death. Be realistic. You can pass it off as a social expression or something harmless, but it's destroying you. Furthermore, it's enslaving. And you go to a prayer meeting and you're a smoker, you walk outside, the first thing you want to do is light up. You just can't hold out any longer. Maybe if the prayer meeting is too long, you go out before it ends. You're a slave. And that's a demon. A Church of England rector in Britain told me that in his congregation there was a move of the Holy Spirit. And uh, a number of people who were never converted but were members of the church got saved and baptized in the Holy Spirit. And there was one man who had this problem with nicotine. He just could not stop smoking. Now, some people smoke and they don't mind, but he smoked and hated it and hated himself for doing it. But he could not stop. And this rector was a real good Ang Anglican evangelical. He knew all about the sixth chapter of Romans, reckoning yourself to be dead indeed unto sin. Every time this man came to him, he said, just reckon yourself to be dead. And the man said, I've reckoned, but I, it doesn't work. So they had a prayer meeting one day, and this rector told me this himself. He said, in the prayer meeting, he was suddenly moved by the Spirit of God. He walked up to that man, placed his hand on his chest, and said, you demon of nicotine, come out of this man. The man gave a kind of cough and a gasp. Something came out, and he couldn't bear to be in the same room with people smoking up to them. So that's the example of a person whose heart is right, but they're enslaved. He didn't want it. Now, wicked people want to do wicked things. But good people hate wicked things, and if they do them, it's because they're enslaved. The whole area of religious deception. You know the greatest enemy of America today? I say this soberly, it's witchcraft. And there's a professional witch that's right enthroned at the door of the White House. And I don't want to name her, but I've just been in that area, and I've had first-hand information 
of the nature of her activities and the persons whom she has influenced. I would say one thing. It's a good thing that Nixon won the last election, not for political reasons, but because his rival regularly consults that prophetess. Now, I have this on the best, most up-to-date, first-hand information. Her best friend has just been converted and is going to write a book exposing her, incidentally. <laughs> Pray for that book, because the devil's going to fight it tooth and nail. Another interesting piece of information about books is that Don Basham, who's a personal friend of mine, has got a book in the final stages, which is going to be published by John Sherrill, on how he came into this deliverance ministry and the stories and experiences. And it will be a bestseller without any doubt. And it will be a real counterblast to these other books that you can see on every bookstand, every drugstore, every air terminal, and so on. Okay, we've come to the point of how to be delivered. Let me just mention certain things which I believe are demonic. Allergies, almost all sinus problems, tumors, ulcers, arthritis, heart attacks. Now these are my opinions. I'm not a medical doctor, I'm not practicing medicine. But there is a medical doctor from Columbus, Georgia, some of you probably know him, who was in the CFO retreat last spring, heard me preach this. And he said, well, I'll see if it's true. He had a persistent allergy that he could not eat wheat or anything with wheat in it. So he came forward in my deliverance service, prayed the deliverance prayer, and said, now if I'm delivered, I can eat wheat. Went away and has been eating wheat ever since. <laughs> and he was a Baptist. So if you can convince a Baptist physician that demons are due to allergies, I think you've won the battle. All right. Now, how to get delivered? Simple. I'm, I've outlined the condition. Let me tell you, first of all, the Bible says, Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. That's just as inclusive a promise as whosoever believeth in him shall not perish. One's John 3, 16, the other's Joel 2, 32. So all you have to know is the conditions. Meet them and receive deliverance. Number one, humility. And I don't mean that you've got to be a saint in humility. I mean you've got to humble yourself. It's not persistent humility for years. It's humbling yourself. And that's an act of your will. It's a decision which you can make in the next five minutes to humble yourself. You see, I tell people this. There may come a moment when you'll have to choose between your dignity and your deliverance. And then, if you humble yourself, you let dignity go and get deliverance. And dignity will come back again later. But if you're proud, you refuse to lose your dignity and you lose your deliverance. People come to me sometimes and say, Brother Prince, could you pray with me in private? I say, certainly I could, but what's the motive? Is it pride? Because if it's pride, you're not on the right basis to meet God in the first place. God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. God knoweth the proud are far off, and that's where he keeps them too. <laughs> Number two, truth. Jesus said, ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now one thing is knowing the truth of God's word, but the other, which is... <laughs> more down to earth, is knowing the truth about yourself. Now today, I've tried to show you the truth about yourself. I have discovered people that are downright honest always get delivered. But people that you have to keep on drawing it out of them, and you never know when you've got the last item, it's very hard to get them delivered. So I say this, truth in your case means Calling a spade a spade and not an agricultural implement. Or, I put it this way, call your problem by the same name you'd call it in your husband and you've got the right name. <laughs> Thirdly, you have to confess your sin. It's old-fashioned, but God still requires it. You don't have to confess to man. Here, 
today, but you have to confess to Almighty God. Now when it comes to confessing your sin, let me tell you something which is obvious, but few people realize it. You're never going to tell anything to God about yourself that He doesn't already know. See, you're never going to shock God. Oh, isn't that good news? God is unshockable. And when you've told Him the worst, He says, well, I knew it all along. It wasn't for my sake you were telling me, it was for your sake. Because you've got to get it off your chest. You've got to come out in the open with it. This is the condemnation. Light is coming to the world. And men love darkness rather than light. They would not come to the light. Confession is coming to the light. It's exposing that area of your life that you just wish wasn't there. But you have to expose it to the light of God. Not to the light of man, but of God. Number four, repent. That means to renounce to turn away from, to count as your enemy. David said, O God, do not I hate them that hate thee? And am not I grieved with those that rise up against thee? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them mine enemies. And then he said, Search me, O God, and try my heart. He was talking about the things inside him that were God's enemies. And he said, Lord, if they're your enemies, they're my enemies. I'll not be friends with the enemies of God. I'll make God's enemies my enemies, even if they're in me. You see, God will not deliver you from your friends. If you enjoy lust and gossip and these things, God's not going to take them out. But if you hate them, He'll deliver you. Now, hating everything evil, renouncing it, refusing to have anything to do with it, this is repentance. In this category, I want to say, though I'll deal with it tomorrow more fully, you have to renounce occult involvement. Every type of involvement with the occult, the Ouija board, horoscopes, fortune telling, Gene Dixon, Edgar Cayce, handwriting analysis, automatic writing, all this whole area, ESP, hypnosis, the whole works. You have to renounce it because those are the agents of Satan. And you cannot be friends with Satan's agents and friends with God at the same time. You have to hate the enemies of God. Now I'm going to preach on this tomorrow, but I want to say it because in many cases it will hinder your deliverance. If you are still in any way under the shadow of the visit to a fortune teller, playing with a Ouija board, dealing with tarot cards, all these things, the devil still has a legal claim over you. And when you come for deliverance, you say, no, wait a minute now, I've got a right to that area. Don't you think you can get me out? Because you can't. He's a legal expert. Number five needs a sermon on its own. Forgive others. You remember why the unforgiving servant was in the hands of the tormentors? Because he refused to forgive his fellow servant. And if you refuse to forgive any person, living or dead, you are not a candidate for full deliverance. Forgiveness is not an emotion, it's a decision. Simple language, it's tearing up the IOU. All right, your parents owe you $10,000 for all the love, care, affection, consideration, teaching they never gave you. You've got it there in your hand. You can pray for them, you can wish for them, you can pray for deliverance, but the only thing that matters is tearing up the IOU. Your husband owes you $15,000 for running around with three other women. Well, you can hold on to that IOU as long as you like. But you'll not be delivered till you tear it up. The last thing, call on the name of the Lord. It shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. Now, this is the end of the teaching session. All I'm going to do now is minister. God, we thank you for your presence with us. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit. We know that you love us. You care for us. You're concerned. You want the best. You sent your word to heal and to deliver your people. Now, Lord, let every person here be guided by your Holy Spirit in making the right decision, whether to go or whether to stay. And I pray that all that do not need deliverance or are not ready to receive deliverance will go. And I pray that your blessing shall go with them. And I pray that those that have come to the realization that they need deliverance and are willing to meet the conditions will stay, Lord. And that your blessing will remain also with those that stay. Bless the next meeting, the speaker, and everything that we're going to do.
throughout the remainder of this camp. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, Brother Prince is not the deliverer, nor any other human being here. Now, Jesus said, him that cometh unto me, I will in no wise cast out. So if you come, he will not turn you away. All right? Secondly, even when he was on earth, Jesus said, If I, by the Spirit of God, cast out demons, then is the kingdom of God come unto you. So even while he was personally present on earth, the power by which he drove out evil spirits was the power of the Holy Spirit. How much more when he's now in heaven? Therefore, the agent who actually administers deliverance to you is the Holy Spirit. And in order to receive deliverance, you have to cooperate with the Holy Spirit. If you resist the Holy Spirit, you resist your deliverance. Now, in cooperating with the Holy Spirit, there is one simple, basic, physical fact that I will tell you. Philip's translation of Mark 16, 17 says this. These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall expel demons. That's why I call my book Expelling Demons. Now the key word is expel because it takes it out of King James English into modern English and modern thinking. And everybody really knows what the word expel means. If you have inhaled tobacco smoke and it's in your lungs and you don't want it, what do you do? You expel it or exhale it. What is that? It's a decision of your will and an action of your muscles. Now, expelling evil spirits is the same. If you're a believer, then you have the authority in the name of Jesus to expel them. From whom? Well, who better than yourself? Begin with yourself. What is to expel? It's a decision followed by an action. Now, in both Hebrew and Greek, the word for spirit is also the word for breath or wind. And an evil spirit is an evil breath, just as the Holy Spirit is the breath of the Almighty. And in the baptism, what I tell people to do is to drink in the Spirit of God. Jesus said, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. And I found the people that drink always receive. I've never seen a person come to Jesus, meet the conditions, and start to drink in without receiving the baptism. Never. Well, now, expelling is the exact opposite of drinking in. It's exhaling. So when you have come to Jesus, otherwise it doesn't work. When you've met the conditions, when you've prayed the prayer, don't go on praying. Again, it's the same with the baptism. Many people pray themselves out of the baptism. They come to Jesus and go on telling him they want the baptism instead of drinking. You've seen that happen, haven't you? You don't get the baptism by praying. You get the baptism by drinking. You don't expel demons by praying. You expel demons by expelling them. So, when you've come to this moment where you've been through this prayer and said everything that I lead you to say, You'll have met the legal conditions if you prayed the prayer in sincerity. Now you're a legal candidate for deliverance. You've come to Jesus. You can rely on the Holy Spirit to begin to minister deliverance to you. What do you do? Cooperate with the Holy Spirit. How? Begin to breathe out. Begin to expel. And it may happen the first breath will be pure human breath. The second likewise. The third also. But somewhere down the line, something other than human breath is going to start coming on. And that's your enemy. Now, when evil spirits come out, they come out with a variety of different manifestations. It says in Acts 8-7, when Philip preached in Samaria, unclean spirits, crying with loud voice, came out of many that were possessed. There are many different operations as an evil spirit comes out. Sometimes... It's scarcely perceptible. Just a little sigh. Sometimes it's a yawn. I know a lady that was delivered of the demon of nicotine. She yawned so wide she thought she was going to dislocate her jaws. But when they came together again, she was free of nicotine. Often, 
It's a sob. Habitually, the spirit of fear will come out with a sobbing sound. Often it's a cough. Sometimes it's a scream or a groan or a roar. The demon of anger or murder often come out with a roar. Now, I am not encouraging you to scream or sob or roar. But what I'm trying to do is prevent you from being inhibited if it happens that way. Because when that scream rises to your lips, if you suppress it, you've suppressed the demon. <laughs> See? Now, you know what happens when the ambulance goes down the road and its light is flashing and its siren is going. All other traffic draws off to one side or the other. Isn't that right? Well, that's like the demon. When the ambulance starts coming out, get everything else out of the way. Stop praying. Don't speak in tongues. Don't use the name of Jesus. Let it go. I say to people, if I'm ministering to them individually, and I listen, let me do the praying, you do the letting go. Because your praying isn't going to do it. In fact, your praying is going to hinder the demon. The demon cannot cross the name of Jesus when it's on your lips. If you speak in tongues, you're holding the demon inside because the tongues are more powerful than he is. So, when you come to this moment, whoosh, let them go. If you're really prepared, if you've gone along step by step, you can get rid of a dozen in no time. All right, now, we are going to say this prayer to Jesus. And this is your confession of faith, and you're meeting the legal requirements for deliverance. When you finish the prayer, you say, in Jesus' name, Amen. Then I'm going to do the praying. I'll command the demons to come out. Are you let them go. To deal with these three successive things. The domination of one person by another. Secondly, heresies. Departures from the Christian faith. And thirdly, false religion. Let me begin briefly by speaking about a situation in which one person is dominated by another. It is never the will of God for any human soul to be dominated by any other human soul. It is never the will of God for parents to dominate their children, for a husband to dominate his wife, for a wife to dominate her husband, for a pastor to dominate his congregation, or for any other person in any situation to dominate another person. And yet many people have grown up in life either dominating or being dominated by. I have discovered recently that one of the greatest single hindrances to people receiving complete deliverance is the fact that they have been dominated by their mother. Many mothers seek to control their children's lives, to plan their destiny, to arrange the vocation that they will follow, and to keep them under their control. This is extraordinary how far-reaching it is. An evangelist came to me about four years ago, and he asked to counsel with me, and I spent some hours eating a meal with him and talking with him. At the end, we went back to his hotel room and he asked me to pray for his deliverance. Before we prayed, I said this, I only have one source of information about yourself and your family, and that is from what you have told me personally. But I said, on the basis of what you have told me, I have to tell you one thing. In my opinion, your mother is a witch. And he said, that's what my wife said. <laughs> And I said, I agree with your wife. Now, his mother was a good Pentecostal lady sitting up in the front rows of Pentecostal church every Sunday, and so on and so forth. Well, I prayed for that man, spent the next 20 minutes bringing up great strings of flimy, fluid substance. I prayed with him for maybe half an hour, 40 minutes, left him, phoned him next day to find out how he was doing. He said, I feel wonderful. But he said, I feel as if I've just been through a 12-mile race. Every bone in my body is aching. Well, I said, that's the result of deliverance. And then he said to me something which impressed me. He said, you know, isn't it remarkable? Yesterday, you and I had lunch together, and I ate fried chicken. 
But he said, whatever I brought up, there was no vestige of chicken or anything else that I'd eaten in it. He said, wherever it came from, it didn't come from my stomach. And that really made me think. Well, I've seen, I wouldn't like to count the buckets of fluid that I've seen people bring up in deliverance. And I've realized, let me say this, that as I understand it, this is not the demon, but it's the nest that the demon has made in your body. And when the demon goes, its nest better go with it. Sometimes people go on with this process of physical cleansing for three or four days or even a week. They'll go on bringing up and bringing up. I say, don't turn it off. Go through with it. Get your body cleansed. That's not the demon. You don't see the demon. But it's his particular little nest that he's built up in your body to inhabit. You see, the Bible says, he that committed fornication sinneth against his own body. This is a definite statement of Scripture. And I believe personally that everybody that practices fornication invites a demon which builds its own unclean area of inhabitation inside that body. As a matter of fact, in many cases, I can tell people what they are being delivered from by seeing the form that their deliverance takes. Almost each type of evil spirit is characteristic in what it tends to produce. To go back to this evangelist, then he said to me, we have a daughter who has tremendous problems. She's 13 years old, goes out all night with men, is on drugs, is attending a well-known full gospel high school, and we can do nothing with her. Do you advise anything? Well, I said, first of all, go home, talk with your wife, tell her what's happened to you, get together in prayer, get to the point where you really agree in the spirit, and then take some item of clothing that your daughter wears, lay hands on it, and curse the demons. So that was what I told him. A year later, he was back in the area, he phoned me, and he said, uh, he wanted to tell me how he was getting on, he said, how are you doing? He said, fine, things are changing. He said, I'm not without struggles, but my ministry is quite different from what it was before. He said, what about your daughter? He said she's enrolled in an Episcopal girls' school, has a scholarship, and is doing wonderful. Straight A's all the way through. She's straightened out and become a sensible girl. And I said, what about it? How did you operate? Well, he said, we did what you said. We got a blue T-shirt that she likes very much. And without telling her, we prayed over it and then just watched her wear it. <laughs> but he said... There's something more than that. One day, the girl's grandmother, my mother, came to the house and did something she wouldn't normally do, offered to do some washing for my wife. And in the items that she washed was the blue T-shirt. And ever since my mother washed that T-shirt, she's been a different woman. <laughs> now, the point about this mother was that with all the best intentions in the world, she was dominating her son, her son's wife, and her son's children. And she was using spiritual power to control an entire family. Now listen, witchcraft is the attempt to control people and make them do what you want by a power other than the Holy Spirit. And if you have a power in your life that you can use, it isn't the Holy Spirit because no one uses the Holy Spirit. He's God. Now, this is tremendously common. Many, many people are still tied by a spiritual umbilical cord to their mother. And in many cases, total deliverance does not come until that umbilical cord in the spiritual realm is cut. Now, I'm not teaching disobedience. I believe the Bible teaches honor thy father and thy mother that it may be well with thee. But nevertheless, it is not the will of God for any one person to dominate any other person, to control them. It's remarkable, but you find many times that a mother will know when her daughter is seeking the Lord and will start phoning and bringing pressure upon her. She may be eaten up with self-pity and every time that family is going to move out and God, the mother will phone, come and help me, come and hold my hand, come and stand by me. Now I want to warn you, don't let anybody dominate your life. 
And if you've been in that situation where you've been dominated by a father or a mother, this afternoon before this meeting closes, exercise the authority given to you in the name of Jesus and loose yourself from that dominion. And if you have hatred or unforgiveness in your heart as a result of that attempted domination, forgive the father or the mother or the person, whoever it may be, because you cannot loose yourself from someone if you resent them or hate them. The very resentment and hatred itself constitutes a bond which ties you to them. Now, it is not always apparent. It may be other cases. Many, many cases, some of you have been influenced by spiritual, quote, persons who've tried to take you over. This happens very often with prayer groups. Some dominating, strong, spiritual lady will move in and just begin to exercise control over that prayer group. Now listen, the Holy Spirit never causes a minister of the gospel to dominate others. If you come to the place where you're more tied to that woman than you are to the Lord, you are bound and not in a good way and not by the Spirit of the Lord. There is a church where the biggest item in the expense is the long-distance phone bill. Because every time the pastor wants to make a decision, he phones a certain lady in another state and gets her to give him the mind of the law. And she flips the pages of the Bible, uses the name of Jesus, and comes out with a pronouncement which is what runs that entire church. I could tell you some extraordinary and even ridiculous examples of this, but I'm not going to do it. That church and its minister are bound, and the people that attend that church come under that bondage. And the woman behind it, in plain, simple language, is a witch. A religious witch, a full gospel witch, a charismatic witch, and all the more dangerous for that. All right, now let's go on to the second phase of our teaching, heresies. These are departures from the Christian faith. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. And 2. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times, that's with the times in which we are living, some shall depart from the faith. The faith is Christianity. So here are people who have been in the Christian faith and turn away from it. We are not dealing with unbelievers or people who have never made a profession of faith in Christ. We're dealing specifically with those who have professed faith in Christ. It says some shall depart from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. And then it's the demons, not the people, who speak lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. And it gives examples of two doctrines. One is food fads, commanding people not to eat certain kinds of meat. And it doesn't mean meat in the sense of flesh, but it means food. That's Old English. Never let anybody start dictating to you about the kind of food that you're to eat. No pork, no bacon, and all this business. It is not scriptural. Every creature of God is good and to be received, for it is sanctified with the word of God and prayer. Now, the Jews under the law of Moses were forbidden to eat a whole lot of things, but we are not under the law of Moses. There are only four things required of Gentiles who come into the Christian faith First of all, that we abstain from fornication, secondly, from idolatry, thirdly, from things strangled, and fourthly, from eating blood. We are not permitted to eat blood with flesh. That is still out just as much as fornication or idolatry. It's in the same category. This you'll find in the 15th chapter of the book of Acts. But we are not commanded to observe any other of the food rules that were imposed upon Israel under the law of Moses. And any attempt to force you under these food and dietary rules in the name of making you more spiritual is demonic. Now, if you don't like bacon, you don't have to eat it. But don't make a religion out of it. That's all. Have you noticed about health food stores? 
that the unhealthiest people are always there. Did you never notice that? <laughs> Brother, if their gospel worked, they'd look different. <laughs> Now, please don't misunderstand me. If you don't like or don't wish to eat certain kinds of food, you are at complete liberty. But don't let it become a spiritual law, because that's the deception. Now, I was on the verge of this, and God yanked me back. I was drinking so much carrot juice, I was turning yellow. <laughs> I literally, I mean literally yellow. And I was talking to a preacher. I didn't regard him as very spiritual. For one thing, he was rather fat. And I have a sort of thing about fat preachers. But <laughs> and I was telling him how careful I was about what I ate. And he quoted to me, every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused. And oh, how I praise God for that man. He got me out from the very verge of the ditch. And I had enough humility to listen to him. Say, he's right, I'm wrong. Another form of satanic deception mentioned here is the turning away from the normal marriage sex relationship. Do not let anybody fool you into being super spiritual by living an unnatural sex life because it just isn't right. If you're married, you're married. Totally. Now I say this because again I've seen cases where there was a certain man on the West Coast some years back, a Presbyterian, baptized in the Holy Spirit. He said, now come on, these Pentecostals, they're not with it. They don't tell you half the truth. I'll tell you how to be a real overcomer. Step number one, you come out and listen to me. Uh, that's always step number one. Step number two, you uh, sell what you have. Step number three, you stop living with your wife. And brother, those people ended up one after another in a mental breakdown. So be on your guard. The, the gospel rightly proclaimed is the most normal, healthy, sane thing in the world. Never go off on a tangent in order to be spiritual because you may be spiritual, but it's the wrong spirit. All right. Now let's look in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. I want to go on on the theme of heresies. 2 Peter chapter 2, Verse 1, but there were false prophets also among the people, that's Israel, even as there shall be false teachers among you, the church, who privily, in a sneaky, underhand way, shall bring in damnable heresies, heresies that bring damnation, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. We are specifically warned that in the church, there will be false teachers who in a sneaky, underhand way will introduce heresies that bring damnation to those who teach them and those who believe them. And this has happened and is happening. Now, a heresy means literally choosing. And heresy is, in essence, choosing how much of the Bible you will believe. Every heresy accepts part of the Bible. All heresies claim to start from the Bible. All heresies quote Jesus Christ. But the essence of a heresy is you decide how much you'll believe. God didn't ask you to make that decision, and it doesn't rest with you. God says this is his word, and you better believe it all. Now, the essence of a damnable heresy is summed up in that phrase, even denying the Lord that bought them. It's a denial of the Lord Jesus Christ and his redemptive work on the cross. And any heresy, any teaching under the guise of Christianity that touches the person, the nature, and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ is a damnable heresy. And you better believe that churches which might be called Methodist, Presbyterian, Episcopalian, or any other such thing are literally filled with damnable heresies. And in many cases, it's the ministers who are preaching these damnable heresies. Let me give you an example. Let me tell you what I believe about Jesus. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that he's divine eternally. I believe that he was born of a virgin, that he led a sinless life, that he died an atoning death, that he rose the third day physically from the dead, 
that he's ascended into heaven and that one day he's coming again in person just as he was seen to go. Now, if you have any problem about any of those statements, you better check your spiritual foundations. And any kind of teaching that denies any one of those statements is a damnable heresy. And we have been warned, no matter how respectable it may be, the main source of these damnable heresies is the seminaries. They are the actual fountainhead of these heresies. The fact that a man has been trained in a seminary and has three kinds of degrees after his name should be a warning to you to suspect damnable heresies, not to believe what he said. The, the first epistle of John, chapter 2, 1 John chapter 2, verses 18 through 22. Again, a warning about the last days and deception and error, and a particular spirit of deception, the spirit of anti-Christ. Let me say that anti-Christ means two things. The word anti means, first of all, against, and secondly, in place of. The spirit of anti-Christ has a double work. First of all, it's against Jesus Christ to get him out of the church, Secondly, its design is to replace him by the false Christ. Somebody told me the other day, who's acquainted with the person, that the lady in Washington, and I'm not going to mention her name, <laughs> speaks about the Christ. But you'd better check, because when she speaks about the Christ, she means the false Christ. And this is very prevalent at the moment in most Protestant denominations. The spirit of Antichrist is at work getting Jesus out of the way. I have friends in Methodist churches, and I'm not attacking Methodists, but they just happen to be Methodists. They tell me in our church, Jesus is a dirty word. You can speak about Socrates, Buddha, Plato, Martin Luther King, it's perfectly all right, but don't talk about Jesus. That is the spirit of Antichrist. It's getting Jesus out of the way. What these people do not realize is that's only the first step. The next step is to put the false Christ in his place. And the scripture indicates that millions and millions of people will shortly be deceived by the spirit of Antichrist. You better be sure you aren't going to be one of them. Now let's read about it. Little children, 1 John 2, 18. It is the last time. And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, a mark of the last time, whereby ye know that it is the last time. They went out from us. They started with the Christian church. They all do. They all claim to be Christians. But they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. This is typical. Every antichrist starts in some way in association with the Christian church, then goes out. And without being in any way controversial or personal, we have had the most remarkable demonstration of this in the person of Bishop Pike, who began in the Christian church a keen preacher of Jesus was confronted very closely by one of his closest workers and by Dennis Bennett and others with the truth of the baptism in the Holy Spirit, rejected it, turned away from it, and moved into the only other main spiritual field left, the spiritual field of the occult and satanic power, and ended up with a death very similar to that of Judas Iscariot. Remember, the only two persons who are called the son of perdition in Scripture, are Judas Iscariot and the Antichrist. And each of them begins in the church. Going on reading. But ye have an unction, verse 20, an anointing from the Holy One, and ye know all things by the anointing. The Spirit of truth in you should tell you what's true and what's false. It should answer to the truth, and reject false. And you better have that alarm clock inside you really well wound up because you're going to need it. I have not written unto you because ye know not the truth. He's not writing to unbelievers. But because ye know it and that no lie is of the truth. What's the truth? 
the word of God. Anything that conflicts with the word of God is a lie. Verse 22, who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah. He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Notice he does not deny God, but he denies the relationship within the Godhead of Father and Son. And basically he denies that Jesus is the Son of God and has come in the flesh. Turn to 1 John 4. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. A false prophet is a person with a false spirit. See? Uh, no prophet operates in his own spirit. That is not a prophet. A true prophet operates in the spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit. A false prophet operates in a false spirit. Therefore, when you meet a prophet, try the spirits. Is it the spirit of God or is it a false spirit? And if it was true then that many false prophets have gone out into the world, it's ten times truer today in modern America. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist whereof ye have heard that it should come. It's very easy. Does the spirit... Does the person confess that Jesus, the Messiah, has come in the flesh? If so, it's of God. But any person that denies that Jesus, the Messiah, has come in the flesh is motivated and controlled by the spirit of Antichrist. Now, if you deny that Jesus was born of a virgin, you deny that he is the Messiah. Because the Messiah had to be born of a virgin. This is the spirit of Antichrist. All right, that's the spirit of Antichrist. The spirit of heresy and seducing spirits. And they all center around the truth about Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. If you have come under the influence of any teaching that in any way touches upon the person, the nature, or the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, you had better get clear. Loose your spirit and clear your mind from these poisonous lies of the enemy and come back to God in repentance. Bow at the foot of the cross and ask Jesus to take you back. Now we're coming on to the third realm, which is false religions, non-Christian religions. And let me lay down certain simple principles. There are two sources of supernatural power. One is God, the other is the devil. And any supernatural power that does not come from God does come from the devil. It's that simple. Now, there is one way and only one way into the realm of God's supernatural power. And that way is Jesus Christ. Let me give you two or three scriptures. John 10, 9, Jesus said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. I am the door. By implication, there is no other. John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. There is no other way to God the Father but by Jesus Christ and him crucified. And Ephesians 2.18, maybe if you have your Bible you can turn to that because it's rather important to read it. Ephesians 2.18, for through him... Jesus Christ, we both, Jews and Gentiles, have access by one Spirit unto the Father. Notice, through Him, Jesus, and through Him alone, by how many spirits? One Spirit. There's only one Spirit that gives the human access to God the Father. It's the Holy Spirit. And He operates only through the Lord Jesus Christ. If you come by any other door than Jesus, or if you come through any other spirit, no matter what that spirit may profess to be, 
You do not have access to God. You have access to the realm of Satan. Instead of coming into the realm of light, you come into the realm of dark. But remember that Satan is transformed as an angel of light and his ministers are transformed as ministers of righteousness. And many, many times they'll use beautiful, sweet, loving words and long psychological phrases and even quote scripture to get you into the realm of darkness under the guise of being angels of light. But if you do not come by Jesus Christ, crucified on the cross, and if you do not come by the Holy Spirit of God, you can get into the occult realm. You can get into the supernatural realm. I'm not denying that for a moment because I've been there and I know what it's like. But you get into the wrong realm. Now, I got in by yoga. I was a practicing yogi before I found Jesus. And there was a time when I got out of the natural. But what I got into, even then, it scared me. I didn't like it. I decided once was enough. But when I was confronted with the gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit some years later, the great barrier between me and Christ was not my carnal sins. It was yoga. And I could not break through that mental barrier. God had to do a miracle of deliverance. The first deliverance service I was ever in, there was only one person there awake and one person asleep. There was another soldier asleep and I was awake and on the middle of the floor and God gave me, tell you what you've seen in deliverance here is nothing beyond what I received then. And I never knew about deliverance. I didn't know about demons, but I wanted to come to Jesus. And I could not reach him till that yoga demon had lost its power over my mind. You can theorize, friend, but I was there. I know what it's like. It's one of a thousand different ways of being deceived into the territory of Satan and becoming enslaved. Now, I'm going to give you some Old Testament scriptures on this. Turn to the book of Exodus, the 20th chapter, verses 3 through 5. This is part of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Now, what I want to point out to you is that if you seek for supernatural help and counsel and power from any other being but the true God, you make that being your God. The point out to you is that if you seek for supernatural help and counsel and power from any other being but the true God, you make that being your God, the one to whom you seek for supernatural help and revelation and power is your God. And these words apply to every person who's involved in that list, which I'm going to read to you in a moment. They have had some other God before the true God. They've allowed another God to come before the true God. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. And many people are bowing down and serving alien gods today in the form of horoscopes, Ouija boards, and other such things. They're in this category. And I want you to see the particular judgment that's pronounced upon them if they do not repent. For the Lord thy God is a jealous God, visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. This can bring a curse, not only upon you, but on the succeeding three generations in your family. It's not any form of sin. It's this particular sin of having some other God. So if you have in your background a Christian science practitioner, somebody that believed in unity, a fortune teller, a medium, or any of these things, you are quite probably in some measure under a curse. And in many cases, your deliverance will not come until you revoke in Jesus' name the curse that comes from your background. I have proved this conclusively to my own satisfaction in ministering to people. There are times when you cannot get the person delivered simply on the basis of what they are and have done themselves. It's their inheritance spiritually coming down to them 
from someone that crossed the wrong border and gone into the wrong realm. God says it will be visited upon their children under the third and fourth generation. And it is. I'm not preaching condemnation. I'm opening your eyes. First of all, if you do it, you're bringing it on your children. Secondly, if your parents or grandparents or great-grandparents did it, you may still be suffering from their judgment. And you've got to learn how to get out from under that judgment. Thank God the curse is cancelled in Christ. But you better know where the curse is. And in many cases, you have to know where it came from. All right, Exodus 22. Exodus 22, verses 18, 19, and 20. Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. Whosoever lieth with a beast sexually shall be put to death. He that sacrifices unto any other god save the Lord only, he shall be utterly destroyed. You notice the company that the witch is put in. The one that sacrifices to another god or lies sexually with an animal. It's not pleasant company to be in. Before we go any further, let's take these words that are on the blackboard. They're the ones used in the King James Version. And most of them do not have much meaning for modern Americans. Let's look at them. I'm trying to give you the modern English equivalent of these words so that when you read them in another moment, you'll know what you're reading about. Divination is specifically fortune-telling. Observing times is horoscopes. This is a good week to do business or whatever it may be. This is observing times, choosing the right time by the study of the heavenly bodies for certain specific courses of action. Astrology or stargazer, that's of course astrology. Having a familiar spirit, that's a word for a medium. A medium has a spirit that comes regularly to him called his guide or some other word like that. This is old. It's not new. You find it in almost all pagan countries. But in modern America, it's normally called a medium. Necromancy is seeking to the dead for advice and counsel. A charmer is one who uses charms for protection and so on. In Africa, we discovered praying with the Africans for salvation. Many times, you would have to discern that the woman had charms around her waist and tell her to go off and take them away before you could bring her to salvation. None of these things are new. Enchanter is one who uses incantation, or more generally, music. Music has tremendous power, and Satan often uses it to enslave people. A wizard is a male, and a witch is a female. All right. Now then... Let's go through these other scriptures and then I'll go on further. But remember now the meaning of these words. Uh, let's turn to Deuteronomy 18. Deuteronomy 18, verses 9 through 14. This is really the main list. Here's the whole works given you. Deuteronomy 18, verse 9. I'll read through verse 12. When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire. That is offering your firstborn as a living sacrifice to be burned by fire in sacrifice to a pagan god. Notice this is in direct company with all these other activities. They're all put on the same level or that useth divination, fortune-telling, or observer of times, horoscope, or an enchanter, or a witch, I'll give you a definition of witchcraft in a moment, or a charmer, or a consultant with familiar spirits, one that goes to a medium, or a wizard, that's a male witch, or a necromancer, one that consults the dame. There you are. For all that do these things, are an abomination unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. All that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. And we turn to Isaiah for a moment, 47th chapter of Isaiah. And just notice the picture of Babylon. 
and the reason why God's judgment came on Babylon. And remember that there is to be a spiritual Babylon that comes forth at the close of this age, which is the spiritual counterpart of the Old Testament Babylon and has the same traits and characteristics. And in Isaiah 47, verses 12 and 13, you see the central feature of Babylonian religion. Stand now with thine enchantments and with the multitude of thy sorceries, wherein thou hast labored from thy youth. If so be, thou shalt be able to profit. If so be, thou mayest prevail. Thou art wearied in the multitude of thy counsels. Let now the astrologers, the stargazers, the monthly prognosticators stand up and save thee, and so on. Notice, astrology, stargazing, monthly prognostication, that's horoscopes, sorcery, these are the marks of Babylon. You know there are only going to be two religious groups in Christendom at the end of the age, do you know that? One's going to be the bride, the other's going to be the harlot. The bride will be marked by the fact that those in the bride have remained true to their commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ, the bridegroom. The harlot will consist of those who have been seduced by deceiving spirits from their loyalty to Jesus Christ, and they will be marked with all the features of Babylonian religion here described. And you can read about them in the 17th and 18th chapters of the book of Revelation. Every one of us in this room is liable to be confronted by the decision, do I want to be in the bride or do I want to be in the harlot? And I don't believe there'll be a third choice. Now let's look at these words here. The three common words that are normally used are divination, witchcraft, and sorcery. And many, many times I have encountered these spirits that have spoken to me, defied me, and challenged me out of people. As a matter of fact, I have a kind of private war with witchcraft. Many times they'll say to me, I know you. One said to me, why did you have to come? <laughs> All right, divination is essentially getting revelation by supernatural means, not through the Holy Spirit. Revelation of the past, revelation of where lost things are, revelation of who committed a crime, or prediction concerning the future. And I would say in modern language ESP, extrasensory perception, is all a manifestation of divination. I was praying with a woman in a church in Chicago, and she had been a medium. And the first time she came, I refused to pray with her, because I said, I don't believe you've repented. Second time she came, told me that she had repented. I questioned it, but I said I would pray with her. And I began to command the spirits to come out of her, and various spirits came out. And then I took a little rest, and I was just leaning against the altar rail of the church, and the woman was standing there by me, and she suddenly turned to me and said this, I see you in a car, and it's wrecked against a tree. And I said, you spirit of divination, I refuse to accept that from you. I'll not be in any car that's wrecked in any tree. But you see, if I had not been on my guard, had I begun to believe that, which was the spirit of divination speaking through her, it was describing Satan's destiny for me. And had I begun to believe it and think about it, I would have submitted myself to Satan's destiny in my life, and quite likely I would have ended up in a car wreck. Many, many people go to the fortune teller. You're going to divorce your husband and marry another man. They submit to it, and it happens. What you've done in that is submit to Satan's destiny planned for your life. You know about Harold Bredesen? How many of you know Harold Bredesen? I'm sure many of you do. You know when he went to a church that he was pastoring in New Jersey? It was a very modernistic liberal church and they'd organized a bazaar. So he thought, well, can't stop this now, better go along with it. Then they told him, we're going to have a fortune teller. And his heart sank, but he thought, well, oh, I can't stop it right now. So he ended up by allowing the fortune teller and going to the fortune teller. Now this was all intended to be a joke, nothing else. As he sat there and looked at that fortune teller, she looked him in the eyes and said, your wife is going to have cancer. And he said, I realized that was Satan's voice telling me Satan's prediction for my wife. And his wife got cancer. 
but was healed. How many people have told me, I went to the fortune teller just for a joke. You know what Dennis Bennett says? Like counting the tiger's teeth just for a joke. <laughs> Whether you did it for a joke or not is irrelevant. You went to a servant of Satan for help that you should receive only from God. And in doing that, you submitted yourself to Satan. You made Satan your God. That's the truth. Witchcraft operates primarily by spells, curses, and I would say hypnosis. It brings people under control. I've met many real practicing witches, quite a number. One woman told me I've killed people by my curses. It was a respectable middle-class American housewife. I've met several young people just recently, girls that have told me they could put a hex on somebody and make them do what they wanted. Sorcery operates through things like charms, music, dancing, and drugs. This craze for drugs is nothing new. The, American, the African witch doctor has known about it for centuries. They've long experimented in certain herbs and things that would produce certain strange conditions. And basically, the categorical name for that whole operation is sorcery. Bringing people into a supernatural state of power by the use of certain things like drugs, music, charms, so on. Be careful what you wear around your neck or put around your wrist. Because you can put on a satanic yoke if you put something that's supposed to have power. How many people seek protection by a charm or a lucky penny. Somebody told me about a girl who grew sick and her mother took her to a faith healer who gave the mother a little charm, said, put this around the girl's neck and it will keep her well. The mother did, the girl became well. But after some time, the mother became illuminated and realized the awful thing she'd done. They took the charm off, opened it up, and inside they read a little poem which said, Satan, keep this girl's body well till her soul burns in hell. The devil doesn't mind a little healing, provided it costs you your soul. He'll gladly call off a minor demon in order to enslave you with a major one. Let me mention very quickly, you find many examples in the New Testament. Acts chapter 8 in Samaria, Simon the sorcerer, bewitched the whole city with his sorceries, had everybody enslaved by satanic supernatural power. And you see how hard it was for him to repent? He could believe the gospel, watch Philip, stay with him, get baptized, but there was something in his heart that was still after money. You remember the last things ever said to him? Thy heart is not right. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter. Peter discerned his motives were still crooked. And I'll tell you, it's the hardest thing in the world for somebody that served Satan in this realm to get really free. It demands total repentance. No fooling around. No halfway commitment, but a total renunciation of Satan and a total submission to God. Typically enough, you know, the last thing Simon the sorcerer said, he said, pray for me. Oh, how typical. You do the work. You get desperate. I'll trust your prayers. People come to me, sometimes I say, brother, sister, you're wanting me to be desperate for you. I won't do it. You get desperate for yourself. Don't ask the preacher to do all the work. You start to get desperate. Dave Wilkerson says to the drug addict, if you're desperate, you can be delivered. That's true of almost every major area of deliverance. If you're desperate, you can get delivered. Don't ask the preacher to be desperate for you. Acts 13, a certain false prophet, a sorcerer named Bar Jesus, who sought to keep the preachers of the gospel from the Roman deputy in the island of Cyprus. See, that's the work of the enemy, to keep a man from the truth. There was an open, head-on conflict between Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, and the sorcerer. I wish I'd been there. If anything I wish I could have seen, it was that. Paul looked at that man and said, Thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, how long wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? 
You know what he was talking to? A sorcerer, a false prophet. What is a sorcerer? A child of the devil and an enemy of all righteousness. Acts 16, a damsel with a spirit of divination. The Greek says with a spirit, a python, a fortune-telling girl. So successful that as a slave girl, she brought a lot of money to her masters. Now, you'll never bring a lot of money if you're never right. She must have been right many times. And when Paul and Silas came to that city, she knew who they were long before anybody else. She followed them every day in the street, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God who show unto us the way of salvation. Every word she spoke was true, but she was a servant of the devil. Somebody said if Paul had been a modern missionary, he'd have made a charter member of the church in Philippi. <laughs> but he turned to that spirit said, in the name of Jesus Christ, come out of her. And the scripture says, he came out of her the same hour. And she was no longer able to tell fortunes. Fortune telling is the demon of divination. Galatians 3, 1, O oh foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? You say they weren't saved and baptized in the Holy Spirit? You couldn't be more wrong, because the next verse says, did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law, the hearing of faith? Yes, they were good, charismatic Christians, but they were bewitched. Did you know that Spirit-baptized people can be bewitched? Believe me, they can. I took over a congregation that was bewitched by the wife of the previous pastor. And I came face to face with that power at that time, and I learned the truth about the Galatians. What was the evidence that they were bewitched? Galatians chapter 4. Ye observe times, days, months, years. You're playing with horoscopes. You're seeking to get to know the future by occult means. Paul said, I'm afraid lest I bestowed labor upon you in vain. I think I've wasted my time preaching the gospel to you. 2 Timothy chapter 3. In the last days, deceivers shall wax worse and worse. But the Greek word is magicians. I wish you'd notice that. 2 Timothy 3.13. Where the King James says deceivers, the Greek says magicians. And these people are compared with Jannies and Jambres, the magicians who withstood Moses. Have you ever thought about the fact that the magicians of Egypt had supernatural power? Have you ever considered that? Moses threw down his rod, it became a serpent. The magicians said, we can do that. And they did it. The only difference was that Moses' snake ate up their snakes. The next one... Moses took water out of the river, turned it to blood. They said, we can do that, and did it. The third one, Moses called the frogs out. They filled the houses of the Egyptians. Magicians said, wait a minute, we can do that too, and they did it. The fourth one, Moses turned the dust into lights. The Egyptians, magicians tried to do that and could not. Then they said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. This goes beyond us. You better listen to this man. He's got something we don't have. But they had supernatural power. And I'm serving notice on you that at the close of this age, the conflict is not going to be fought on the natural plane. It's going to be fought in the supernatural. Manifested supernatural power of Satan confronted by and overcome by the manifested supernatural power of the Holy Spirit. You read 2 Timothy chapter 3, it is very clear. Revelation chapter 9 verse and chapter 18, you'll find the references to witchcraft and particularly in connection with Babylon, the false religious situation. Now we've come to the time when we're going to have an opportunity for you to be delivered and set free. There are three things basically you have to do. Number one, if you've been involved in any of these things, heresies, departures from the Christian faith, or any form of satanic supernatural, and there's the list. I didn't read it out. Shall I read it out? Ouija boards, fortune telling, ESP, drugs, including all sorts of medical drugs like pep tablets, painkillers, and sed sedation, and so on. Mediums, clairvoyance, meditation, oriental cults and philosophies, and I specify particularly yoga and the teaching of reincarnation, astrology, horoscopes, hypnotis, automatic writing, and graphoanalysis or handwriting analysis. And that's just a selection. 
If you have been involved in any of those things or anything like them, and you want to be clear, you want that dark shadow lifted off your life. You want that bondage taken away. How many times people tell me, Brother Prince, just when the power of God is strongest in the meeting, and I feel I'm reaching out to God and longing to worship Him, something comes between. And you know the first question I ask? Have you been to a fortune teller? And about twice out of three times, the answer is yes. Oh, but I was only a little girl when I went. Oh, I didn't mean it. It was just a joke. But you went. You went to a servant of Satan for help that should come only from God. And God in his mercy is not going to lift that pressure till you've come to the cause of it and seen what you did. Because it's essential that every child of God get clear about the dangers of occult involvement from this day onwards, that you'll never be fooled, never be tempted, never go back and get into that area again. Now, you want to be free, I'm going to tell you what to do. You confess as a sin the involvement, having your palm rain, playing with a Ouija board, consulting a fortune teller, reading books about Edgar Cayce, Gene Dixon, so on. Many, many more. Secondly, you renounce it. By a deliberate act of your will, you dissociate yourself from it. The best words I can think of are those of the psalmist David. Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee. That's the whole satanic demonic realm. Am not I grieved with those that rise up against thee? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them mine enemies. Is a Christian allowed to say that? Yes. Not about flesh and blood, because we don't war against flesh and blood, but against God's spiritual enemies. You have to say, I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them mine enemies. God will not deliver you from your friends. Why should he? But if you make them your enemies, he'll deliver you. All right. You confess. You renounce. And you break every contact. If you have a Ouija board, you burn it. If you have horoscopes, you burn them. If you have books in that category about transmigration of souls, yoga, all these things, you burn them. You do not leave anything in your house that leaves a chink open in the door for the devil to come back. There has to be a house cleaning for most Christians. In Acts 19, when the power of Satan was revealed and the believers saw what really was happening, it's a remarkable thing. It says, great fear came upon all, and many that believed, believers, came and confessed and showed their evil deeds. They'd been believers, but they'd been playing with the other side at the same time. And those that had books about the occult brought them and burned them. And the price was 50,000 pieces of silver, $50,000 worth of books burned. You cannot afford to keep it. Don't sell it. Don't pass it on. You poison somebody else. Destroy it. You cannot fool God. Nor can you fool the devil. Don't try. Each of them knows when you mean business. The key word for most people today is repent. Stop fooling around and playing church and being a little religious and get desperate. Make a decision. All right. Now, I think in all fairness, what I'm going to do is give everybody here an opportunity to be disassociated from the occult. And when I've done that, if you wish to leave, you may do so. I'm going to ask you to do one thing. If, in listening to me this afternoon, you stand here and realize that in some way you've been involved with this satanic supernatural and you have never dealt with the problem, you've never renounced it, you've never made a clean break until now, but you now desire to do so, I want you to do one thing, because I want you to say this out loud after me. And when you've said it, turn loose. If anything comes out, let it come. I don't know what could happen here in the next few minutes, but let it go. And if you are 
A fearful, just remember that if you're respectful, obedient, cooperative, nothing can harm you. In the name of Jesus, I bind every demonic power that's here and I demand that they leave without hurting any person or without hurting others. And I claim the protection of the blood of Jesus over the families and relatives and friends and associations of all that are here in Jesus' name. All right, now you say this. Lord Jesus Christ, Lord Jesus Christ I believe that you are the Son of God, the Messiah, who came in the flesh, you died on the cross for my sins, and you rose again from the dead. I now confess all my sins. I repent of all my sins. In particular, I confess seeking to Satan for help that should come only from God. I confess as a sin. Now name the thing. Fortune telling, Ouija board, whatever it is, say your own particular sin. Anything that the Spirit of God now brings to you, say, I confess as a sin. Lord, I now renounce that. I renounce Satan and all his works. I hate his demons. I count them my enemies. In the name of Jesus, I loose myself now from every dark spirit, from every evil influence, from every satanic bondage, from any spirit in me that is not the spirit of God. And I command all such spirits to leave me now. In the name of Jesus. Now let them go. Satan, I bind your power and command you to loose these people and come out from them now in Jesus' name. Every spirit of divination, sorcery, witchcraft, I bind your power in the name of Jesus and I command you to loose these people and depart from them and from this place in Jesus' mighty name through the power of the blood of the cross. In the name of Jesus, Satan, be loosed, be cast out, in Jesus' mighty name. Unto thee now in the name of Jesus, thy beloved Son, our Savior, and by a deliberate choice of our wills, we submit ourselves afresh to thee right now. We desire that thou would bring into captivity every thought within each one of us to the obedience of Christ. We yield ourselves through the blood of Jesus to the Holy Spirit. We know that apart from him we cannot find the truth. He is the teacher, the comforter, the one sent to lead us into all the truth. And we depend upon him this afternoon. We pray thy blessing upon each person gathered here that every heart shall be open to the truth and that no one shall receive error. And I pray for myself, Lord, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart may be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. And in everything, Lord, we will ascribe to thee and to thee alone the praise, the honor and the glory due unto thy name. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. To try to clear up certain possible misunderstandings that may have been left over from previous teaching on this subject of deliverance from evil spirits. And then I want to try to give you specific instruction with regard to the future, particularly on the theme of how to keep your deliverance. But let me bring up two questions which are habitually asked by people who are newly confronted with this truth and this ministry. The first one is, how do I know if I'm completely free? 
and I always disappoint people with my answer. It is not my business to give you a certificate. <laughs> and if I did, it wouldn't be worth the paper that it's written on. I don't know for sure that any of you is completely free. I'm not sure that I can give myself a certificate either. What you have learnt, which is really valuable, is the reality of evil spirits and how to deal with them. And that's worth a thousand certificates. That's all I aim to do, is bring you face to face with the fact that evil spirits are real, they're part of your experience, and you can deal successfully with them. And so far as I'm able, I give you the scriptural principles that have been proved in experience for doing this. And after that, the ball is in your court, and you've got to do the next job. You don't sound satisfied, but that's the way it is. The next question, which is not so important, is where do the evil spirits go to? The answer basically is they go looking for another place to occupy. Jesus said in Matthew 12, if you want to turn there, you can. We might as well look at it. Matthew 12, and I think it's verse 43 and following. This is a general statement, not made about some specific individual, but generally. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest, and findeth none. Then he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out. And when he is come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. Then goeth he, and taketh with himself seven other spirits, more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. So when evil spirits go out, they look for somewhere to find rest, and their characteristic is they cannot rest outside a body, preferably a human body. But failing that, even the body of a pig or some other animal, rather than be disembodied. And their first thought, apparently, according to the words of Jesus, is to return into the person from whom they have gone. And they describe that person as my house. This is exactly how they think and exactly how they speak. Several times I have heard the spirit within a person describe that person as my house. Actually, their thinking is so perverted that they feel they have a legitimate right to be there and they are extremely aggrieved. They're really upset when you challenge their right to occupy a person. Why don't you send them to the pit or a lot of other suggested places, some even more foolish than that? Well, as far as I'm concerned, I do not plan to improve on the ministry of Jesus. If I can get that far, believe me, I'll be satisfied. Jesus never sent them to the pit as far as it's recorded. When they pled with him to go into the swine, he said, go into the swine. Both Jesus and the evil spirits knew that God the Father had a time program. There was a time coming when they would be confined to a place of imprisonment and punishment. But they all knew that that time had not yet come, and Jesus never anticipated the Father's program. Why did he let the evil spirits out of the Gadarene demoniac go into the swine? Well, that's a question which is not answered in Scripture. But my personal p opinion is for the sake of the man. He, the, the demon said, when Jesus said, what is thy name? The answer came, my name is Legion, for we are many. Now, I'm only mentioning this as a fact. A Roman legion numbered about 6,000 persons. I'm not saying there were 6,000 demons in that person, but there could have been. And had they gone out unwillingly, I think they'd have torn him apart. 
So for the sake of the man, Jesus gave them leave to go without putting up the maximum opposition. I believe this on the basis of experience. I have seen people delivered from maybe 15 or 20 demons so totally exhausted that they apparently couldn't stand anything more physically. However, that is an opinion and it's subject to scripture. I have very little faith in fine religious phrases. I was with a woman once and every time she dealt with a person who had evil spirits, she said, I bind you and I cast you into the pit of hell. And I thought to myself, well, I wish it were true. But I'd like to see some evidence. There was a time, I mentioned this by way of illustration of how real all this is, when I was dealing with the wife of a Pentecostal minister who had many evil spirits. And one of them was very, very stubborn. It would not come out. This ministry lasted about five hours, I think partly because I failed to lay a sound basis of teaching first. So I got provoked with this thing, and I said, if you don't come out, I'm going to send you to hell. I really don't know whether I had scriptural authority to do it or not, but I, I was getting provoked. So it went on resisting me, so I said, I command you to go to hell. And when it eventually left, the last things it said were, oh, it's so dark, it's so dark, it's so dark. And with that, it went. So whether it went to hell or not, I don't know. But I could believe in that case, I had a special gift of faith to make that thing do something that normally it would not have done. Another question people ask is, is it possible to cast out evil spirits at a distance? Well, if you have the faith, because you... If you have the faith, you can say to a mountain, be cast into the sea. But how many of you have actually cast a mountain into the sea? Would you mind showing me? <laughs> All right. I'm not saying it can't be done, but let's be realistic about how much faith we have. Nothing offends unbelievers more than for believers to talk in a sloppy way about faith they don't really have. Then they say the whole thing is phony. Let's be real. God has dealt to each man a measure of faith. Move within that measure. Be realistic. All right, now then, people come to me frequently and say, why didn't I get fully delivered? Or I don't feel fully delivered. What's the reason? <laughs> it is impossible to give each individual a reason for their particular situation in a general talk. And sometimes I don't know the reason. Maybe sometimes God doesn't even want me to know the reason. And if in the last resort, Brother Prince doesn't get the reason for you, you better go to God for yourself and find out. But I'll, I'll give you four common reasons why people do not get full deliverance. And these I have seen many times. Number one, lack of repentance. Most modern Christians have got no real idea what repentance is at all. First of all, it is not an emotion. I've seen lots of people get highly emotional and never repent. Repentance is a decision. It's a decision of the will. It's a decision to stop fooling around with sin and disobedience and stubbornness. It's turning right about, turning your back on the devil, the world, and everything that's displeasing to God, and submitting yourself without reservation to God. That's repentance. And it's the first basic foundation truth of the gospel. Get my book, Repent and Believe, and you'll fee see it. There isn't any real faith without real repentance. That's why a lot of people have problem with faith. Their real problem isn't with faith, it's with repentance. The first public word that Jesus preached was repent and believe the gospel. I know Jesus said only believe in another place. But the presentation of believing without repentance is false teaching. There isn't such a thing. All the way through the New Testament, right from the beginning to the end, the first requirement of God of the sinner is repent. Change your mind. Do it differently. Lots of people want to get off the hook. But that isn't repentance. 
And sometimes God keeps you on the hook till you do repent. Repentance is more than wanting to get off the hook. Lots of demon activity is very distressing and unpleasant. You'd like to get an end of it, but that isn't repentance. Repentance, as I've said, is turning your back on the devil, facing God and submitting without reservation to the righteous government of Almighty God in your life. A rebel is not repentant. The second common reason that I have observed is the failure to confess sin. Now, at this point, I want to say that God made the rules, and all I try to do is interpret them. I could be wrong, but I do it to the best of my ability. But if you don't like the rules, don't get mad with me, because I didn't make them. I just try to interpret the rules I find God has laid down. God requires that we confess our sins. And let me tell you again what I said the other day. When you've confessed everything, you never told God anything he didn't know already. You've never shocked God. God doesn't demand confession for his sake, but for your sake. Now it does say in the fifth chapter of James, which most Protestants have forgotten, confess your sins one to another. And this is part of the total discipline of the gospel. It isn't, in, it isn't possible in a situation like this to have confession one to another, though a few people in most services will come up and tell me some specific thing that's burdening their conscience, just whisper in my ear. And I'm not encouraging you to do that, please notice. And I'll tell you this, I don't want to carry a garbage can around for anybody. When that garbage gets in my can, I tip it out just as quick as I can. I have enough problems of my own with ca without carrying other people's around with me. There are times, however, when it is absolutely required by God that we confess not merely to him, but to one another. A sentence which is not in scripture, but I believe it contains a scriptural principle is this. The confession must be as wide as the transgression. If you have transgressed against God only, then you need to confess to God only. But if you have transgressed not only against God, but against man, then your confession must include those against whom you have transgressed. Now, this is commonest, in my experience, in the matter of adultery. Adultery is a very common reason why people have guilt, oppression, and demonic obsession. And lots of people are in mental homes for the basic reason of adultery. As far as I understand God, if you want deliverance and you've been guilty of adultery, you do not qualify for deliverance unless you're willing to confess it to your partner in marriage. For my part, I won't pray for a person for deliverance unless they'll promise to do that if I'm aware that they're guilty of that sin. Because the whole basis of deliverance is truth. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And a person who's been unfaithful to his or her partner does not confess is living in a lie. And there cannot be permanent peace or deliverance. That's my personal conviction. If you can get God to change his mind, well, you're welcome to try. Lots of people said, I don't know what my husband will say. But I know not a few marriages that have been rescued by confession. And I don't know one that's ever yet been broken up unless it was already broken up before. In the last resort, you have to do what God requires and leave the consequences with God. There's an old hymn that says, trust in God and do the right. And it still applies. If you don't want to do it, don't argue with me. If you can get God to change his mind, fine and good. You know what I found about God? He has no moves. You never catch God in another mood. <laughs> the other thing that I have learned by experience, which God often requires to be confessed specifically, 
is the deliberate procuring of an abortion. When a baby is due to be born, and this is prevented deliberately. Now, I'm not a Catholic, but I have discovered that God classifies this as murder. And it has to be confessed as murder. I'm not telling you that God will not forgive you. Surely he will forgive you. But he demands that you come down to the point, name it, and bring it out in the open. You don't have to go and tell all your family and relatives unless they're intimately involved in it. The third common reason why people fail to receive complete deliverance is a failure completely to forgive others. And this is basic. Mark says in his gospel, I think I better read it to you. And I think you better read it too. I think it's the 11th chapter of Mark's gospel. Verse 25 and 26. Mark 11, verse 25 and 26. And when ye stand praying, forgive if ye have aught against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. But if ye do not forgive, Neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive you your trespasses. What could be clearer than that? When you stand praying, when you're called forward to pray the deliverance prayer, if you have aught against any, that leaves out nothing and no one, what do you have to do? Forgive. If you forgive, God will forgive you. If you do not forgive, God will not forgive you. If you are not forgiven, you're not a candidate for deliverance. You don't have the legal rights of deliverance. God has required this. We cannot change it. I want to say again, as I said the other day, forgiveness is not an emotion. It's a decision. It's tearing up the IOU. That's the way I explain it. Let me take an illustration. My good brother here, Brother Glenn Miller, has lent me a $10,000. Praise the Lord. And I've given him my IOU for $10,000. And now we're having a face-to-face -face confrontation about the situation and the relationship between us. And he's sitting there with my IOU in his hands, and he's saying, Brother Prince, I really love you. And I think I could care less. He said, Brother Prince, I understand you were in a difficult situation. Brother Prince, I pray for you. I still think I could care less. Brother Prince, I'm asking God to forgive you. I could care less. What am I interested in? What he does with the IOU. The moment he tears that up, I don't mind much what he says. I've got what I want. Now, forgiveness is tearing up somebody else's IOU. I remember, or I've had many conversations along this line, especially with women whose husbands have wronged them, been unfaithful. Have you forgiven your husband? Well, I pray for him. I didn't ask you that. Have you forgiven your husband? Well, I understand he couldn't help himself. That isn't what I asked you. Have you forgiven your husband? Well, I've asked God to forgive him. That isn't what I asked you. Have you forgiven your husband? No. Are you willing to forgive your husband? Well, Brother Prince, he's ruined 15 years of my life. All right, do you want him to ruin the next 15 years too? then keep on not forgiving him, and he's sure to do it. Forgiveness is only enlightened self-interest. That's all it is. Jesus said in the parable of the unforgiving servant, in effect, and I'm paraphrasing it, you owe God six million dollars. Your fellow servant owes you ten. If you forgive your fellow servant ten, God will forgive you six million. Well, who wouldn't do that? Anybody that wouldn't do that would be a bad businessman, wouldn't he? That's what forgiveness is. It's forgiving the $10 somebody owes you. Why? Because you go God six million. That's the proportion in that parable. Forgiveness is a decision. I do not say you can make it at any time, 
but you can make it when the Spirit of God prompts you to make it. That's why it's so important to obey the prompting of the Spirit. What is forgiveness? It's a decision of your will expressed by an utterance of your lips, and it's best to say it out loud. And in fact, it's a good thing to say it in the presence of witnesses. It's rather like a marriage service. It's as solemn as that. Lord, I forgive my mother or my father or my husband or my wife. Those are the four main relationships in which we normally need to forgive. Sometimes it's our mother-in-law or our son or daughter-in-law or it could be our grandparents or it could be the minister of the church or it could be a fellow Christian or it could be a businessman who cheated you. But Basically, I would say four times out of five, it's in the closest personal relationships that we have to practice forgiving. If you want God to forgive you, you just have to forgive others. You have no option. All right, the fourth common reason why people sometimes do not receive deliverance is a failure to break with the occult. They keep one finger still in Satan's territory. They leave the door open a chink to the occult world and they never receive complete deliverance. Read in Acts 19 with me a moment. Acts the 19th chapter. And we'll read this incident from verse 13 through verse 19. Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus, whom Paul preacheth. They weren't converted, they weren't disciples of Jesus, but they saw that the name of Jesus produced results when Paul used it against evil spirits, so they thought they'd do the same. But you see, the name of Jesus is only effective when it's used in faith. And there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew, and chief of the priests, which did so. And the evil spirit answered, not the man, but the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? And in the Greek it's even clearer because two different words are used for no. Jesus I acknowledge, Paul I know about. I've heard about that man Paul, but who are you? And then it said, the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them, prevailed against them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. Seven men chased out of the house by one man because he was charged with demonic power. And I tell you, if I didn't believe in Jesus and know the power of the blood and the authority of his name, there are many, many times I would be very reluctant to deal with evil spirits because I realize they can give people absolutely supernatural power. But they don't have power over the name of Jesus. The most frightening case I've ever dealt with was a woman who'd been a gang leader when she was 12 years old. And if ever I've seen a tough person, she was it. And she came to us for deliverance, and there's a little man, a friend of mine called Sid Purse from England, who doesn't stand more than knee-high to a grasshopper, and myself. And I thought, what good would he be in an emergency? <laughs> and there we were up in the hotel room, about the fifth floor, and this girl wanted deliverance, and I knew she was going to be a tough one. I tell you, there were some people, I believe they might be here in the next room, they said that made believers out of us that night. <laughs> she was wearing thick, heavy boots, and when she started, she was banging her head so hard against the bathroom door that you could hear it about three rooms away. But every time she lunged at me, I said, in the name of Jesus. And she did not touch either the other brother or myself. But I was very conscious that if there'd been any chink in my armor at that moment, I would have been in difficulties. Now, let's look at the result. I want you to see the result. This incident was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling at Ephesus. And fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. They'd never seen anything happen quite like that. Sometimes people come to me after a deliverance service and say, I've never been in a service like that before. <laughs> I can believe that. 
Now, I want you to notice the next step. Verse 18. Many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. I want you to notice they were not unbelievers, but they were believers that had been fooling around with the occult and still claiming to be believers, like thousands of charismatic people today. Just a little bit of Gene Dixon and the horoscope and the Ouija board, but really, I'm saved and I speak in tongues. But they <laughs> suddenly came face to face with the awful reality of demon power. And then they changed their minds. They repented. For the first time, they really repented. They came, confessed, and told publicly what they were guilty of. Many of them also, which used curious arts, this is the whole realm of the occult, brought their books together and burned them before all men. And they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. You could say $50,000 worth of books publicly burned. And when you've been involved in the occult and you have charms, Ouija boards, books about the occult realm, false teaching, heresies, in my considered opinion, the only proper solution is to make a bonfire and burn them. And if you leave them around, I'm afraid you've left the door open a chink. And Satan knows he's not totally unwanted. Sooner or later, he'll get his dirty nose through the door again. There's nothing to do but cut it off. Some of the best advice ever offered by anybody was offered by Daniel to King Nebuchadnezzar when he'd had a dream about a tree that was cut down. And Daniel said, Nebuchadnezzar, you're that tree that's going to be cut down. Look out, the judgment of God is headed for you. And he said, O king, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee. Break off thy sins by righteousness. That's repentance. It's a clean cut. It's a total break with everything that's sinful and replacing it by the positive righteousness. Now, Nebuchadnezzar didn't follow that good advice, and you know what happened? The demons got him. For seven years, he was a maniac, out of his mind, living like a beast, feeding on the grass of the earth. And that's a very sound lesson. Break off thy sins by righteousness. Sever every contact with the occult realm and there'll be hope for you. Now, we come to the question, once you have been delivered, how do you keep your deliverance? And I've got a series of instructions up there which we'll go through in order. I always feel a kind of sense of relief when I arrive at the number seven. I hope that's not superstition. All right, first of all, the primary and the most important principle. When you have been delivered, if possible, before you leave the room, deliberately yield every area of your life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ by a specific act of your will and a declaration of your mouth. Say, Jesus, be Lord in every area of my life. My emotions, my attitudes, my sex life, my money affairs, my home life. I deliberately choose you to be my Lord. I submit every area to you. It's like taking every key in your house to every room and every closet. Saying, Jesus, here you are. That's the most important single thing. You see, Jesus said, when the unclean spirit has gone out of a man, we've read it already, He's going around looking for somewhere else. And after a while, he says, I think I'll go back to my house. And when he comes, Jesus said he finds it empty, swept, and garnished, which means furnished. Now, what was the mistake? Nothing wrong with having the house swept, is there? Good to have it cleaned out. And deliverance will help you to clean your house out. Nothing wrong with having it nicely furnished. What was the man's mistake? It was empty, vacant. There was no other 
occupant taken in to replace the vacancy created by the evil spirit going out. You know, I drive often through this country on my way to preaching assignments, and sometimes it takes me two or three days. So around about six or seven o'clock in the evening, when I want to find somewhere to spend the night, as I drive through a city, my eye is looking for a neon sign outside a motel, and I'm looking for one word. You know what it is? Vacancy. And when I see that word, I know I can get in there. And if you are delivered, but do not yield yourself without reservation to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, in the spiritual realm, you've got a bright neon sign out which says vacancy. And it won't be long before somebody will be knocking at the door. Is that clear? I don't know how to say it more clearly. Deliberately yield yourself to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. You are not strong enough to keep the devil up. But Jesus is. And where Jesus is Lord, no demon can come in. You are as safe as the rock of ages. But only on that basic condition. Secondly, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 5.18, be continually maintained full of the Holy Spirit. That means get baptized in the Holy Spirit, speak in tongues, and keep on speaking in tongues. Keep on praising the Lord. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is not a puddle. It's a river. A lot of people have a puddle experience. Oh, I was baptized in the Holy Spirit and spoke in tongues in 1958. Well, we aren't living in 1958 now. Ephesians 5.18 says, Be maintained continually full. And that's an obligation. How many of you believe it's wrong for a Christian to be drunk with wine? All right, well, logically, it must be equally wrong for a Christian not to be filled with the Holy Spirit, because the same verse says both. How many of you believe it's wrong for a Christian to be drunk with wine? All right, well, logically, it must be equally wrong for a Christian not to be filled with the Holy Spirit, because the same verse says both. And I believe it's probably more serious not to be filled with the Holy Spirit than it is to be drunk with wine. I mean that. It doesn't fit in with some theology, but I actually mean it. I think God can more easily help a person who got drunk once or twice than he can help a person who's never filled with the Holy Spirit. That's the way I view it. On the basis of Scripture and experience. The third principle is live by the word of God. This cannot be emphasized too strongly. You do not live by your feelings. You're not right because you feel right. This is so true about the baptism in the Holy Spirit. How do you know you got the baptism in the Holy Spirit? Oh, brother, I know I got it. I feel wonderful. Yeah, but tomorrow morning you feel awful, and then you know you didn't get it. Never let feelings be decisive. How do I know God the Holy Spirit? Because I asked God for the Holy Spirit and he promised if I asked for bread, I'd never get a stone. That's how I know. I know by scripture. I have the scriptural testimony. I have the promise, Luke eleven thirteen. 13. I have the evidence, Acts 2, 4. That's how I know. What I feel is secondary. In the Christian life, there are three F's and they go in a certain order. Fact, faith, feeling. The basis is fact. That's the facts of the word of God. On that you act by faith. And your feelings follow. But never let your feelings dictate to you. Because they'll mislead you. Matthew 4 tells us the temptation of Jesus. Notice this temptation came to him after the Holy Spirit had come upon him. And normally, you will have temptations after you have been baptized in the Holy Spirit that you would never have had before. If you study these temptations, none of them could have come to Jesus before he was moving in the supernatural realm. Every one of them involved the possession of supernatural power. And the same is true. After you are baptized in the Holy Spirit is the time you will really be tempted. I meet many Christians who are not quite sure whether there's a personal devil or not. 
But I hardly ever meet a person baptized in the Holy Spirit who doesn't know the answer to that one. That's one of the things you find out quickly when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit reveals the identity of the enemy. That's why a lot of lukewarm churchgoers don't like Holy Spirit religion because it brings too much out into the open. They'd rather have it all kept undercover. But the Holy Spirit doesn't keep things undercover. He forces the enemy out into the open. Another thing I'll say about the baptism of the Holy Spirit is many people don't know they have demons till they get baptized in the Holy Spirit. That sounds strange. I know some theology just doesn't fit in with that, but I've been in that theological position that some of you are in, and it isn't relevant to experience. Furthermore, it has no support in Scripture. Demons get stirred up when the Holy Spirit comes in. They don't have it all their own way any longer. If they haven't been driven out prior to your receiving the baptism, then they're going to kick up more trouble and make more fuss than you've ever experienced in your life before. Now, I believe, ideally, the scriptural order is these signs shall follow them that believe. Number one, in my name they shall cast out the demons. Number two, they shall speak with tongues. But lots of places, and CFO camps are one of them, it ain't being done that way yet. Let's hope one day it will. At the moment, it really isn't possible to do it that way because most professing Christians today, until they're baptized in the Holy Spirit, wouldn't believe in demons. See? So, though it's not the ideal, we have to work on the level on which we find ourselves. All right, when Jesus received the anointing of the Holy Spirit, then, for the first time, so far as we know, he was subjected to direct satanic confrontation and temptation. And in dealing with Satan, Jesus used only one weapon. What was that? The scripture, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Each temptation, Jesus began his answer with the phrase, it is written... It is written, it is written, and you must do the same. This means you must get acquainted with the Word of God. Jesus didn't have a concordance out there in the desert. Probably didn't even have the Scripture, but he had it inside him. David said, Thy word have I hidden, treasured up in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. If you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, the next most urgent need in your life is to get to know the Scriptures thoroughly, and have them available. You have to live by the word, not by church traditions, not by what people say, not by your feelings, but by the written word of God. The next principle is found there in the fourth statement. Put on the whole armor of God. Let's look in Ephesians 6. Ephesians 6. And we'll read verse 10 through verse 18. These words are written to every believer, not to a special group like missionaries or preachers or evangelists, but to every believer. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. You are going to be confronted with the wiles, the deceptions of the devil. For we wrestle, we're in a wrestling match, not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this present world, against spirits of wickedness in the heavenlies. Our wrestling match is with spirits, not with flesh and blood. Wherefore, and you remember what Charles said about wherefore and therefore, when you find a therefore, you find out what it's there for. Well, because of this, therefore, verse 13, take unto you the whole armor of God. Notice you have to take it. God doesn't drop it on you. You have to acquire it. You have to take it to yourself. That ye may be able to stand, withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. There's going to come the evil day. Don't be upset about that. It comes to every believer. There's the evil day. There's the day of pressure, the day of testing, the day of misunderstanding, the day of opposition, the day of loneliness. 
You're going to go through it. Every child of God does. We must, the scripture says, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of heaven. I don't believe that just means get to heaven. I mean it gets into living in the kingdom of heaven right now. It's through opposition. It's through trouble. It's through testings that we come into that kind of living. All right. Stand therefore, and now Paul lists six pieces of equipment. We cannot really call them armor, but equipment. I'll go through them quickly. They're taken from the pattern of the Roman soldier in Paul's day. I don't want to dwell on most of them, but I suggest you make a study of them for yourself. Number one, having your loins girt about with truth, the girdle of truth. Now, the girdle in ancient clothing was something around your loins which enabled you to lift up your lower hanging garments, to leave your lower legs clear so that you could act freely without tripping over your own garments. And many times the Bible speaks about girding up the loins of your mind and so on. If you've ever lived in Palestine or those countries, you'll know if you ever see a woman that's going to sweep the floor, do anything, the first thing she does is gather up her skirt and tuck it into a girdle so that her legs are free to, to move. And until you've put on the girdle of truth, when you try to move around and get active, you're going to trip up. So the first thing to put on is truth. Truth, I believe, in two forms. The truth of God's word and the truth about ourselves. This is basic to deliverance. Ye shall know the truth. The truth shall make you free. You've got to start being honest. Drop off all the religious phrases you've learned. What I call the religious cop out and start saying what you mean. There's never been a time when so many people said so many sloppy words about faith. Lots of people talk about faith, but they're just misusing the word. I had a little kind of encounter with a lady the other day. I trust she's forgiven me, but she got up and left me in tears. But um, really, we've got to be real. Be honest. Come to the moment of truth. Face the facts about yourself, about your situation, about your wife and husband and children, about the church. It's awful, but you'll get over the shock. But without truth, you're never going to make any progress. The whole basis of it. What does God require? Truth in the inward part. And then he says, in the hidden part, thou wilt make me into no wisdom. Sincerity in the inner part will bring revelation from God, but not without. All right. The next one, the breastplate of righteousness. The area of the heart covered with the righteousness which is by faith of Jesus Christ. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. All right? Not the righteousness of good works, but the righteousness received by faith of Jesus Christ on no other basis than that Jesus died, was made sin for us, rose again, and his righteousness is now imputed to us by faith. The next one, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. The shoes or the boots of preparation for the gospel of peace. You have to be prepared to be a witness or a minister of the gospel. You have to have your shoes on. When we were in action in the North African desert in the Second World War, if the enemy were close, we were never allowed to sleep with our boots off. We had to keep our boots on night and day. Because in an emergency, if you had to reach out in the dark and grope for your boots and put them on, well, the thing would have passed before you were able to do anything about it. And this has always been so vivid to me. If you don't have on the boots of the preparation of the gospel, the opportunity to witness, to serve, to minister will come and you'll still be looking up your scriptures. We have to be prepared. You have to know the word of God. You have to be prepared in prayer. You have to have the peace of God to minister so that when people come to you in distress, you don't say, let me go away and pray for half an hour and I'll give you an answer. You have it out of you right there. The preparation of the gospel of peace, which is the boots. Then, above all, or over all, taking the shield of faith. There are two kinds of shield in the New Testament. One is a circular, small, round shield. The other is a great big oval shield. This is the oval long shield which is spoken of. Something that can cover the whole man. You can hide completely behind this shield. And that's faith. 
the total covering faith which covers every aspect of your life, your family, your business, your circumstances, your children, everything is covered by this great shield of faith. All right, and it can quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Verse 17, two more vital pieces of armor, the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, we've dealt already with the sword of the Spirit. Let me take a moment to deal with the helmet of salvation. What area of the body does the helmet protect? And what does the head represent in your spiritual experience? Yes, in the body, but in your inner spiritual experience. The mind, that's right. The thought life, whatever way you like to put it. Now, I have discovered by experience many Christians have their minds unprotected. They do not have on the helmet. And they get wounded in the head. And then they can't use the rest of the armor because they don't have the strength. This is, I've learned this the hard way, by personal experience. When I got delivered from the spirit of depression years ago, God showed me, now you're delivered, now you've got to learn how to stay delivered. And God showed me these two things which I'm sharing with you now, the helmet of salvation and the other garment I'll show you in a moment. And I realized that my main problem was in my thought life. I didn't have control over it. All sorts of negative, upsetting, disturbing, frustrating thoughts resentment, fear of failure, unbelief, doubt, indecision would come crowding into my mind. And I was having a continual inner struggle. I think it's true to say that most people are like icebergs. That which shows above the surface is only a small part of the total personality. There's things going on inside most people which don't show above the surface unless you have discernment. This was certainly true in my case. My problem was in the realm of the mind. My mind was highly trained. It was the thing I'd relied on all my life. And actually, the more intellectual you are, the more liable you are to have problems with your mind. Because you're more prone to rely on it. And the Bible says, Cursed is the man who trusteth in man and maketh flesh the carnal mind his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. Very often the simple, unsophisticated person is not so prone to rely upon the mind and doesn't have the same problems with the mind. It's not that there's anything wrong with being educated or trained. An educated and trained mind is a wonderful thing, but it's an instrument. And you've got to be make, make sure who's using the instrument. Well, God showed me that I needed protection. And as I thought about this, I thought, well, there's one piece that must be for the mind. It's the helmet. And I read Ephesians 6, 17, and it said the helmet of salvation. And I said to myself, well, now, do I have the helmet or don't I? I am saved. Does that mean I have the helmet of salvation? Well, I had a Bible with cross-references, and I saw there was a cross-reference to 1 Thessalonians 5, 8. So I turned over there and read these words. But let us who are of the day... Be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. And when I read the word hope, I got a sudden complete sermon. I saw that there was one thing that had never been preached to me. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, 13, Now abideth faith, hope, love. These are the three abiding realities. I'd heard many sermons on faith, a lot of sermons on love, and never one sermon on hope all my life. I had to preach myself the first one. And I came to see that this was what was missing in me. Now, faith in the Scriptures is in the heart. Mental faith is not the faith the Scripture deals with. With the heart, man believes. Lots of people have got tremendous faith, but it's in the mind. And it doesn't do what heart faith does. That's why they're surprised when they say, I believe, and nothing happens. They do believe, but it's in the mind. Now, faith is in the heart, so it's not for the mind. But there is something for the mind. What's that? Hope. And here's the secret. What is hope? I define it as this, a confident, unwavering expectation of good. And that's in the mind. You know what I was? By birth and upbringing, I was a professional pessimist. 
I was born one to start with and brought up to be one. In my family, if you weren't worrying about something, you'd have to be worrying about what you weren't worrying about. I, I look back, my mother's with the Lord now, but my dear mother was like that. She was worried if I wasn't worrying. Well, this had a deep effect upon me. When I was delivered from the demon of depression, then God showed me, now you're free to cultivate different thought reactions and patterns. Before, you weren't free. But now you are. Deliverance doesn't do it all. Deliverance sets you free. Then you have to do it. And I realized that when I was a pessimist, I was denying my faith in Jesus Christ. Pessimism is a denial of your faith as a Christian. You say, give me a scripture. Only one is needed. Romans 8, 28. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God. All right, if you love God and are called... All things are working together for good. If all things are working together for good, there can never be a logical reason for pessimism. Every time you're a pessimist, you're denying the word of God and you're denying your faith in God and Jesus Christ. Well, I had to deliberately replace pessimism by optimism. It didn't happen in a week. It didn't happen in a month. It didn't happen in a year. But it has happened. Today, I'm a trained optimist. I mean that. I train myself to be an optimist. And every time I find that pessimistic reaction beginning to come back, I say, wait a minute. There's no room for that. This is the helmet. It's hope. A confident mental expectation of that which is good. It says, faith is the substance of things hoped for. Faith is in the now Hope is in the future. Each has its place. Hope is based on faith. Faith is the substance. Faith is in the heart. Faith is for now, never for the future. But hope is in the mind and is for the future. And it says, oh, there's some beautiful scriptures. I wish I could preach you a sermon on hope. But let me give you the one in um, Hebrews 5. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, steadfast and sure, and which entereth into the veil, whither Jesus, the forerunner, is for us entered. Hope is the anchor. Now, why do you need an anchor? Why does a ship need an anchor? Because a ship is floating around in a basically unstable element, which is water. And no matter how much that ship may want to be stabilized, there's nothing in the water to make that ship stable, is there? So what does the ship have to do? It has to pass its anchor out from itself through the water and into another element that is stable. What's that? Well, I like to say the rock. So what is hope? It's your anchor. You live in a realm that's impermanent, unstable, insecure, that in your material situations and circumstances there is no basis for security. I smile when I see insurance companies advertise peace of mind, <laughs> as if they had the ability to give peace of mind. They don't. You can have all the insurance in the world and be riddled with insecurity, because it doesn't depend on those things. But when you've passed your anchor, out of time, into eternity, and fastened it in the rock, then your little boat is secure. And the anchor is hope. Praise the Lord. Put it on. Use it. Also, it speaks about hope. I don't want to do this, but in Hebrews 5, it says it's like the horns of the altar. We fled for refuge to the hope set before us. You know, in desperation, a man who was being pursued by his enemies would flee to the altar and grasp the altar by its horns, and no one dared to pull a man away from the horns of the altar. So when you're in absolute desperation and all the demons are on your tail, what do you do? Get to the altar and grab the horns and hold on. And the horns are hope. Never give up your hope, friend. The world may collapse around you, but God is still on his throne. All right, now then, there's the garment of praise. We're, I've got five more minutes and a lot to cover. It says, 
In Isaiah 63, 61, well, we better read it quickly. Isaiah 61, this is the gospel. Isaiah 61, this is what Jesus proclaimed in the synagogue in Nazareth. It's quoted in Luke 4, verses 18 and following, when he said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He quoted this scripture. Let's read it. John Wesley said, when he quoted these words, Is there ever been a preacher of the gospel of whom these words were not true? That was his comment. In other words, every preacher of the gospel should be able to say these words. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And you notice in the synagogue he stopped there. He did not say the day of vengeance of our God, because he came to bring grace not judgment. Judgment will be on the next visit. To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty in place of ashes, the oil of joy in place of mourning, the garment of praise in place of the spirit of heaviness. If you've had the spirit of heaviness and you don't want it back, put on the garment of praise. Because when you're wearing the garment of praise, the spirit of heaviness does not like to come near you. Uh, this is a true story, and it illustrates this. I was in London years back as a pastor, and a lady arrived who was a member of our congregation, dragging a rather reluctant husband by her hand without warning, said, this is my husband. He's a backslider. He's just come out of prison. He's got an evil spirit. Pray for him. <laughs> and in those days, praying for a person with an evil spirit was an embarrassment to me. So I didn't know what to do, but we had with us a couple of uh, Russian Jewesses who'd been saved in the Baptist church in Russia and were later received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And they said, in Russia, the Baptists are more Pentecostal than the Pentecostals are in Europe. And uh, when they started praying, they didn't care what the neighbors thought. They just let go and praise God. So we started to pray in that sort of vague way that people do pray when they think they ought to be doing something, but they don't know what to do which is the normal way most Christians treat evil spirits, you see? And uh, we, were, we were really praising the Lord. And this poor man who'd just come out of prison came up to me privately and he said, I think I'm going. I said, <laughs> I said why? He said, too much noise. <laughs> and I didn't have an answer ready, but God gave me one. Well, I said, I'll tell you who doesn't like the noise. It's the devil. And he doesn't like the noise because we're praising Jesus and he never likes that. But I said, you've got two alternatives. You can go now, and the devil will go with you, or you can stay, and the devil will go without you. He said, I'll stay. <laughs> now, I made a promise without meditating. But a few minutes later, he came up to me and said, it's just left. It left my throat. I didn't understand really what he was saying. But the devil left because he couldn't stand the atmosphere of praise any longer. And if you put on the garment of praise, you embarrass the devil much more than he can ever embarrass you. Don't wait to feel like it. Praise is a sacrifice. Hebrews 13, 15, by him, Jesus Christ, therefore let us offer the sacrifice of praise unto God whenever we feel like it. Is that what it says? Continually. Just saying it in my heart. No, even the calves of our lips. That's not in your heart. That's out loud, out of your mouth. That's what God requires. David said when he was in the court of a heathen king, slobbering on his beard and scrabbling on the door, pretending to be mad in order to save his life, do you know what he said? He wrote Psalm 34. And remember, that's when it was written. And the first verse says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. There is never a time and there is never a place when you should not be praising the Lord. And if you put on that garment, you'll enjoy it. All right, now we've got two minutes to deal with it. We don't, we have a minute and a half. Deal with the other three things. Cultivate right relationships. Well, I'm preaching on that other times. Be careful about going back into resentment, bitterness, and unforgiveness. Cultivate the moment you feel resentment rising up against that husband of yours. Check it. And I say replace the negative by the positive. 
Brother Prince, I just resent him. What am I to do? Pray for him. I don't believe you can resent someone and pray for them at the same time. So replace the negative by the positive. But you'll have to be on your guard because resentment is a habit with many of us. I'll tell you another habit that most of us have, and I'm not innocent. That's arguing. I'll tell you truthfully, and I've said this in front of my wife when she's there, there are some situations in our home when my wife and I start to discuss certain things, I say to her, we just as well play a tape recording of this because we both know what we're going to say now for the next five minutes. <laughs> and when I say that, then I say, well, let's switch off the tape recorder, shall we? Stop it now. Yeah. The beginning of strife the Bible says, in rather vulgar, plain way, is, one, is as when one letteth out water. So stop before you start. You know how difficult it is once you've started to stop. <laughs> there are lots of worse things than that that are on tape. <laughs> now, come on, we've got two more things. Number six, cultivate right fellowship. And you've got a good scripture there about... Light cannot have fellowship with darkness. And I don't mean that you separate yourself from the world and go into a convent, but do not go around with the negative people. Cultivate positive people, people that will build up your faith, strengthen you, encourage you. If you've taken a stand for healing, don't go back to the people that believe healing ended with the apostles, you see. I'll tell you two things that come by hearing. One of them you know, Romans 10, 17, faith cometh by hearing. You know the other one? Unbelief. Jesus said, take heed what you hear and take heed how you hear. And the book of Proverbs says, cease my son to hear the instruction which causeth thee to err from the words of truth. I'll tell you, if I wanted to keep my faith up, I'd never go and listen to the, some of the sermons that you people go and listen to on Sunday morning. I just couldn't do it, that's all. I don't want to fill my mind with negative poison and then try to live a victorious life. I couldn't do it. Maybe you're better than I am. Maybe you're stronger. But you cannot feed on faith-destroying sermons, literature and conversation, and then expect to be a victorious, believing Christian. It just cannot be be done. What comes in has to come out somewhere. If you admit it to your heart, it's going to be expressed in your living. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. If it gets in here, it's going to be expressed in what you do. It matters what you believe. This goes beyond just what church you attend. It, it goes to the whole question of whom you spend your time with. What kind of people you listen to over the telephone, too? Because a lot of people have a lot of problems through listening to the wrong kind of telephone talk. All right, finally, and this is the last, make Jesus central. Don't go off on a tangent about demons. See, you can be one-sided about anything in the Christian life except Jesus. You can be one-sided about tongues, one-sided about healing, one-sided about divine order, one-sided about women not speaking in the church, one-sided about demons. You can be one-sided about anything except Jesus. He's the center. He's the author. He's the finisher. He's the foundation. And he's the coping stone. Keep Jesus in the center. I realize for many of you, being confronted with this type of message and deliverance service, it makes a powerful impact. I can believe that. And for the next few weeks, you're going to wander around, do I have a demon? Does he have a demon? Does my preacher have a demon? So on. Well, they may all have demons. But don't become demon preoccupied. All right? It'll take a little while to fit into your total Christian believing. It's, you've got to find a new file for demon <laughs> truth, see? But don't let it dominate you. I give you that beautiful scripture and we close. Jesus said when he went to the cross, now is the judgment of this world. And now at the cross, through what Jesus did, is the prince of this world, Satan, cast out. All right, he's cast out. There's a vacuum. Who's going to fill it? The next scripture is, I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Make it your supreme aim always to uplift and glorify Jesus.